Hello, good morning. Yeah, live. Hello and welcome again to the second day of the third Global Neuroophthalmology Case Festival. Let us start with session one right away and let's introduce you to the moderator of the first session. And this is Dr. Ambika, who is a senior consultant and head of the Neuroophthalmology Department at Shankar Nitrale, Chennai, India. She is a vice president of the Indian Neuroophthalmology Society. She has authored several publications in ophthalmology journals, the Atlas of Neuroophthalmology, the SN Atlas of Imaging in Ophthalmology. And she has several chapters in ophthalmology and neurology textbooks. She was the best associate consultant and her time, she was the best paper at the ST Athavale Award in AIOS in 2014. And she had best paper award at ICTRIMS in 2015. She has participated as a speaker in various national and international neurology and neurosurgical conferences. And her areas of interest are optic neuritis and demyelination, ocular myasthenia gravis, IAH, LHON, and mitochondrial optic neuropathies, and neuroimaging. Over to you, Ambika. Thank you, Santhya, for that humble introduction. Well, uh, I think uh, we had an extensive case discussion yesterday and we are starting the next day two of this global case fest. We are going to have uh, three sessions again and I am going to have, uh, I'll start sharing my screen first. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So today along with me, we are going to have uh, three more moderators. And uh, Dr. Repka, she is Assistant Professor of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Neuroophthalmology Services from RP Center Ames, Delhi. Trained at RP Center, she has 75 plus publications, authored several chapters in books related to ophthalmology, neuroophthalmology, strabismus, and uh, has presented various papers in national and international conferences and won several awards. Along with uh, her, Dr. Murlidhar, who is Chief of uh, Department of uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Neuroophthalmology Eye Foundation, Coimbatore. And she is trained in glaucoma pediatric ophthalmology at Morin's Eye Center and New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. And he was also working as a senior consultant with us at Shankanetralia, Chennai, and also in Arvindai Hospital, Madurai. And he has various publications in national and international journals, has conducted in many instruction courses at regional and national conferences. And uh, Dr. Krishna Vaidiswaran, who is also a consultant ophthalmologist at Mulchand Merck Hospital, Delhi. And uh, he is a fellow of uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow, associate editor of Medical Statistics, Indian Journal of Orthopedics, and Indian Journal of Neurosurgery, Delhi. Edited uh, books on current perspective on ophthalmology. And uh, he has many articles in journals. He's also specialized in optic nerve surgeries, canal decompression, sheath fenestration, vascular surgery, and so on. So thank you all, uh, my colleagues, who is going to moderate the sessions. And we have speakers, none other than Dr. Gordon Plant, the first speaker, and I think he doesn't need any introduction. He's a senior consultant, neurologist, neuroophthalmologist. He's affiliated with National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, St. Thomas Hospital, Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, and he has retired from clinical practice, but maintains his interest and continues his vivid teaching and excellent uh, research as a honorary associate professor at University College of London. Dr. Plant is a fellow of both Physicians and Ophthalmologist College and has particular clinical and research interest in neurological disorders that affects vision. His work has been a full-time NHS consultant, but he has found time for research and he has got almost 300 plus articles to his credit with an impact index of 76 plus. It's so nice to have you, Dr. Gordon. And Dr. Anand, who is an honorary associate professor from University of Guazu, Durban, South Africa. He's also associated uh, with the University of Free State as an associate professor. And he's a consultant neurologist as Inkosi Albert Hospital, is a reviewer for the National Research Foundation for the rating of healthcare researchers 
and has uh, served as a counselor for the College of Neurology, South Africa. His focus of research lies in neuroophthalmology, and he takes much pleasure in teaching general neurology and neuroophthalmology to undergraduate and postgraduate students. He also supervises master's and doctoral students and plays a vital role in South African College of Neurology as an examiner, convener, and moderator for the exams. Dr. Samira, a consultant or pediatric ophthalmologist, rebismologist, and an oculoplasty consultant from Lahore, Pakistan, is also joining us. And she is the vice president of Oculoplasty Society of South Asia, member association, American Association Aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And she has almost 72 plus publications, and she has won innumerable gold medals. So, Dr. Mariana, the head of neuroophthalmology, uh, from Argentina. She's head of teaching and research department hospital, and she's an international nanos fellow. She's a neuroophthalmology coordinator of Argentine Congress of Ophthalmology, active member of Argentine Ophthalmology Society. She's neuroophthalmology coordinator of the book of Masters of Ophthalmology of Argentina Council of Ophthalmology. And she's been a principal investigator for the optic uh, neurite, uh, I think, uh, uh, neuromyelitis optica protocol studies. Thank you all for the speakers to join us. To After this introduction, I think I stop sharing and we will move on to the first speaker. Over to you, Satya. So let us invite Dr. Gordon Plant to share his presentation with us. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. This is really is um, uh, one of my favorite uh, meetings and uh, has such a wide reach. Uh, this is a, a patient that I've known for um, um, uh, about 35 years, in fact. Um, and um, fortunately, there was a reasonably happy ending. Um, so uh, at the age of 38, um, in uh, uh, when we, we first saw her, but previously, um, when she was 36 weeks pregnant, uh, she'd had sudden onset of uh, giddiness, headache, uh, double vision and weakness of her left arm and leg. Uh, she was found to have neck stiffness acutely. She was photophobic and had a left hemiparesis and was recorded then to have impaired up gaze, which seemed to be affecting the left eye uh, more than the right. And uh, she gradually discovered from recovered from this, uh, but was left uh, with um, uh, a mild hemiparesis, but um, more troublesome than, than that hemidystonia and also paroxysmal vertical uh, double vision, which is why I was asked to see her. Um, so the story of the double vision, this occurred randomly um, dozens of times in a day. It could last as long as a few minutes, but quite often it was momentary, really, really um, just lasting for uh, a split second, as she put it. Um, when this occurred, she wasn't aware of, of any uh, subjective uh, uh, torsion in terms of the, uh, her environment. And, um, but this was much more likely to occur when she was ambulant. But there was no uh, fixed pattern. Um, on examination, uh, she had slow vertical upsicades, a mild left hemiparesis, and um, left hemidystonia. Um, we um, recorded quite a few attacks um, over a period of time. Um, and this is basically what happened in an attack. Here she is uh, looking to the left. Um, the abnormality is the elevation of the left eye and uh, depression of the, of the right eye. Um, and um, we were able to show that there was um, uh, ocular torsion occurring. Uh, so this is um, uh, the, this is the uh, left eye on the left right. Uh, sorry, right eye on the left, left eye on the on the right, showing the uh, uh, counter torsion in the two eyes. So the left eye was elevated and intorted. The right eye was depressed and extorted. 
uh, during the attacks. Um, now, I'm going to try and show you a video. Um, I think I'll have to go out of this and, and get the video separately. Let's do that. Okay. So can you see the video? No. Uh, no. Right. Um, Uh, I can't seem to screen share again. Yeah, it, it'll be either at the bottom of your Zoom or at the top of the Zoom. And it will appear when you move your cursor there. Dr. Gordon, you need to take the cursor down at the lowermost part, lowermost part of your screen, and then it will pop up. The options will pop up. Uh, so just, yeah. just click on the screen anywhere. The, the, the controls will come, or you can press the Alt button on the screen. Just click on the Zoom window anywhere. Yeah. I'm just getting, I'm sorry, something. something I don't. So would you like this, um, maybe give you a few minutes, we'll move to the second case and then come back to you. Uh, I'm back, I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, sorry oh, about yes. that. Yes, you are. Yes, it's there. Um, so what you can see here, um, I say the, the, these were um, cine, these were cine films taken at, at, the, at the time. So as she's holding her arms out, you can see here the dystonic posturing uh, of the left upper limb. And uh, obviously she's got impaired uh, finer movements of the hand. And then we'll get a... And she has a hemiplegic gait, but there's also uh, involuntary movements. The, the hand is still has a dystonic posture. Um, and then what you can see here is she has involuntary jerky movements of the left upper limb. And the, uh, the paroxysmal, the very brief episodes of vertical diplopia she was experiencing were actually synchronized um, uh, with these jerks. So, so there was a very brief torsional movement of the eyes um, synchronized with these jerks. And we confirmed that by um, EMG, simultaneous EMG and um, ocular 
uh, motor recording. Um, so she's got a little bit of a head tilt at rest, but she doesn't experience uh, double vision. And then here she is in an attack. Let me show that from the beginning of it, the onset of it. So here's the onset of the one of the more prolonged attacks. She's aware it's happening. Faltering, you might say, it goes left eye elevates, then comes down again. Okay, well, I think, um, uh, does anyone have any comments to make on this case? Well, you, you presented, or you wrote up a case that was somewhat similar to this uh, years ago that was caused by MS, but it was a man, but it, but he had paroxysmal uh, movement. It almost looks like uh, neuromyotonia of, of some sort. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the thing is though, neuromyotonia is, doesn't occur spontaneously. And actually it can't occur spontaneously because um, it, it occurs because of a buildup of, uh, of potassium outside the um, axon. Uh, so it can only occur uh, after sustained activity. And that applies to neuromyotonia in the limbs as well as um, uh, ocular motor. Uh, actually, the case that we, um, we wrote up uh, had um, ocular motor nerve compression, but that's a very rare cause of neuromyotonia, as you know, um, uh, radiation damage is, is by far the most common, but it can also occur with tumors. But this is this here is in the spectrum of paroxysmal um, ocular motor phenomena, but it's not that one. But thanks for mentioning it, it's a good discussion. Okay. Any other comments? Well, it's okay. So, what about cyclic ocular motor paresis? Um, yeah, another paroxysmal one that's sort of spontaneous, and it can be either changed from from paresis to overaction, or it can be normal to third and back. Absolutely, a, a, a fascinating condition, and but of course those attacks are quite prolonged, and um, as far as I know. Uh, they they tend to occur uh, spontaneously, and I've you, you've got to link this here with the hemiplegia and the dystonia. I'm afraid <laughs> because we have an absolute fixed uh, neurophysiologically shown link between the uh, paroxysmal eye movement and the jerks occurring in the limbs. Any other thoughts? There must be a suggestion of of um, involvement of the basal ganglia. Um, she's presenting with a hemidystonia, so this is, must be a basal ganglia related problem. And the only abnormality well, I can think of. Well, yes and no. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was thinking of ocular gyanic crises that can occur episodically or paroxysmally. Um, Yes. Um, well, the thing about uh, th this is dystonia following hemiparesis. Um, so uh, the, the the lesion in 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 these cases is it usually involves the thalamus, um, and um, it's much more common in stroke in younger people, particularly children, um, that they can develop uh, dystonia. 
uh, later, but it usually occurs if there's also been some thalamic damage. But the uh, this is a, a hemiplegia is a cort is this is corticospinal tract damage causing the original uh, hemiplegia. An inoculogyric crisis, I would think, would involve both eyes doing the same thing. Yes, yes. This is this is this has another name. <laughs> it has. Uh, you all know about skew deviation, of course. Uh, and skew deviation has been described um, uh, since the, 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 the turn of the uh, uh, 20th, 19th century. Um, but uh, this is a paroxysmal skew deviation. And that acquired um, another name because uh, back in the 70s, Gerald Westheimer at Berkeley, he showed that if you um, uh, stimulate the, the, the midbrain, in primates, uh, you get this paroxysmal ocular tilt reaction, which is, uh, it's just like a skew deviation, but it's going the opposite, uh, opposite way because it's overaction to what you see with damage. So if you see a midbrain stroke, you get the opposite. Uh, and he called this um, uh, the ocular tilt reaction. And that was really to emphasize the fact that he was, that they were producing this um, by stimulation, uh, whereas when we see skew deviations, usually uh, when they're not physiological, usually it means there's been damage and loss of function. Uh, so the ocular tilt reaction um, has been described in primates. And the, the other thing that this, I had a um, one of those uh, realization of something important moments <laughs> when I realized that the everyone knows the superior oblique has a crossed innovation. Um, but not many people know that the superior rectus does. So actually one side of the brain brainstem uh, has um, all of the mechanism for intorting. So the right side of the brainstem has all the mechanism for intorsion of the left eye and, ex um, and extortion of the right eye because of this cross innovation of the intortus. So, so, so at this level, at the level of the um, midbrain, this is uh, uh th th this is what's happening you you're getting stimulation here producing a paroxysmal uh, ocular tilt reaction which of course is the opposite way from what you would see with it with a lesion but um the link between the hemidystonia and this ocular motor phenomenon we decided was purely anatomical uh, it would be very nice to have some other link but um but what, what sort of lesion do you think um, <laughs> might cause something like this? Let me um, share my screen again. Or am I sharing it? Yes, we can see the video. Yes, we can see the video. Yeah. Oh, just the video? Yes. Okay, well, let me go back to... Uh, um, Right. Uh, Do you want me to stop this? Um, I think you can. Stop the video uh, and he'll share his PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, you can share your PowerPoint now. Can you see it? Not yet. Would you like me to share it? Uh, oh, no, yeah, no, here it is. Yes, you got it? Yes. yes. Excellent. So what, <laughs> I'll repeat my question. What sort of link? <laughs> you can you... put it in screenshot. Yes. Yeah, what sort of lesion would would cause a paroxysmal phenomenon like this? And um, uh, one thing to think about, although this paroxysmal ocular tilt can occur with um, gliomas and all sorts of things, um, but um, uh, always think about ferritin. 
So this is um, uh, an ancient T2 weighted MRI, um, but it shows clearly uh, the um, iron deposition uh, around the lesion. This looks like that case that uh, Jason Barton reported in neurology some years ago with a cavernous angioma. That's right. That, well, that's what we think this is. Um, uh, it, it is a very characteristic radiological appearance because uh, there's evidence of ferritin uh, deposition from a, a number of um, hemorrhages over, over time. And actually, the only other thing that looks like this is um, choriocarcinoma metastases. I don't know if you've come across those, anybody. Twice I've made a diagnosis by doing a pregnancy test in a man with choriocarcinoma metastases in the brain. And, and when you think about how the, 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 uh, the point is that the, the choriocarcinoma actually is, thinks it's in an endometrium, it's trying to produce, um, uh, it's do, doing its stuff, but that involves um, uh, creating blood vessels and the um, the cavernomas uh, seem to grow in exactly the same way. In fact, the, they're not called angiomas anymore because they're not tumors. They grow by um, he small hemorrhages, which then organize and you get these vessels which are, which are prone to further hemorrhages and then further organization. So they don't grow in a neoplastic uh, way. So they're uh, cavernomas now. So they can be familial. But I think the link here is the, um, uh, this paroxysmal activity caused by the um, ferritin activation um, is causing the, the, the jerks and the paroxysmal ocular tilt. Um, but the, um, the underlying hemiplegia was, of course, caused by the um, uh, corticospinal damage at the time. And I think that the, the hemidystonia is, has happened uh, as a consequence of the original hemiplegia. I'm Gordon, be happy for any other ideas. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Dr. Gordon. I have a question. Uh, did we have an MR angiography for this patient? Um, uh, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> just to know which vessel it belongs to. It doesn't belong to a vessel. It, okay. Cavernous angiomas. Angioma, it was. Ca cavernous angiomas. So they've, they've, they've changed their name to cavernoma because they're not neoplastic in any way. Their mm -hmm. other ter the other term for them was cryptic angioma. And that's because they're invisible on angiography. They have no feeding vessel. They're, 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 it's, it's like a collection of little blood lakes there. So the, if you look at the literature on cryptic angiomas, so these were um, uh, often misdiagnosed as MS, actually. These were young people who had brainstem lesions um, and there was evidence of, of hemorrhage, but uh, angiography was negative. Um, so, um, no, I mean, you, you can diagnose these from their radiological appearance. Of course, with uh, uh, modern imaging uh, techniques, it's even it's even more, but, but there's no need for an angiogram. Okay, could you tell us okay. more about the ocular tilt reaction? Well, it's physiological. Um, and when you tilt your head, uh, you get this um, uh, contrary um, uh, torsional movement of, of both eyes, um, which is um, physiological. But in humans, it's not very important because our eyes are so close together. You know, if you're a goose or something like that, and you've got eyes out here, it's really important to um, uh, correct for uh, torsion. But and and these, the, the, what you see with this paroxysmal um, ocular tilt reaction is quite unphysiological. You couldn't produce that degree of, of deviation of torsion uh, in a human by by tilting them. Um, but um, uh, yeah, yes, it, it's it's physiological, but but when it's it's very exaggerated when you see this uh, this phenomenon. So it can occur in in MS as a paroxysmal phenomenon, 
but not usually quite as dramatic as this and, and, and so on. So this lady actually, um, uh, we, um, we were able to, we tried everything. And after we tried everything, we tried acetazolamide and it worked like a charm. Um, and in fact, when we, when we studied her again, uh, she agreed to come off the acetazolamide uh, and her attacks came back, but um, uh, she's had no, it's now, now 30 years that she's had no attacks whatsoever, as long as she continues to take the um, acetazolamide. Nothing else worked. Whatever you mentioned, it didn't work. So what explanation of acetazolamide working in this condition? Well, it is an anticonvulsant. You know, you're all using topiramate to treat IIH. <laughs> well, you can use acetazolamide to treat epilepsy. You know, the, the, these... Um... And could it be given indefinitely, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gordon? Well, it has been so far. It has been so far. She lives in, she lives in Wales, actually. Uh, she was able to tolerate it for this many years? Yeah. Yes, she has. Yeah, yes, and um, is very, very grateful for it because um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it also, of course, abolished the jerk. She still has the dystonia. Um, acetazolamide has been used um, for the treatment of dystonia. It didn't didn't help the dystonia very much, uh, but it it stopped these um, paroxysmal uh, phenomena occurring. Okay, uh, Doctor Repka, do you have any more comments? We are getting on time already. Right, it's right. We are right. into the case. And do you uh, have any comments? No, I think most or of any... it has already been discussed uh, by Dr. Gordon and, in fact, by the other panelists. And uh, it actually sparked uh, well, almost a half an hour discussion on this case. So, must it's really an interesting case, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much. Well, you, thank you, you Dr. You're Gordon. I, I, I'm sorry to get you off to a bad start with timing. No, no, it's <laughs> okay. So, can you please stop sharing your screen? I'll do that. We'll move can. on to the next speaker, Dr. Anand Modli, who is going to talk on blindsided by blindness. Dr. Anand, you can start sharing your screen. Um, thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Karna and, and the uh, organization and uh, committee. Um, my talk is not as interactive, unfortunately, as Dr. Plant's was, uh, but you're certainly welcome to stop me at any point for clarification or, or any bit of explanation, and I'm, I'm willing to do so. Um, this was a case that was referred to us um, at the Neuro-Ophthalmology Clinic, um, and it was a, a referral from general ophthalmology, and the usual referral is a patient with sudden onset bilateral blindness with a normal eye exam, normal CT brain, please take over management without any history being given, which is quite typical of our general ophthalmologists. Um, and the patient in, in question was a 56-year-old black female who came from a fairly rural village, uh, not too far from where we are. And her main complaint was that um, she had this argument with her daughter-in-law and her daughter-in-law accused her of practicing black magic, which was quite an accusation at the time because it can be quite devastating to, to an older patient person being accused of, of, of black magic. Um, and during this argument, she was quite incensed, quite fearful of the accusation as well. And then suddenly complained of loss of vision in both eyes. Um, no headache, no associated loss of consciousness, no other neurological symptoms, just loss of vision, um, which is quite sudden. Uh, she was known to be hypertensive, and, um, but she had defaulted treatment some time ago. And she was also a person living with HIV, which is the politically correct description of an HIV infected person. You've got to be cautious about that. And she's not on any antiretroviral therapy. But despite that, she was not even a compromised. No history of any eye disease, TBOs, TIAs, and, and the rest of the, the clinical history, as you could see, was fairly negative. Um, Non-smoker, non-drinker. She worked as a domestic worker and lived with her son. 
Um, and her examination was fairly normal. Uh, she had a blood pressure 140 over 85. She had features of established hypertension um, and chest cardiovascular system, abdomen. We examined those as well. Um, were all normal. Her high functioning was intact and she had no light perception bilaterally, which was quite striking. And I think that was the most striking thing about her examination with intact pupillary reflexes. And the rest of the examination, as you can see, was fairly normal, including a full neurological examination. So based on this, intact pupillary light reflexes um, and the fact that um, um, she had no, no light perception bilaterally, certainly the thought processes was that this was cortical blindness. But what was also striking was the fact that when you walk into the watch, she'll follow you with her gaze. But when confronted about it, did you see me? And she would deny actually having any vision. She had no light, light perception, but she would notice you walking about. And as soon as you come in, you could see that her eyes are following you as, as you came towards the bed. So we were querying whether this was functional blindness and with, with the history that she had a normal CT scan of the brain, certainly that was a, a, a valid consideration. So we brought out the big guns. Big guns looking for functional blindness, including doing a menace reflex, uh, uh, just swinging your arm towards her face, and, and she didn't flinch. Uh, we did the mirror test, uh, rotating a mirror in front of her face, and, and certainly there was no pursuit movements. The optokinetic drum did absolutely nothing. Certainly she wasn't following. There was no optokinetic nystagmus. And tests of proprioception, which will be normal in a patient who is blind because proprioception is not dependent on vision. And in her case, she was able to touch her fingers quite, quite easily. So she was either very good at, at acting and, and, and had functional blindness, um, or, or we were just missing the fact that there was something else going on. So we decided to give her the benefit of the doubt and did an MRI scan of her brain. And lo and behold, she had these bilateral hyperintense lesions involving the, the occipital lobe bilaterally, as you can see. Um, and on ADC map, there's restricted diffusion indicating that these were acute infarcts that she had involving both um, occipital lobes. And the MRA showed a paucity of, of vascularity in the posterior circulation. Sadly, we had done only an MRA and not a CTA, but you could see that there was an occlusion of the, the, the PCA on the right side and the vertebral arteries as well um, were somewhat diseased. And the impression with uh, the patient being hypertensive and, and HIV infected is that the, she probably had accelerated atherosclerosis. So the question is, what was causing her to see us when we walked in? And that brings me to my discussion of blind sight, actually, because this is what we thought she had. Um, she presented with, with what looked like blind sight. Now, blind sight has been described quite some time ago. In fact, it's the ability of patients with absolute clinically established visual field defects. So they've got a V1 cortex, a primary visual cortex lesion, and despite primary visual cortex lesion, they're still able to perceive visual stimuli. Um, and this has been described quite some time ago, as you can see, it was Lawrence Weisskranz, from the UK, who described this in 1974. And he had done a fair amount of work on patients who, um, who actually presented with blind sight. And there's some popular patients, DB and GY, who, who actually presented with blind sight. Um, and, and he had done work on them, showing that, in fact, despite the, the hem blind hemifield, they were still able to perceive movement. And this was first described by George Redock, actually, in 1917. He was a uh, an army doctor um, and a captain uh, in the British Army. And in 1917, his job involved managing these patients who were, who were shot with low velocity guns and, and had injuries to the occipital lobe and various parts of the brain. And he found uh, a few patients where they had blindness, but despite having the blindness, they could still perceive motion. And this is basically the description of the statokinetic phenomenon that we see in patients who have cortical blindness, which is why with medical students, we always insist that rather than just wiggling the fingers in the different quadrants to actually get patients to see static objects or counter fingers, 
uh, which is more reliable because patients may be able to perceive movement. Now, just a reminder to the ophthalmologist is that apart from the vision that we, we acquire and, and the light that enters through the eye and, and perception through the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic radiations, there's still a lot more to the brain than meets the eye, and that pun is intended. In fact, there's the, the primary visual cortex and the association visual cortex with various other parts of the brain responsible for perception of color, perception of motion, and, and, it, and it goes beyond that because we know that there's also the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway or the dorsal stream and the ventral stream responsible for other aspects of vision, which is far more complicated um, than, than just the perception of light. And in fact, disorders involving the, the, the primary visual cortex, uh, the association visual cortex, um, the disorders of dorsal stream, ventral stream, there are many. And, and as a neurologist, this is always fascinating to us. So this brings us back to blind sight. What is blind sight? Well, the vision is fairly rudimentary. These patients will describe a shadow that they may see uh, passing by or, or may actually perceive motion and movement, um, but, but it's not of, of a very high resolution. And there's always been a debate as to whether this is real or not. But I think more and more research has shown that the existence of this condition is, is no longer disputed. Patients may, may make accurate saccades to moving targets. They may point to visual targets presented in the blind hemi field. They may be able to discriminate brightness, movement, size, orientation. And in fact, uh, there's studies to actually show that patients may sense facial expression, especially fear. Uh, and if you ask patients to guess what they're looking at, you will find that their guess will usually be well above chance. And if the question arose, how common is blind sight in patients who have uh, um, hemianopia? I think the answer would be, it depends on, on how uh, you press the patient to, to give you an answer. Uh, for instance, if you do your routine testing of, of confrontational visual testing, you may actually miss blind sight in these patients who may have a blind hemisphere. But you, if you ask them to guess and using this forced choice technique, you would find that it's far more than by chance, patients may get it correct, maybe 80, 90% of the cases where they will actually get something correct, see horizontal lines or vertical lines or the movement of, of, of a light. So it, it, it depends very much on, on, on how you test these patients. And in fact, some of them have, have quoted the incidence of blind sight in patients with the blind hemifield as high as 70%. So there are two types of blind sight. There's the type one and the type two blind sight. And type one is without awareness versus type two with awareness. Um, and when you have too much of time on your hands, well, of course, there's even more classification. There's the action blind sight, detention, and agnosopsia, where action blind sight is where patients will point to make saccades to a moving target. Attention blind sight is where they tend to recognize the presence of a target or, 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 or an image or an object adjacent to them and may actually notice it. Agnosopsia, on the other hand, is the form of the target or shapes or colors. Um, but with agnosopsia, they lack awareness of its presence. And the pathways involved are, are many. You'd find that action blind sight, for instance, there's the subcortical pathway from the retina to the superior colliculus and further projections to the posterior parietal cortex. The attention blind sight, there's a retinotectal pathway, which goes to the pulmona and then to V5, which is the vision motion area. And agnosopsia is, is from the lateral geniculate nucleus. So it seems that there are alternate pathways to the direct pathway from arising from the, the, um, the usual visual pathway via the lateral geniculate nucleus to the primary visual cortex. And it may be the, these pathways through the superior colliculus, it may be through the lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, but this can be enhanced with practice and in fact may have a role in rehabilitation. So what has been described, the diagram on the left will show you the usual lateral geniculate nucleus to the V1 area, the usual pathway that we're familiar with. But these alternative pathways from the lateral geniculate nucleus, from the supracolliculus, from the pulvina of the thalamus to the extra strive cortex may or may not exist. And in fact, this is what research has, has been focused on. So there, there are various articles that have been written about blind sight over the years. And in fact, if you do a PubMed search, there were about 9,139 articles that I picked up recently. 
and I'm sure the number is increasing. And most of the research has been done by neuroscientists and neuropsychologists. And various questions have been asked over the years and whether we have definitive answers or not, I think is still questionable. Um, it's possible that we have existing pathways within the brain from the lateral geniculate nucleus to these extra striate areas and, and that they become strengthened when V1 is damaged. Another question is whether these alternative pathways develop because of neuroplasticity. So when a patient has had a stroke and if they've lost function of V1, is it through plasticity that these alternative pathways are formed? Is there partial recovery of vision? And as a result of light scatter within the eye, it allows for a fairly rudimentary vision. There may be degrading of vision from a higher resolution to rudimentary vision following a stroke involving the occipital cortex. And, and I think a question that comes up time and again is, is the V1 area, the primary visual cortex, the center for visual consciousness? And studies have been done obviously to address these and, and 10 minutes or so that I'm given to, to have this discussion, wouldn't be able to address all of this, but these accessory pathways probably arise from the lateral geniculate nucleus to the, to the pulvin of the thalamus, to the um, superior colliculus, and maybe ipsilateral, contralateral, but the target eventually is to the extra striate cortex rather than to the V1 area, which is the striate cortex. And these are pictures showing diffusion tensor imaging, tractography. Um, and in this case, this study actually looked at the connections between the green here is the superior colliculus and the yellow is the, is the pulvina. And between the pulvina and the superior colliculus, you can see a number of these pathways exist. So diffusion tensor imaging will show you the flow of water molecules and, and possible white matter tracks. So there's a, a large communication between the two. And between, of course, the, the pulvina and the amygdala, which is the limbic cortex, there's also a, a very strong connection between them. And so the belief is that it's possible in some of these patients that they may perceive facial expression of certain emotions despite being blind in that hemisphere. Um, another useful study has, has been um, looking at uh, patients who have had hemispherectomy, so half the hemisphere has been removed. And in these patients, the increased amount of connectivity between the superior colliculus and the contralateral hemisphere does suggest that neuroplasticity, in fact, may play a role as well. So there are a lot of questions regarding these alternative pathways, functional MRI scans, diffusion tensor imaging, neuropsychological tests have all indicated over the, over the last century that in fact, these alternative pathways do exist. And, and in fact, research has been done both in humans as well as non-human primates. So coming back to my patient, she was only able to detect motion, not shapes, colors, or lines. Uh, we thought she probably had type one blind sight to action blind sight. And on six month follow-up, she still had no light perception bilaterally. She would move, still follow moving targets without any, any specific awareness. And we basically focused on managing her stroke, uh, controlling her blood pressure and making sure that uh, secondary stroke prevention was, was instituted and started on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, we thought she was quite interesting from that perspective merely by the fact that she presented with what looked like a functional blindness, but in fact, uh, turned out to have a uh, blind sight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand. You have given a wonderful insight on blind sight. So I just have one question. She was a default hypertensive uh, patient and also, uh, I mean, uh, she was on um, antiretroviral therapy. How would you rule out the other causes like a press or any PML or anything? And it, was there any imaging characters too specific for only an acute event? Or did you come across any of that also? I, the, the imaging was quite suggestive. Um, if you look at the imaging, the lesions went all the way to the cortex. With PML, they tend to be white, white matter related. Um, press is mostly white matter related as well. But with press, you don't see such prominent um, uh, restriction of diffusion. So it seemed unlikely. She was hypertensive, not very severely hypertensive, and uh, blood pressure was 140 85 on admission. And uh, well, she wasn't encephalopathic either. So, and in fact, with the MRA, you could see that in fact, her vessels were abnormal. So it all pointed to, to bilateral impacts as opposed to press. Uh, PML seemed very unlikely in this patient. She had a, a CD4 count of 989 tend to see PML in patients with CD4 counts, which are much lower, um, mm -hmm. less than 50 usually. So 
she wasn't even a compromise at the time. I, I think in all fairness, it, it seemed that this was a bilateral occipital lobe infarct. Okay. Uh, any other comments, Dr. Gordon? Um, oh, yeah, it's a fascinating uh, case. Uh, I mean, I've always taught that a patient who walks into a &E suddenly totally blind with absolutely no other symptoms whatsoever, uh, that is a top of the Basler syndrome. That's bilateral occipital infarction. Um, and there's virtually no other no other cause for it. And it does is often mistaken for functional disease. Um, it, Larry Weiskrantz actually was originally very keen on this being unconscious vision. That, that's what he thought was so important about it. Um, I mean, uh, people have known about alternative pathways and so on um, uh, for, for many years. But what he was really interested in was the fact that this was um, you could only demonstrate the residual vision uh, by alternate force choice paradigms. The patients denied being able to see anything, but they, they got it right uh, by guessing. Um, and that's rather been conflated with the original uh, idea, which goes back uh, again to the um, uh, early, um, early 20th century uh, of a residual vision, uh, conscious residual vision. Um, and I think the simplest thing is to... Um, uh, keep that dis dis distinction, and they've rather been conflated in the literature recently. Um, but um, it's a it's a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. I Thank looked you. at a patient. I did look at a patient. Uh, I published a, a, in, a, in a don't publish in a journal which which folds. <laughs> I published in a journal that, that folded, so no one's seen my paper. But I showed it actually in the Reduc phenomenon. Um, Spatiotemporal contrast sensitivity is normal, is normal to kinetic uh, stimuli. And blind sight, uh, the, the residual vision is terrible. It's, it's barely measurable. It's so, it's so poor. So it's a completely different phenomenon from, uh, from Riddick. And we've got, we've got some results from, with Panita Jindara's group in the uh, um, showing that what it, th there is a bilateral projection from the LGN to both um, uh, MT, B5. Yeah. So, so, and that seems to be what's preserved. Yes, in fact, that, that's what I read as well, actually, that there's this bilateral innovation from the LGN. Um, whether this is an existing pathway, even in normal brains, or whether it's, it's a feature of, of neuroplasticity, um, I'm not sure whether that has been well worked out, though. Uh, no, it looks it looks to be there in 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 in, um, in normals. Yes, very interesting case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a comment in the chat box. Does blindsight have a common pathway with the saccadic masking? I'm not certain about that. <laughs> um, I mean, if one looks at the, the, the saccadic pathways, um, and um, we, we're looking at, at an efferent pathway and, and, and a vision, and um, I, I don't think one, one can tie up the two. Dr. Gordon Plant, do you have any comments? Um, well, well, I think, yes. I mean, you, you have to look at cases of... Um, uh, motion uh, of um motion blindness the opposite <laughs> mm. so this is this is very rare motion blindness but uh, I, I when i was in san francisco we studied some patients um who had um uh, impaired uh, the opposite impaired motion perception in due to unilateral lesions but the classic case was um the case from seal in in germany bilateral lesions of v5 and, and um, there's, there's the, the control of eye movements does involve the same pathways. It does involve the cortex, and, uh, apart from, you know, VOR and all the subcortical things. But mm. uh, yes, if you get damage to, uh, uh, to, to V5, then, then you have um, abnormal eye movements, but it's, it's more difficult to detect it if it's unilateral. 
Uh, my understanding of achanatopsia, where there's involvement of V5, is that the patient may see still images, but would that affect eye movement? I, I would still think that the eye movement would be smooth and yes. the suit would be fine. Well, I, I would, I would, I would have to um, look for the the studies on that on that patient, but um, uh, there, there, of course, subcortical eye movement control uh, may be unaffected, but. Um, uh, fo following um, a pursuit of object does involve E5. With want of time, we will move on to the next case. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Thank you. So we are going to have the next speaker, Dr. Samira, who is going to talk on blepharospasm. Is it really benign or an essential condition? Over to I you, Dr. Samira. Thank you very much for the invitation, Dr. Satya. It's uh, wonderful to be a part of this program among such eminent uh, neurologists and neuro Um I am basically a, a pediatric ophthalmologist with an ocular surface disease specialist and an interest in neuro ophthalmology. So, let's share in full screen. Full screen. Yeah, can you see the, my screen? Yes. So, uh, blepharospasm is, uh, uh, it's actually a dystonia or it's a movement disorder and is generally termed benign essential blepharospasm in the scientific literature. So, but in this presentation, I will try to show you that it's uh, neither, it shouldn't be termed as neither benign or as an, or an essential condition. So my patients are a young housewife, 39 year old, a nurse, 42 year old, and a 67 year old guard, and then a truck driver who was 27 year old only. And though it's known that benign essential blepharospasm affects uh, women, elderly women, but uh, these were young patients. And uh, they all presented with uh, an inability to keep their eyes open, the spasm started gradually with frequent blinking, but they worsened over a period of three to six years. And they presented to me when they had these problems for the last six, seven years. So they were unable to perform their uh, even routine daily activities like cooking, watching TV, going out shopping or driving. Their lit twitching got worse outdoors. So they curtailed all their outdoor activities and were restricted to their houses indoors. Ultimately, they had to give up their jobs. They became functionally blind. So they were seen by neurologists, psychologists, and were given multiple Botox injections elsewhere. The duration of relief from the spasms reduced gradually following each negative injection. And uh, none of the cases had any eyelid surgery for spasms. So I'll just uh, show you the This is my first patient. And, uh, I Are you trying to move your slides? Sorry? We are... mm. Yeah, we because see, slides uh, are not head, moving. Heading slide. We can only see the heading. It's not moving? It's not moving. Oh, what do I do? <clears throat> uh, what do I do? Resume share? Yes. Unshare and then share again. Okay. Can you see now? Can you see the video now? No. We need no. to unshare. We can. Stop share and share again. Okay. Yes. You play the video separate, you will play the video separately. So share screen again. We can see your PowerPoint and if you want to, you can go to slide number two. Okay. So, do I? Yes. Right. 
So now, can you see the video? Uh, this is slide number two right now. But you can't see the video. Okay. Think, uh, skip that. Unable to play the video. Uh, what do I do? I'm unable to play the video though. I am going to embedded them. Yeah, yeah, do you yeah. have the video separately? Yes. If you have the video separately, you can play it separately. Okay. Just open the video, pause it, and then do the screen share. And screen share. How will it come on the screen share, the video? Uh, you have the video, right? Yeah, it's open. Just, just, just pause it and then do the screen share. Okay. Just share it. Okay, share. Perfect. And play. So this was a young driver who was an AP here, an AP here, had to, he had to give, he had to give up who also had to give up his job. So the other ladies are in the separate video. I'll just stick to these two and okay. So and then back to my screen share. All right. Uh, Sundar, could uh, you help Share, share. Okay. Uh, can you see now? Yes. Yes. Play. So, it's there now? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. So Austin had an acute triggering event, like the loss of a close family member, a spouse, a bad marital relationship, or a divorce. And uh, there was no family history of leprospasm. They were all sporadic cases. None of them had any other neurological symptom or uh, neurological disease, except a diabetes in the elderly uh, guard and arthritis in his knee, uh, rheumatoid arthritis in the nerves. So according to a study by Johnson et al, the closely spaced stressful life events precede the onset of benign essential blepharospasm and hemifacial spasm in 5% of their cases. And uh, the quality of life questionnaire in, the, in my patients, they showed extreme anxiety of not being able to perform even the normal daily activities and they had marked physical disability. Uh, so the other symptoms were photophobia, foreign body sensation, ocular irritation, burning, and heaviness of eyes. Uh, the intermittent sustained bilateral eyelid closure was worsened by bright lights, fatigue, stress, and under a fan or an air-conditioned room. Examination revealed that the blepharospasm had spread to the adjacent uh, facial muscles as evidenced by deep brows, uh, deep furrows on the brow, brow droop, dermatophilesis, and the pseudoptosis, along with uh, only the elderly lady, uh, she had uh, facial twitching in the upper half of the face as well. So on a, a slit lamp examination, they all had some degree of tear film instability, which was evidenced by reduced tear film breakup time in all cases. They all had uh, mother dysfunction. Are you advancing your slide, Dr. Samira? We cannot see the uh, next We cannot it's see It's still them. stuck in the same slide. Which one? The last one? Yeah, please Whatever go. Whatever you started sharing. Stop Quality sharing. of life question. Oh, 
Wait a moment. Stop. <laughs> Do you want to put time and uh, get it back? Can I move on to the next speaker? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what's happening. I mean, I can move them here. And uh, yeah, please do. Sure. 10 minutes. I, I'll, yeah, you, you can go on to the next. <laughs> okay. I think uh, we'll just move on to the next speaker. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. So we'll move on to Dr. Mariana, who will be talking to us. Dr. Mariana, are you around? I am. I'm here. Hi. Right. Please go on. She's going to talk on the other great pretender. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Let me see if the presentation is right here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Satya. Really happy to be presenting this case here today, the other great pretender. I have no financial disclosure. I would like to share with you a clinical case of 57 years old female patient with no ophthalmological history. Systemic hypertension on enalapril, five milligrams per day, who complained of right intermittent diplopia and ptosis of three months ago. In addition, she reported that these symptoms began after presenting an episode of right frontoperiod occipital hemicranial headache of moderate intensity. A complete neuroophthalmologic examination was performed and showed unremarkable motility normal, orthophoria, pupils normal, red glass test negative, eyes test, stress test negative. At this point, what is your suspicious diagnosis? Um, you can please scan the QR, maybe we got it, or go to www.menti.com and go to that code. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Can you scan? I can show the scan. Let's see. This is the scan and this is the code. Let's see if you are trying. Not yet. Let me see if it works. Yes, you are voting now. More results, something else. Place, place your bets. Well, mostly myasthenia rabies. Let's see the results. It's okay, you see everything. Let's move to the presentation. So, in view of these clinical findings, it was decided to perform complementary examination due to the diagnosis suspicious of myasthenia gravis or decompensated phoria and, I, and, I, and an isolated headache episode, MRI, MRA, MRB because of the headache, lab, thyroid profile, thyroid antibodies, acetylcholine receptor antibodies, symptom schedule, and alarm patterns. She attended three weeks later with the following results. Headache schedule, right hemicranial headache, two episodes per day, lasting minutes to a few hours, moderate intensity plus intermittent binocular diplopia in left lateral gaze. Some results, visual field, OCT normal, laboratory within normal values, thyroid profile within normal limits, acetylcholine receptor, antibody negative, cardiovascular examination within normal parameters. 
Here, the motility. Now, my limitation in adduction, supraduction, and in production, really, really mild. Pupils, normal. Pending results, MRI, MRI, I'm sorry, MRA, previously requested. She has studies in four days. But two days later, the patient went to the emergency room for progressive right hemicranial headache from moderate to severe and worsening of, worsening of diaplopia. Ophthalmological examination showed doses of two millimeters in the right eye, OD, severe limitation in adduction, supraduction, and infraduction, pupils, OD, dilated. And here we see the images, secular aneurysmal formation of right posterior cerebral artery of 18 by 13 by 13 millimeters with partial thrombosis and without associated signs of rupture and involvement of the cerebral peduncle and third nerve. Arshan treatment with, with stent and coils, digital cerebral and geography, and embolization of right posterior cerebral artery aneurysm. And here you can see the first embolization in March and the second embolization we need in May. These images, T2 sequence, you can see the heterogeneous rounded lesion with hypointense and isointense areas in front of right hemiprotuberance. And one month after treatment, the partially thrombosed aneurysmal sac measuring this time 19 by 15 by 15 millimeters. And in these pictures, you can see the, the lesion T1 with contrast, and one month later, the hyperintense, hyperintense round of eight lesion. And here, let's see the evolution of the images according to the treatment. After the first embolization, post-treatment images, MRI showing right posterior cerebral artery aneurysm, partially embolized by stent and coils technique. After second embolization, improvement in aneurysm thrombosis can be observed. And one week post-treatment on neuroophthalmologic examination, she continued with mild alteration of ocular movement, mostly adduction and improve also her diplopia and headache, persisting anisocoria. Here, a case report similar to our case from this year, a 63 years old female patient with left intermittent doses and diplopia of six months ago, Myasthenia was the diagnosis, MRI normal, MRA four millimeters aneurysm, and the patient decided not to be treated. As we observe in this case, our patient remained with right intermittent diplopia and ptosis for three months until attending the consultation. During the first consultation, no alteration in ocular motility could be evidenced, but after a period of three weeks, the typical symptoms of partial third nerve began to manifest with restriction in eye movements without papillary alteration. The presence of incomplete third nerve palsy without pupillary involvement does not exclude the presence of an artery aneurysm. The performance of CT plus CTA or MRI plus MRI is mandatory in, the, in this case since the rupture of aneurysm could mean a great morbid mortality. The key alarm sign in this case for urgent action was headache. At first was presented with moderate intensity. It was the one that motivated consultation in the emergency room when its intensity suddenly increased and diplopia became constant, motivating the urgent performance of neuroimaging. Take home messages, highlight the role of the neuroophthalmology in, in the early diagnosis, who must perform a close and strict follow up of the patient. 
Keep in mind the incomplete Turner policy without pupil due to cerebral aneurysm and emphasize multidisciplinary work. Thanks to all my team and all of you. Thank you, Dr. Mariana. That was a, I mean, quite an uh, challenging case. Yes, uh, Dr. Krishna. Yeah, your comments? That, was, that was an excellent presentation and a very challenging case. Uh, I, I, um, considering that, uh, you know, the aneurysm to the posterior circulation are so uh, violent and so prone to rupture and, uh, you know, complications, uh, the index of suspicion should be very high. But as I noticed in your presentation, uh, at the time when you had advised an imaging, uh, the, there were no pupillary signs. Uh, what? When would you actually like to image a person with third nerve palsy? I mean, then what was, what are your indications? <clears throat> Thank you. Very good question. In fact, they might be required in all cases. Perhaps the exception would be in those patients over 50 years old with complete third nerve palsy, with pupillary sparing, with history of diabetes or systemic hypertension, or some cardiovascular disease, or who are progressing well, and who are progressing well. And in the others, all requ request uh, an image. Uh, understanding is any partial third nerve palsy with or without pupillary involvement is, I mean, even without pupillary involvement has to be imaged. Is that uh, what the take home you would get? If, if you have people are involved, you must ask about uh, an image. It's no doubt. Uh, we, we also require in all cases of Turner policy, but if it's a uh, pupillar involvement, it's an urgent, uh, it's an emergency. So you have to ask, you can ask for non-contrast CT and contrast CTA and in other places, prefer MRI and MRI. But if you are pupil, if you if the pupil is not sparing, you need the images, of course. I think the uh, red flags here were the, were the presence of the headache as well as the incomplete third nerve, whether or not there was a pupillary involvement at all. Uh, it, it's interesting, uh, I mean, uh, a concern I had, I mean, particularly because We've been looking at uh, the issue of whether to do an intervention or to go in and do an open clipping for posterior circulation uh, aneurysms. Uh, because these are very notorious aneurysms and also because the area is so, so small, it's much easier to go clip and decompress the aneurysm and you know prevent it and immediate get afford immediate relief to the compression in the surrounding structures in that area. So what is your take on whether we should go for an intervention or for clipping, for particularly for a, uh, such a large uh, aneurysm such as this? I mean, in your case, you had a very good response, but uh, yeah. typically you would have a very extended, I mean, period of uh, recovery for a person who's undergone an intervention. Yes, it's true. Uh, another excellent question. Regarding the endovascular technique, most studies report that the recovery uh -huh. with this is earlier, mm. but better accessibility to the posterior circulation aneurysm, the endovascular, and lower morbid mortality rates. Main factor against coily, coily, coiling sorry, is the relative lower rate of complete occlusion that happens in my patient that needs two, two interventions. So with open, with the clip and surgery, you can use to decompress the nerve independently, reduce the subarachnoid hemorrhage, and ensure no residual compression. Uh, it's certainly that low rate of residual and recurrent aneurysm. And open is preferred in anterior cir circulation aneurysm. The studies shows that complete occlusion rate is from 90, 96% after clipping. And after coiling is between 70, 79%. So these are the, the differences. In our case, uh, it's because the aneurysm, aneurysm 
was not was an unwrapped aneurysm and it's in the posterior circulation and because of that they prefer that technique uh do we have any more questions from the panel uh, can i say something Please. of course <laughs> i i think at the end of the day the question of imaging uh, becomes a res an issue of resources i mean particularly with this group we're speaking to the world yeah. and um uh, if if resources were not an issue we probably would scan every acute third nerve palsy walking in through the door um i mean i had a policy of always following them up it, it, however certain i was uh, that it was microvascular i would always see them again and, and of course they make a full recovery uh, and um if they don't make a recovery then then you scan them but if you miss these aneurysms at presentation, it, it may be too late, because I think the the fact that this hemorrhage has occurred without subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually in the wall of the aneurysm, uh, and it's it's very dangerous. It's why they 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 so commonly uh, rupture. Um, yeah. But I think at the end of the day, it, it it is a question of resources. But if you're not going to scan everybody, then you must follow them up. I think the only. Uh real controversy is in the so-called complete third nerve palsy where you're absolutely certain that the pupil is spared and the key is the absolutely certain because it can be very complicated in terms of how you assess the pupil and whether the constriction is really quite normal but as far as i know our case of a basilar big basilar uh, aneurysm is the only case that's ever been reported of a complete third with the pupil absolutely spared. I agree with you, Gordon, that, that not everybody has the resources to scan everybody, but if uh, uh, the saddest case I ever saw was a patient of Tom Schultz's who was seen in the emergency room the night before with a partial third, the pupil was normal, and they decided to send it to Tom in his clinic the next day and in his waiting room the patient's aneurysm ruptured and he succumbed. So I, I agree with you, if you don't have the resources, then it's unfortunate, but really any third uh, with the possible exception of a complete third with the pupil spared, I really do think should have either an MRI, MRA or a CT, CTA. I, I always wish that somebody would build a machine that had an MRI, but a CTA that you could do at the same time, because uh, at least in our experience, that's the most uh, sensitive. But one thing to remember, though, Neil, is the size of the aneurysms in this situation. Uh, when yeah. you're looking for aneurysms as a cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage with no focal signs, you can be looking for very <clears throat> small aneurysms. But the, these aneurysms, are, honestly, they, they tend to be vi visible on on ordinary CT scan. Oh, ab absolutely. They're, they're at least five millimeters. Everybody yeah. has shown that they have to be at least five millimeters. And it, it, it was interesting. There was a study of CTAs where they missed four posterior cerebral artery aneurysms on CTA, but the aneurysms they missed were all two millimeters or two and a half millimeters. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, in general, these studies will pick up a five millimeter or greater aneurysm that's causing a third. Yeah, it's not it's not the same situation as chase, chasing the cause of a, a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, so you can be reassured even by a, you know, a normal CT. But the other problem is, of course, Dan Jacobson showed us that the pupil is abnormal in ischemic. <laughs> if you look too hard, you can find abnormalities even with ischemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon and Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Mariana. That was an excellent case. We will move on. Uh, Dr. Samira, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that earlier. Okay. I think you can start sharing your case. Okay. Uh, can you see now? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, I was, my, again, it's, uh, 
Just go back. How to go back? I did who so okay. Yes, it's visible. You can full screen. All right. So as I was saying, uh, I had four cases. One was a 39-year-old housewife and a nurse, uh, a security guard and a truck driver. And they, were, they all came to me for second opinion because they had severe blepharospasm, benign essential blepharospasm, which was diagnosed by neurologists and ophthalmologists. And they had repeat Botox injections uh, over the last uh, five to six years. And uh, they were extremely anxious uh, because of fear of going blind and they had lost their jobs and they're mentally phys and physically they're handicapped. Um, so, 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 so that's one lady. <laughs> so I'll play this. So these I showed you that that was a truck driver and uh, so he had to leave his job. Then the security guard, they all had this terrible uh, blepharospasm and that was causing them extreme uh, disability. So in all of them, the uh, acute trigger was this anxiety and depression because of uh, loss of a close family member, a spouse, a child, a bad marital relationship or divorce that was present in all cases. And uh, there was no family history, no other neurological symptoms or neurological disease, which was excluded by a previous assessment by the neurologist. And they all had normal MRIs with them. Uh, the only uh, positive finding was uh, they had diabetes, uh, hypertension, arthritis in the uh, knee in the security guard and rheumatoid arthritis in the nurse. And according to the study that I've quoted here, 75% of patients of, of uh, Johnson et al, they had an acute uh, triggering event like a stressful life event in 75% of their cases. Uh, on examination, they had intermittent sustained bilateral symmetrical eyelid closure that was worsened by bright lights, fatigue, stress under a fan. And uh, they had photophobia, ocular irritation, heavy eyes, spread of spasm to the adjacent uh, facial muscles were noted as having brow furrows, brow droop, pseudotosis, dermatochalasis. Uh, and uh, so uh, suppression of blepharospasm by visual attention and uh, positive glabellar tap was present. So uh, on slit lamp examination, they all had myobomin gland deficiency disease and uh, severe disease, uh, which was not diagnosed previously. They had tear film instability. Schirmer's in all four was zero to four millimeter. I mean, it was quite worse. And the cause was again my booming gland dysfunction, blepharitis, trachoma. And uh, so this was in the, the corneal staining. You can see, I mean, that's terrible. And uh, uh, the case one, the, the young lady, the housewife, she had these corneal filaments. So secondary blepharospasm was diagnosed in all of these due to tear film instability and severe dry eye disease. And uh, these all were excluded. They had been excluded all the neurological diseases by the neurologist already. So I didn't uh, have to go into them in detail. So management was of uh, such a chronic condition is to add life to years and improve the quality of life of such patients. And this can't be done by giving just Botox uh, injection that is going to treat just a efferent limb because uh, the clinicians, they are forgetting the important uh, influence of the efferent limb as well as uh, the central influence. And uh, that had been uh, documented is all these studies which have been done on uh, uh, blepharospasm and uh, as a disorder of neuroplasticity. So management was aimed basically in all these cases who had repeated uh, a Botox injection at the uh, efferent limb. Uh, so, uh, lead hygiene to decrease uh, ocular irritation and blepharitis, 
focused on improving the shimmer results by the dry eye treatment with lubricants, acetylcysteine, tetralimus, cyclosporine, and tetracycline eye ointment because they had painful light sensitivity. So I gave them tinted glasses, mild refractive correction, and they were already on anxiolytics and sedatives. So uh, the, uh, uh, the caretakers and the other family members, they were counseled so that they can go on a vacation, socialize, because they were all uh, isolated in their houses. So they needed all this support from the remaining family members. And gradually they were kept under follow-up, repeat follow-up. And the, as the Schirmer score improved, the uh, health of the ocular surface improved, their blepharospasm reduced. And uh, only uh, three of them, they needed uh, minimal orbicularis myectomy. We published the study in uh, American Journal of Cosmetic Surgery in 2015. And the idea is that the circularly running fibers of orbicularis, the ring need to be broken up and uh, to uh, remove a segment of orbicularis in the upper lid and the pretarsal and preceptal leaving behind the optal part and uh, in the lower lid as well. So I'll uh, just play the video, post of videos. And uh, that was the young man, the truck driver on the first day of post op there was no spasm. But uh, this day, uh, surgery or Botox, uh, uh, this must be done once these health of the ocular surface has have been improved and the shimmer readings have improved to at least 10 or 12 millimeters in five minutes. But uh, shorter, below that, I don't think the surgery or Botox will help. The surgery will fail as well. And this is the guard six months post-op. I, I don't have the videos, post-op videos of the nurse, uh, but she also wanted surgery. The housewife, she stuck to the, she said she was happy with the uh, old, uh, topical treatment. And uh, she was much better in uh, one year. This is her picture one year later. She didn't have any Botox after the, the dry eyes was treated. So uh, uh, coming to, to my presentation, I mean, a benign condition is, uh, it's a harmless condition in medical dictionary. It does not spread or involve adjacent body tissues and it, it shouldn't be of any danger to health of a person. On the other hand, essential means of unknown cause or inherent cause. In all our cases, the spasm had spread to adjacent facial muscles. It had caused extreme degree of visual, physical, functional, and psychological disability. And there were definite primary and secondary triggering factors. So we treated those and the blepharospasm disappeared. So how could just such a condition be labeled benign when it is spreading and impairing the quality of life of uh, people and then essential when there are definite causes? But the problem is that uh, once we have labeled a condition as benign essential blepharospasm, then none of the clinicians, they, they bother to look for a definite cause. Then they think, okay, uh, here's a patient with blepharospasm. Uh, let's uh, start off with Botox first. So the, I was uh, going through the literature and there are so many studies and they have uh, uh, this uh, study by Takenori uh, in Umata. They said that uh, the blink, the me uh, maximum blink interval, that is the length of time in seconds, the eyes can stay open without blinking strongly correlates with the tear film break of time. And they found that in all patients with dry eye disease, the maximum blink interval is reduced from minimum of 12.4 uh, seconds to two or one even. Uh, so if the blinking interval is so much reduced, how can they keep their eyes open? And then in another study with my Martino D. et al., the dry eye or photophobia were identified to be associated with a specificity of 94% and a sensitivity of 77% in patients with uh, blepharospasm. So in order to manage or understand blepharospasm, it's uh, all to do with blinking. And uh, so normally the blinking occurs as a reflex, as voluntary and involuntary blinking. And it's the involuntary blinking, which occurs as a resting rate of eight to 21 times per minute that uh, we are most interested. 
It occurs unconsciously and periodically during all waking hours. And its main function is to pick up the tear film from the lower meniscus, tear meniscus, and spread it uniformly over the ocular surface. Cornea has the richest nerve supply and uh, for any body part, and it has about 7,000 free nerve endings per square millimeter of cornea. So as soon as a dry spot appears on the cornea, impulses immediately go to the brain and initiate secretion of all three components of the tear film, as well as the blinking. So the blinking and tear film production, they are intimately related. So four blinks per minute are sufficient to maintain the stability of the tear film. And an average person normally blinks 10 to 20 times per minute with an inter-blink interval of minimum of 15 seconds, 12 to 15 seconds. But in dry eye disease, they are all this inter-blink uh, interval is markedly reduced. So two important points about muscle uh, action is that all body muscles are arranged in agonist and antagonist pairs. And for one muscle to contract, the antagonist must, must relax. Uh, the other important point of motor activity is that motor cortex initiates and executes the movement by the pyramidal tract when ordered by the prefrontal cortex. And when the extra pyramidal system, it offers a fine control. So the levator palpebrae superioris, it is controlled by the cerebral cortex and then the third nerve. And it remains tonically active during all waking hours and keeps the upper lid elevated, helped by frontalis in the extreme upward gaze. Blinking occurs in response to a variety of stimuli, that is eyelid or ocular irritation, visual stimuli, which are uh, transmitted to the occipital cortex, emotions, they are transmitted to the prefrontal cortex, as well as to the uh, basal ganglia. So all these brain parts, they are intimately related with each other as well as the basal ganglia. And it has been found in research uh, studies that globus pallidus, it acts as a central pacemaker to control the blink rate. It normally fires at a steady rate and exerts an inhibitory influence over the motor areas in the cerebral cortex and the spinal trigeminal cortex why are the GABA, GABA is a neurotransmitter, and uh, it ceases the activity once muscle action has taken place. So to initiate a blink, the levator activity is abruptly inhibited. I'll just show you in this. The levator action is abruptly inhibited by the globus pallidus by releasing GABA. And so the orbicularis oculi, which is the direct antagonist, is free to close the lids momentarily. And then at the end of the blink, the globus pallidus in itself is inhibited so that the levator resumes its prior level of activity, tonic activity, and produces rapid opening and closing of the eyelids that lasts, the blink lasts for only 150 to 300 milliseconds and is enough to spread the tear film and keep the eyes smooth. And during sleep and on gentle eye closure, the activity of levator is totally inhibited as the cerebral cortex sleeps. So uh, this cycle, this cycle is very important to uh, keep on uh, continuing and to initiate normal blinking and then it's uh, cessation during sleep. And, but then there is a second loop which involves the putamen. And uh, that it inhibits the activity of the globus pallidus by releasing dopamine. So not only it inhibits the globus pallidus, but also the parietal tract. So uh, the net effect is if the putamen is overactive, then the net effect is that the globus pallidus will be inhibited it and the muscle action will continue and muscle spasm occurs. So, uh, uh, People have found that, that the basic mechanism in blepharospasm is that it's a two-hit hypothesis and uh, there are uh, environmental, genetic, and uh, functional uh, uh, factors. And in every patient with blepharospasm, there is uh, one or two factors are present. So the two-hit hypothesis is that a predisposing factor and an environmental factor they must be present concomitantly to initiate the disease. Uh, 
So if the basal ganglia, especially the globus pallidus, is weakened by injury or aging and fails to send these inhibitory impulses to the pyramidal tract, then the, uh, uh, the eyelid protractors, they continue to be stimulated and they keep the eyelids closed uh, while the levator is kept inhibited and cannot open the eyelids. The second mechanism is that the primary triggering event like anxiety, depression, or loss of a close relative, that is a primary trigger. And then secondary triggers, as in these cases, the, dry, the severe dry eye disease, they resulted in excessive stimulation of putamen and results in its overdrive. So the cells of putamen, they proliferate, it has been evidenced uh, by the PET scans, which showed that the mass, the gradient, the the great, the nerve mass of the putamen has increased in the various MRI studies in various patients with blepharospasm. So, in our study, we found definite uh, causative factors as primary and secondary triggers, and when they were treated, the overdrive of the center was removed, and the blepharospasm uh, improved. So, the remaining uh, the, uh, the nephrospasm that was left was treated uh, by this uh, orbicularis myectomy. And in all these studies, it has been shown that uh, future men level, the, uh, there is gray matter increase in future men. And then, so, and, uh, but in all these studies, you see, interestingly, they are in, posted in the neurology journals and they all uh, indicate that blepharospasm is benign essential blepharospasm. So, I mean, that was quite uh, interesting to me that they have found definitely triggering factors that uh, people living in urban regions, stressful jobs, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, dry eye disease, they are prone to benign essential blepharospasm. So why, it, uh, I mean, use the term essential. These are definite factors which are there. And then in this study by Quante et al, they said that 40 to 60% of patients present with symptoms of burning, dryness, grittiness, which precedes the development of blepharospasm, which is they have labeled secondary rightly, but they are 40 to 60% patients. And now we are living in an era where dry eye disease is going to be, uh, it, it's affecting everyone. And these clinics, neurology and neuro-ophthalmology clinics will be full of patients with blepharospasm. So if we are just, uh, uh, you know, thinking about this dry eye disease as a major factor in causing blepharospasm, uh, we will be mistreating many patients. So the treating clinician must search for a cause which must be treated by a joint effort of a neurologist, psychologist, and ophthalmologist. And so by this conservative uh, approach, uh, 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 which is directed on the primary trigger that is on the higher centers, the secondary trigger, which is affecting the afferent limb. So this efferent limb or the spasm can easily be treated and whatever is left can be adequately treated with uh, uh, either Botox or by surgery. So I mean, I, I would propose that uh, using benign essential blepharospasm is a misnomer. It's a disabling condition. It's underdiagnosed. And definitely there are primary and secondary triggers. So a comprehensive approach must is needed to improve the quality of life of such patients. It's a definitely treatable condition, but needs proper management. Thank you. Thank much. you. Thank you, Dr. Samira. And I think we will have one question from Dr. Murli. With want of time, please, I request everyone to post their questions on the chat box. Dr. Murli, do you have any question? Yeah, I have uh, one question, Dr. Samira. Uh, have you tried this minimal uh, orbicularis myectomy for other uh, indications? Like, like apraxia of eyelid opening or hemifacial spasm? I mean, would it work? Apraxia of eyelid opening is actually the pretarsal muscle. It, it stops contracting. So uh, it's actually uh, that uh, I've seen in patients who had repeated Botox injections and ultimately Botox is, is not a, a totally harmless uh, injection and it, it causes problems. And uh, these patients, they have uh, uh, totally a failure of the pretarsal uh, muscle to contract and this myectomy, orbicularis myectomy, it won't help in that. That muscle is not responding at all. So, I mean, repeated Botox is, is, is not a useful thing to do. 
one or two is fine, but I get patients who had seven, 10, even 14 injections over five, 10 years, and it's awful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samira. And I think we will move okay. on to the next session. Thank uh, you so much. I'm going Sorry to invite about... Dr. Himalini, who is going to moderate the session two of today's Case Fest. Thank you, all speakers. Over to you, Himalini. Uh, Hema, let me introduce you, please. Yeah, go ahead. Unshare. Go ahead. So Dr. Himalini Samant is in is a director of Acura Site Day Care Center at uh, Mumbai. And she is also an honorary associate professor at JJ Hospital in Mumbai. She is an honorary consultant at Just Look Hospital, Mumbai, India. She has a special interest in pediatric ophthalmology, cataract, strabismus, and neuro-ophthalmology. She has presented papers nationally and internationally. She had the best paper at the SARC conference case series of six patients with myasthenia gravis. She is a co-author of DK Notes, a book on ophthalmology for undergraduates. And she has given several didactic lectures in the above specialty in several local and national conferences. Over to you, Himalini. Thank you, Dr. Satya. So along with me, I also have um, Dr. Sovita Rath. Uh, she's a faculty in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology, Strabismus and Neuro-Ophthalmology at the Dr. Shroff Hospital in Delhi. And she's in charge of the Neuro-Ophthalmology Wing and Ocular Electrophysiology Services. She's actively involved in teaching, training, and research in strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology and has special interest in pediatric cataract and complex strabismus surgeries. She has several publications to her credit and has won the best podium presentation in strabismus at the ARS 2021. We also have Dr. Preeti Patil, who is an Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at University of Pittsburgh, and she also practices pediatric ophthalmology strabismus with a special interest in pediatric neuro-ophthalmology. She was trained in India at, uh, at Shankar Netralia, and following which she uh, uh, had an additional fellowship at the University of San Diego in USA. She was then the clinical faculty at um, LV Prasad Eye Institute for, in India for seven years before moving on to Pittsburgh. And her research interests include pediatric neuro-ophthalmology and strabismus and CDI. Dr. Janel Shet leads the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus neuro-ophthalmology department at Shantilal Sangvi Eye Institute. He's a passionate teacher, has long-term has many, has trained many long-term fellows during his tenure. He has co-authored three book chapters, has several PubMed indexed publications to his credit, and he has presented numerous papers in national and international conferences. Our first speaker for the day is Dr. Daniel Gold. He doesn't require any introduction, but he's an associate professor of neurology, ophthalmology, and otolaryngology at, um, at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He maintains active clinical practice, seeing patients with vestibular and neuro-ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmic conditions. He's also heavily involved in education of residents and fellows giving frequent lectures and topics related to his subspeciality. He's received several awards and has outstanding educational contributions to neuro-ophthalmology virtual education library. And he's also written a neuro-ophthalmology and neuro-ontology neuro case book, a text, case-based textbook. So over to you, Dr. Dan. Excellent, thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, but... Okay, good. Good. Great. Let me optimize for video clip. Uh, if you learn nothing else from my talk, learn that you should always optimize for video clip. If you're showing a video on Zoom, it works very well. All right. So I am going to, uh, to talk about a case. Weight loss, cognitive changes, and nystagma. Sound familiar? Um, I've got to get my, my son to his soccer game. Dr. Sestari has to pick up his toddler soon. So I, I think we're going to kind of go through uh, the first couple cases pretty quickly. So feel free to reach out to me, questions, concerns, or email. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions. 
So I want to thank uh, Dr. Olwyn Murphy as well, who's not here, for her help in preparing this. So we're going to talk about a 43-year-old man who six months ago experienced abdominal pain, anorexia, and weight loss. Three months ago, started to experience anxiety, depression, slowed cognition, and one month ago, um, oscillopsia, dizziness, and diplopia. This is him in our bedside exam as he's waiting to get an MRI done. And there's a lot of stuff going on with his eyes here. Um, and if you, you can see the lid nystagmus when he's looking down, there's an upbeat component, there's a torsional component, there's a little bit more upbeat in the right eye, there's a little bit more torsion in the left eye, there's a little bit of left beating as well the whole time. So there's kind of three things happening simultaneously. You see the top poles of both eyes are always beating towards the left ear throughout. So it's a conjugate torsional nystagmus plus a left beating nystagmus plus an upbeating disconjugate nystagmus. Again, more upbeat in the right eye. What does all that mean? Um, on a, a very kind of focused, just telling you what else was abnormal exam, there's also a left hypertropia. Again, he was uh, about to go into the MRI scanner, and this was a left hyper that increased in contralateral gaze and ipsilateral head tilt. We couldn't measure fundus torsion subjectively or objectively, but we were uh, wondering about a skew versus a left fourth nerve palsy. He also had truncal ataxia as well as a labile blood pressure. So when we see nystagmus, spontaneous nystagmus in a patient who's dizzy, what do we think about? There's a left beating component. When that's the case, typically we're thinking about something that's vestibular, um, usually peripheral vestibular, but not always. And I'll tell you that this patient did have a completely normal head impulse test. Head impulse test to the right side was normal. The vestibulo ocular reflex to the right side was completely normal. And this is not a peripheral pattern of vestibular nystagmus. So we're thinking about the central vestibular pathways here. What about that torsional component? Uh, again, it's a little bit disconjugate. It's a little bit more torsion in that left eye, a little bit more upbeat in that right eye. That makes us wonder about the central uh, vestibular pathways, vertical semicircular canal pathways, and or the utricle pathways. Um, and it's dissociated. Again, we're, we're getting away from the periphery here. Think about a medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion, although he did not have an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And then there's an upbeat component. That's definitely not compatible with a peripheral vestibular etiology. And again, we're thinking uh, very hard about these central vestibular pathways, especially as they course through the brainstem. So the differential diagnosis in this patient with a subacute neurological disorder with posterior fossa, prominent posterior fossa syndrome, neuropsychiatric and autonomic manifestations, and gastrointestinal symptoms. He's lost weight. He has anorexia. Um, we're thinking about kind of the big categories, autoimmune perineoplastic, metabolic, nutritional, infectious, degenerative, vascular, CNS, malignancy. But more specifically, we're wondering about GAD syndromes and we're wondering about um, anti-Kelch 11 and related disorders that can cause um, a, a vestibulopathy, sometimes peripheral, sometimes central, or posterior fossa syndromes. We're thinking about Wernicke's encephalopathy. Does that sound familiar, right? Weight loss, nystagmus, cognitive dysfunction. Always think about thiamine deficiency. Give every single patient who you have any suspicion for thiamine deficiency in the emergency department intravenous thiamine immediately. Is this Whipple's disease? There's GI symptoms. There's a, a a brainstem syndrome as well, presumably. What about mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalopathy? There's not ophthalmoparesis. There is a hyper, there is diplopia, um, but, but think about mitochondrial as well. Vasculitis, lymphoma, metastatic disease, the, the differential diagnoses that we always kind of throw on the end of the list. So what did we do? Um, we looked very specifically for everything on, on that short list. And from a metabolic infectious autoimmune disorder standpoint, the only thing that came back abnormal was the anti-GAD65 antibody, which was very, uh, very low abnormal. So where the normal is less than five and this was 13.
So what is the significance of that? MRI contrast enhanced, very high quality, uh, multiple MRI scans, uh, high resolution, thin cuts to the posterior fossa, normal, normal, and more normal, CSF assessing for inflammation, everything, oligoclonal bands, um, the analysis was completely normal. We did do a PET scan of the body and brain due to a high suspicion for a perineoplastic process which interestingly didn't show any cancer, didn't show any abnormalities in the body or the brain, but it did show um, that, that there was a, a hypermetabolism involving the extraocular muscles that were responsible for the slow phases of the nystagmus. So we could see that the bilateral inferior rectus muscles lit up. Um, that's the slow phase downward because this patient has upbeat nystagmus. We couldn't visualize the oblique muscles given just the resolution of the PET scan. But I also said there's a left beating nystagmus. And in fact, there's this slow phase to the right, the, the slow phase, um, which is the pathologic phase of this jerk nystagmus demonstrates that the, those muscles are also hypermetabolic. Interestingly, is this a GAD antibody associated disorder? Four is the fact that it's the, there's, we have a positive abnormal titer. We have a brainstem cerebellar involvement of posterior fossa syndrome against is the fact that it was very low. It was 13. And we can see this sometimes in normal people. In my experience, I've never seen a patient with an anti-GAD syndrome with a titer that wasn't in the 10,000s or hundreds of thousands no neuromuscular symptoms, um, and there was a gastrointestinal prodrome. That's not something that you really think about or that is that, that characteristic of a GAD syndrome. Is it simply a marker of autoimmunity? So clinical course, there was a high suspicion for an autoimmune process. He got plasma exchange five sessions and the nystagmus really abated. Diplopia resolves, the mobility improved, mental status improved, he was much better. There was one outstanding test in the Mayo panel and that was an anti-DPPX antibody, which was positive at a very high titer, which led us to the di diagnosis of an anti-DPPX encephalitis. Rituximab was commenced, nystagmus, and everything got much better. There was a resolution of the PET scan abnormality of the extraocular muscles once the nystagmus went away. And repeat serial testing over months, over years now, revealed no underlying malignancy. So what is anti-DPPX encephalitis? Um, it's a subunit of potassium channels that is expressed on brain and gut neurons, okay, brain and gut. Clinical features, cognitive and psychiatric dysfunction, myoclonus, tremor, seizures, hyperplexia. We should think about progressive uh, encephalomyelitis, rigidity, rigidity, and myoclonus syndrome as well. But in PERM, P-E-R-M, we don't see these other features that, that were seen in this particular patient. We saw very prominent brainstem predominance, uh, but perhaps cerebellar dysfunction as well and autonomic dysfunction, check, 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 check in this patient, as well as very, very common um, prodromal weight loss and gastrointestinal symptoms in greater than 80% of patients, okay? This is the patient months and months later, a year or so later, and that spontaneous nystagmus has gone away. He has a gaze evoked and downbeat nystagmus. And interestingly, at near, he's got a spontaneous upbeat. And at distance, he has a spontaneous downbeat. And he actually did pretty well with dolfampridine, four aminopyridine, um, given his oscillopsy are related to this spontaneous downbeat. So his nystagmus really changed over time. Um, and I bring this up uh, if anybody's interested in sort of why we should be checking, looking at nystagmus at near and a distance and the vergence angle matters because if we've affected centrally these otolith pathways, the utricle for instance, uh, much like what happens in Wernicke's encephalopathy, we might see a change in that nystagmus. In Wernicke's, commonly patients have a spontaneous upbeat nystagmus in the emergency department. If you have them converge, it transitions to downbeat. 
in the emergency department. Um, but months and months later, this is exactly what it can look like. It turns into a spontaneous downbeat that can then transition back into an upbeat. If anybody's interested about um, these, these proposed pathways, uh, Dr. Z and others wrote a very nice paper about that. Take home points, think about DPPX encephalitis in patients with any prominent posterior fossa presentation. Lots of patients um, uh, reported in the literature have diplopia and have dizziness and oscillopsia and nystagmus and complicated ocular motor syndrome. So don't forget about this, especially when there are GI prodromal symptoms. And again, don't forget that a low positive serum GAD antibody is a variable clinical relevance. It doesn't always mean, it might be a red herring. It doesn't mean that's what your patient has. Here are some references. And again, um, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, sorry to, to kind of go through quickly. Um, I want to get my, my son to his soccer game on time. Dr. Sovita, you can take over the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Gold. That was a very interesting case and a rare case as well. I would just like to know the, your differential uh, points, differentiating points from PERM. You did emphasize it, but uh, what literature says there's quite convergence between PERM and DPPX where DPPX, which has been uh, recently mentioned, but uh, the features of brainstem syndrome overlap. But what's the most clinching point which will help us differentiate them? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say that that PERM was sort of a piece of uh, of the the puzzle, right? It, it could have explained some, but not necessarily all of those symptoms. That being said, PERM is thought to be sort of a subtype of of uh, stiff person syndrome, sometimes associated with anti GAD, sometimes associated with anti glycine antibodies. Um, so it's absolutely something that should be thought about and tested for in such a patient. So how long was the rituximab given? Uh, so he's still getting sort of a, a maintenance periodic uh, every six to 12 months uh, rituxan. Um, he has had some minor relapses over the years, um, but overall he's, he's doing pretty well, all things considered. Now, three years later, I believe. There's one question in discussion. Was the S antibody positive in serum or CSF? I think it, was it was in the it, it was in the serum. Are there any other ophthalmic manifestations? Like here we had a uh, hypertropia, diplopia, nystagmus. Yeah, any so I mean, I think I think anything because the 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 posterior fossa is typically involved. Any ocular motor syndrome you can have. Um, so I don't think that this particular, although there were uh, at least one other reported case in the literature of a kind of an upbeat torsional spontaneous nystagmus that was very similar to his, but I can't say that there's a characteristic ocular motor or nystagmus pattern that says to you this has to be DPPX versus something else. There's another question. Do we have this antibody test here in India? But I think we need to find that out because from our Indian experts, if they have seen such case. And why did you think of PET scan? Yeah, I mean, we had a high suspicion for, for something perineoplastic uh, potentially in this, in this young, otherwise healthy up until the last six months. Gentlemen, given the weight loss, given everything else, we were concerned of, uh, for malignancy as well, or perineoplastic in particular. Is there any role of steroids in such cases? Um, so, uh, so he did get steroids uh, just prior to the plasma exchange. Uh, there wasn't much of a response. There was a, a pretty dramatic response with the plasma exchange. This is a rare condition. There are no uh, large-scale trials or um, large case series. It's, it's really kind of anecdotal. I know it's quite rare. Less cases reported so far. So Absolutely. And doc, Dr. Miller makes a great point. Perineoplastic consideration also due to the rapid progression without neuroimaging findings. Absolutely. Always think about, uh, about perineoplastic in that situation. Are there any other questions or should we go on to the next speaker? I Dr. think we can move on to the next speaker, ma'am. Okay. So I'm going to thank you. So far. Thank you, Dr. Dan. We'll go on to our next um, speaker who is 
Dr. Dean. And Dr. Dean um, Sisari is an associate professor of ophthalmology associated with the Harvard Medical School in the Massachusetts um, Eye and Your Infirmary. He has completed residencies in both neurology and ophthalmology from Cornell. He has completed fellowship training at the Massachusetts Eye and Your Infirmary. He's approximately one of the 10 physicians in the United States who is board certified both by American Board of Ophthalmology as well as American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He's very involved in medical education and is the director of neuroophthalmology and adult strabismus fellowship at the Massachusetts Eye and Your Infirmary. So over to you, Dr. Dan, sorry, Dr. Dean. Let me just share my screen here. Um, okay. Can you can you see my screen? Yes. It's my PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me today. This is really great, and I apologize that. Um, I do have to pick up my toddler. It is a Sunday morning here in Boston. It's a beautiful day. And I'm going to present a case that um, I think is a really interesting case from the point of view that it's just a clinical diagnosis. And the first time I saw this case, I remember I was a fellow and walked into the room and did not understand it. And my mentor, Dr. LaSalle said, son, it's this. And he gave the diagnosis just without even examining the patient. Just, just hearing. hearing it. So, so um, I'm getting a background echo. Um, hopefully you can hear me without that echo. So today it's, um, I, I called it seeing double a surgical surprise after heart repair. So this is a 49. So can you make it a slideshow? Uh, yep. Sorry about that. How's that? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. So this is a 49 year old man who uh, his chief complaint was difficulty focusing and moving his eyes and keeping his eyelids open. Now, six months prior to his presentation at our hospital, he had a history of a spontaneous dissection of the ascending aorta with repair of the aortic valve um, and it was replaced. And his surgery was complicated by intraoperative seizure and he was comatose for two weeks postoperatively. A month later, just five months prior to his presentation, he really noticed problems focusing and moving his eyes to specific targets. At that time, he had some intermittent diplopia and he had an inability to keep his eyes open. When he saw us about six months after um, the operation, he had these continuing symptoms, although they were somewhat improved but really he had difficulty focusing and again, moving his eyes to specific targets. And specifically he had difficulty reading, he had dizziness um, and, it, and then, sorry. And then his past medical history, he has a history of ulcerative colitis since the age of five. He has a history of primary sclerosing cholangitis status post uh, liver transplantation in 1992. He had no prior ocular history. There's a list of his medications there. He was a smoker and he had quit uh, about 10 years prior and he denied a history of alcohol or drug use. And he doesn't have a family history of neurologic or ophthalmic uh, diseases. On his after an exam, it was essentially normal. 2025 uh, was the best visual acuity in his right eye, 2020 in the left. The rest of the after an exam and slip lamp examination was normal. He had an MRI that was normal, but I want to show you his EFERN examination. So this is the video. To the right, as fast as you can. Don't move your head. Yeah, good. All the way to the right. All the way to the left. As fast as you can. All the way to the right. To the left. Can you look up for me? How did you Ready? 
And so that's a really good video in which smooth pursuits were relatively impaired, but saccades horizontally and vertically were significantly impaired. And um, it's interesting too, because he denied difficulties reading or using compensatory strategies to read, such as head turns or blinking. But we can see this video. This is him when he reads. Uh, the changing of the idea. Puzzle months analyst to moan the scarcity of data to interpret a personal symbolism. Swim simply stated, if you want to know me, study my work. Argu arguable, this phrase represents the key. A consecration to his fundamental ideology that demonstrates his transformation from the historicist. And so, sorry, the MRI slide um, was supposed to come after this. So the workup uh, included an MRI scan that was completely normal. And this is the diagnosis is really selective psychotic palsy following cardiac surgery. And so this is like a rare entity that's been described in the medical literature. There's probably 10, I don't know, maybe 20 cases at this point in the world literature. I think we've seen two or three cases here in the last uh, 15 or so years. But I think I wanted to present this case because again, it is rare and the diagnosis is made upon the story, um, the history of the cardiac surgery and then impaired saccades. So just briefly, what are saccades um, or saccadic palsies? They're rarely seen after this cardiac or aortic surgery. They've been reported after cardiopulmonary bypass and hypothermia as, as well as circulatory arrest. And the, really the question is like, why does this happen? What's the etiology? Is it ischemic? And if it is, where is the injury? Because the MRIs are normal. And what's the pathogenesis? <clears throat> so saccades, as we all know, are rapid, brief, conjugate eye movements, and they bring target images onto the fovea. And they're critically important for reading, exploring the visual scene, and they reset our eyes during nystagmus. Now, how are they generated, right? So brainstem neurons that generate saccades can be broken down into these two groups, the premotor burst neurons and the omnipause neurons. So for the PBN or the, 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 these burst neurons, it's this interplay between excitatory and inhibitory burst neurons that kind of move the eyes briefly. And then you have these omnipause uh, neurons that are kind of regulating the system, okay? The horizontal saccades are generated by the premotor burst neurons in the PPRF, which, which is the parapontine uh, reticular formation in the pons, and the vertical saccades are regulated by the RIMLF, which is the rostral interstitial nucleus of the uh, MLF. And then the omnipose neurons, um, like I said before, they inhibit both the excitatory and the inhibitory burst neurons. We know that there are clinical disorders that can impair brainstem networks that generate these saccades. Typically, these are infarcts to the paramedian brainstem, metabolic disorders, and degenerative disorders, okay? But this syndrome of psychotic palsy following cardiac or aortic surgery, I find it fascinating because it's well-recognized in the literature, even though it's rare, but we really do not understand how it happens. And the question I, whenever I see these patients that I ask, and we should be asking ourselves, is how can an ischemic process selectively inhibit these brainstem neurons, but yet they leave adjacent structures intact? And there's a really interesting case by Eggers et al. that examined at autopsy um, a patient who had this condition eight years later, and at autopsy, um, 
both the burst neurons and the omnipose neurons anatomically were normal. So Eggers et al. put forth this really interesting hypothesis, and I'm just going to spend a couple of uh, minutes talking about it. And they've really hypothesized this concept of perineural nets. So they hypothesize a perineural net is a specialized extracellular matrix structure of aggregated macromolecules um, and sheathing the neurons that have the high firing activity, like the, uh, the burst neurons and the omnipause neurons. And they hypothesize about their role, but it's still unclear. So if you have these perineural nets, they're thought to possibly stabilize the synaptic contacts. They may have a role in neuroprotection, and they, they're thought to serve as these rapid ion exchangers for potassium ions. But really, the hypothesis is that they are more vulnerable to hypoxia. And so there's a rat model that show, showed the perineural nets are more vulnerable than the ensheathed neurons in the perinfarct zone. So the hypothesis is that during cardiac surgery, there's ischemia that could damage these perineural nets without directly injuring the burst neurons or the omnipause neurons. Um, and so that's the basis of why we're getting an impaired saccades clinically. Um, and so this is the paper that really kind of um, suggests this hypothesis. And, and I just wanted to give them credit for it. So they're really saying it's a hypoxic ischemic damage to the perineural nets that might contribute to the psychotic palsy that follows cardiac and aortic surgery. And um, I just thought it'd be an interesting uh, case to kind of put out there because if you've never heard of this before, or have never seen it before, you're not gonna make the diagnosis. If you've seen it or heard of it, it's, a, it's an easy diagnosis to make, but the question is, why is it happening? And I, I thought it'd be a fun discussion if Neil Miller or anyone else wanted to make some comments about it. Thank Dean, you. that's a great case. Uh, I've seen a number of these as well. And I've always wondered why there was selective involvement right. for the uh, horizontal saccades. I can't remember in your case, I blanked out, I guess. Uh, what were vertical saccades like? They were impaired also in this case, yeah. which was yeah. interesting because a lot of times you see it as either horizontal or Precisely. Vertical. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a neat case and uh, I wish I understood it. Yeah, I just, you know, I thought I'd present something different, but I remember being a fellow, God, 20 years ago and Dr. LaSalle was like, there's a case of this and he knew it right away. And I kind of wanted to present this because it's rare. And if you've seen it and heard of it, you'll make the diagnosis. And it's not really uh, testing. Well, you don't have, the MRI is always normal in these cases. Um, and over time, they tend to get a little bit better. There, there's no treatment that I'm aware of. Um, I've seen like, that, that everybody on the on the call, all the panelists, you know, understand this. But one of the hardest things that we have to teach our registrars and our fellows is how to look both at pursuit and at saccades in all patients, because they tend to just say, you know, let's let's look to the right or left or whatever and not really differentiate between saccades and pursuit, either horizontally or vertically. Right. And the interest, that's, that's a great point, because the interesting thing in this case is that the um, smooth pursuit was actually really good. So a lot of times our residents will just ask someone to look at their finger, quickly move left, right, up and down, it's fine, and then they move on. Um, but in this case, really smooth pursuit was really normal. It was the saccadic testing that tells you the diagnosis. Dr. Dean, there's a question uh, from the audience that why did your patient not have any difficulty in reading? How did he manage to shift fixation to a new line? <laughs> yeah, these are good questions. You know, because we use micro saccades for reading and most of the time people would complain of, of difficulty reading, but that's why I showed that video he, of him reading. He's saying he didn't have difficulty. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't have a good explanation, but he himself didn't think he had difficulty. But when you listen to him read, he, he did have 
some difficulty and it was slow, but he was able to kind of overcome the deficit. And my experience again with N of three of these patients is that over time, they tend to get better. I don't know, Neil, if that is your experience too. Did he, did he wear glass, reading glasses normally? Because it may the, be it, it may be that he's really it's more scanning than it is saccades, uh, or it may be that his micro saccades are not as impaired as large saccades. There's, there there's another there question have, saying that um, how would you differentiate this from an ocular motor apraxia acquired ocular motor apraxia? Uh, I'm not an expert in that. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Neil, do you have an answer for that? No. No, I don't. But uh, Ansel made the point that it was his impression that he was moving his head back and forth. And that's why I asked about glasses, because people who wear glasses tend to move their heads rather than their eyes. Yeah. There, there have been some studies on reading in uh, patients without saccades, and, and you can substitute head movements yeah you can kind of the head thrust kind of movements right yes yeah. well, well yes yeah. sorry well, well, it, because you don't have a well, ordinarily of course when you when you make a a head movement um it's it's it doesn't have the same effect but um if you don't have any saccades then that's what um uh, that's that you can read using head movements so would these patients benefit if you ask them to close one eye and read? If they genuinely have a problem with reading and if you ask them to close one eye and read, would that help? I don't think so because even with one eye, it's the saccadic movement from one word to the next. And so whether it's one eye or both eyes, I think it would be the net effect. Initially, this patient had diplopia. Um, so if that was the case, then yes, closing one eye would help but usually the eyes are aligned and it's just, it's the psychotic or movement from one word to the next. And I, I think it's gonna be the same whether it's monocular or binocular. Again, these things, it's, it's not like I've seen a million of these patients who have this experience in 20 years. I think I've seen three. So, um, so it's, it, it's, it's a good question. If I could just say that the thing to remember about ocular motor apraxia is that it's a misnomer. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's a saccadic palsy. It's a loss of saccades. It's not an apraxia. Right. So this is this is in fact the same thing. As the was. only difference, though, Gordon, is the is head thrusting. Yeah, the general the, ocular motor apraxia gets better over time, and this yeah. condition, as far as I can tell from my patients, doesn't. Neil, um, have you seen a bunch of these patients? Oh, maybe half a dozen over 50 years. And, you know, yeah. and um, it doesn't seem to be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the use of head thrusts here, which we see with um, uh, most saccadic pauses, the, including the so-called ocular motor apraxia, that the, the patients adapt by using head thrusts. Again, I, so again, N of three or so, but the, the three patients that I've seen with this, Neil, you're saying you didn't see that improvement. I, there was- With the with, with congenital ocular motor apraxia, not with, with this- Oh, condition. got it. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense, Sorry. right? Because these patients, it's presumably an, an ischemic event, right? It happens during surgery. So it's a sudden, they wake up and it's there. Um, although we don't know. Um, and then like a lot of ischemic injuries, there is recovery. So this patient, you know, the reading seemed to be better five to six months later. So I think there is some natural improvement. And I guess- Either that or adaptation. Right. That's what that, yeah. Any role of MRI angio in these cases, since you mentioned it was ischemic for diagnosis? I, my understanding and, and from our experience and the literature, you can get every study you, you want to get. It's normal they're, all area. Normal. they're all normal. There's a case report. I think the original case was from 1986 in which they did an autopsy. And, and at autopsy, um, there was damage that was seen 
in the um, areas of the uh, rostral interstitial MLF and the uh, burst neurons. But then in Egger's case, there was no damage on autopsy, and yet both patients had the same clinical condition. So again, it's super rare. There's not a lot of pathologic specimens. I'm aware of like one case, uh, two cases in which they looked at the pathology. Um, and one of the cases, it, it was normal, but all the, all the imaging is completely normal in these cases. And so that's why I thought it was a good case because if a patient comes after surgery and they have impaired saccades, MRI is normal, you don't know, you need to have heard of this to then make the diagnosis because it's recognized, but not well under, understood. Thank you, Dr. Dean, for sharing this fantastic case with our excellent take-home message for the general ophthalmologists, postgraduates, and other neuro-ophthalmologists. Uh, if there are no more questions, then can we go on to the next speaker? So I'm going to share my screen again. And our next speaker is Dr. Zoe Williams. She's an associate professor of ophthalmology, neurology, neurosurgery, and a fellowship director and chief of neuro-ophthalmology service at the U University of R Rochester Medical Center in New York. Mm -hmm. She served in neuro-ophthalmology committee from 2015 to 21 and is a chair of the BCSC neuro-ophthalmology committee. She also serves on the American Board of Ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, Neuro-Ophthalmology Exam Development Committee for Written and Oral Board Certification, and is an oral board examiner. She's a section editor for Neuro-Ophthalmology Virtual Educational Library and has authored 49 peer-reviewed publications and several book chapters, and also a recipient of an award uh, in 2020 for achievement. Thank you, and over to you. Dr. Zoe? Yep, I am here. I thank you so much for the kind invitation to be uh, presenting as part of this great group. Let me just see. Are you guys seeing my slides on the small uh, screen at the moment? Or no? No. No. Let me try the reshare here. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the title of my talk is Positive DWI. I have no financial disclosures. Our case is a 60-year-old with multiple myeloma who came in for acute vision loss in his left eye. He was rather vague on the details, but said that he awoke at 1 a.m. with severe headache. And then again at 3 a.m., he woke up and noticed he had complete loss of vision in his left eye. He denied any preceding transient vision loss or diplopia, but did say he had some mild blurred vision the evening before, and he denied any preceding trauma. His past medical history, he had hyperlipidemia. He had a remote history of DVT and pulmonary embolism in 2009. He had multiple myeloma, which was diagnosed 15 months prior. He actually told me he'd never been on chemotherapy, uh, but I found a prior note about six months before from uh, oncology that said that he was currently off chemotherapy due to side effects, but was previously treated. And he had a history of multiple uh, thoracolumbar compression fractures related to falls from alcohol abuse. His medications were significant for apixaban. And his social history, as I mentioned, he had uh, current alcohol abuse. He was also a significant smoker, and he de denied illicit drug use. On chart review, two days prior to his vision loss, he had been seen in the emergency department for alcohol withdrawal syndrome, and he'd had a similar episode a month before, and two months before, he'd been evaluated for possible seizure and was again treated for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So on the day I saw him, he reported a one-day history of left-sided headache, scalp tenderness, and jaw claudication. He denied any fever or chills. Uh, he reported chronic weight loss over the past year, and labs that were done in the emergency room included a normal ESR. His CRP was mildly elevated 27, normal for our lab is up to 8. Uh, his CBC showed a mildly elevated white count and normal uh, hemoglobin and hematocrits and normal platelets. His ethanol level was 133, which is markedly elevated, and he had a non-contrast head CT, which showed no acute intracranial abnormality. 
So on exam, this was 36 hours after his vision loss, his visual acuity was 20-25 in the right eye, no light perception in the left eye. He had full color vision in the right eye. He had a bristly reactive pupil on the right. And on the left side, he had a mid dilated pupil that was non reactive to direct and consensual uh, with a large afferent pupillary defect by reverse. His visual field for the right eye showed diffuse depression on pattern deviation. There was mild and large blind spot. His motility was normal on the right. On the left, he had diffuse ophthalmoplegia and he had an exotropy of 35 by Krimsky. His external exam was significant for a two millimeter proptosis on the left. He had mild left upper lid edema and ptosis. In this photo here, his lids being elevated for the photo. Uh, his levator function was normal and he had decreased left facial sensation in the first division of the trigeminal nerve. On the anterior segment, this is normal on the right except for cataract. On the left, he had mild conjunctival injection. He had corneal edema, edema with decimase folds, two plus anterior chamber cell, one plus cortical cataract, and no vitreous cell. And on posterior exam, you can see in the right eye, he just has a few macular drusen. In the left eye, you can see that there's diffuse retinal whitening without a cherry red spot. You can see that there is uh, pallid disc edema as well. He has severe arterial attenuation consistent with ophthalmic artery occlusion. Down on his macular OCT, you can see that there are a few drusen on the right side. And then on the left side, he has this diffuse thickening. And perhaps you can appreciate a little bit of hyperreflexins, more of the inner retinal layer. On fluorescein, I'm sorry that the view is a little bad because of his corneal edema, but you can see that there's very, we transited the left eye, we can see that there's very uh, delayed and patchy cortical filling, and that there's really no arterial filling, no filling of the disc. And then in the right eye, you just see the macular treason. So to summarize the case, we have a 60 year old with multiple myeloma who is presenting with acute vision loss in his left eye. He's endorsing headaches, scalp tenderness, and jaw claudication. Exam shows two millimeters of left-sided proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, left facial hypesthesia, corneal edema, uveitis with hypotony, and left optic neuropathy with pallid disc edema and retinal arterial alert occlusion. So at this time, I was going to ask the panel for their differential diagnosis, please. Zoe, what was his intraocular pressure in the two eyes? Was there a big difference? Yes, the right eye, the, so the normal eye was 12, the left eye was 5. So he's got an ischemic orbitopathy, ocular ischemic syndrome. Zoe? Should I keep going or should we go yeah. to the panel for possible differential? Okay, we'll keep going. So my differential at the time was he could have a left orbital apex syndrome, uh, given his two millimeters of left-sided proptosis, vision loss, ophthalmoplegia, left hypesthesia, left optic neuropathy in the setting of uh, known multiple myeloma. He could have an infiltrative infectious or inflammatory process, and especially for infectious thinking about fungal, given uh, the propensity for thrombotic occlusion. So in favor would be the pallid disc edema, retinal arterial occlusion, his uveitis with hypotony and corneal edema. This could be giant cell arteritis. He does report headaches, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, but it's a, it's a little bit more rare for um, anterior segment signs or diffuse ophthalmoplegia uh, to be reported. And then another thought was, could this be Saturday night retinopathy, given his history of alcohol abuse, constellation of symptoms suggesting possible external orbital compression with ophthalmic artery occlusion? So I ordered a stat MRI of the orbits with gadolinium. So we're gonna rule out the left orbital apex process, look for left optic nerve or optic nerve sheath enhancement to suggest inflammatory infectious or infiltrative process and see if we saw extraocular muscle enlargement to suggest Saturday night retinopathy. And he was started on prednisone one mg per kg daily for possible GCA pending the MRI. So of course it's none of these. Uh, so there was a surprise, at least to me, finding on the MRI. So just to go through what we had. So on the left side, we have a T1 axial with fat suppression and contrast. And you can see that there's no evidence of any orbital apex syndrome or sphenocavernous process. 
his optic nerve showed no optic nerve enhancement. Um, in the center, you see the coronal, also T1, uh, with fat suppression and contrast, which shows normal extraocular muscle size. And then on the right side, this is a T2 flare. You can see that there is T2 hyperintensity of the left optic nerve. Um, and then he's got incidental maxillary sinus opacification on the, excuse me, on the left side. On his DWI, you can see that the left optic nerve is bright and it, there's corresponding uh, dark ADC. And then here was the surprise, at least to me. So um, here on his axial T1 with contrast, there was asymmetric vessel enhancement of the visualized portion of the left cervical and intracranial ICA, uh, which our radiologists thought raised the possibility of vasculitis. Um, there was also nonspecific asymmetric signal within the void of the left ICA, which can be seen in slow transient flow. And of note, there was no cerebral infarct on his scan. And you can see, so the area, see if my cursor is going to come right here. And then you can also see this on the coronal. So uh, an MRI of the head and neck was ordered. In the meantime, his left temporal artery biopsy came back negative. So this is the MRA of the head and neck. And what you can see is that there's actually non-opacification of the left common carotid um, from its origin, as well as the left cervical ICA. There was noted to be a focal crescentic T1 hyperintensity at the origin of the left cervical ICA, uh, which the radiologist felt was suggestive of near occlusive or occlusive dissection. And then the significant circumferential neural enhancement was seen along the distal left common carotid. And what you can see too, is that if you look at the collaterals through the circle of Willis, so his left MCA is actually filled by really the ACOM to the A1 segment on the left, and also the PCOM from the posterior cerebral artery. Whoops, so we can go back here. So the patient deferred uh, cerebral angiography, and it was basically recommended that he continue the Pixaban um, and I will just note when he was in the emergency department, he actually just had a normal PTINR. So it isn't clear that that was definitely being taken compliantly. It was not a therapeutic INR and PT. So he missed three subsequent appointments with neuropathology due to ED visits for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So I ended up seeing him two months later. At that point, he remained no light perception with a stable efferent and afferent pupillary defect on the left. His eyelid edema, ptosis, proptosis, corneal edema, uveitis, and hypotony had resolved. Um, and there was significant improvement of his ophthalm ophthalmoplegia, but it had not resolved. Um, and he had uh, diffuse left disc pallor and sclerotic vessels, but there was no neovascularization. Six months later, he had a repeat CTA of the head and neck. And this really showed very similar findings to the MRA that I showed earlier. You can see in addition on the right side that there's some calcific atherosclerosis there. And I thought on the um, axial view here that you can see a little bit of filling in the left ophthalmic artery. So common carotid artery occlusion is very rare. There was a retrospective review of 5,000 cases from ultrasound and it was 0.4 4% of patients that were found to have common carotid artery occlusion. The mean age was 60, and there was a male predominance, with the most frequent risk factors being hypertension, ischemic heart disease, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and smoking. The most common etiology was atherosclerosis. And in terms of sur surgical revascularization, um, this is sometimes uh, performed when there's distal uh, patent vessels, but some of the indications are controversial. So in our case, it's possible that his multiple myeloma contributed to the common carotid occlusion. It's not clear that he was um, taking his oral anticoagulant um, on a regular basis. And as we know, multiple myeloma really can have um, two types of ocular manifestations. So uh, this multiple myeloma causes uncontrolled proliferation of the plasma cells, which are derived from the B cells and produce immunoglobulin. There's two heavy chains and two light chains. And you can have hyperviscosity syndrome from the increased immunoglobulin. And then you also can have um, the infiltrative or compressive sort of mass effect uh, manifestations that we sometimes see in the orbit. 
Orbital infarction syndrome, so when a patient has ischemia of all the intraorbital structures, uh, can obviously happen if there is both internal carotid artery and the collateral external carotid artery occlusion. And this has been reported secondary to systemic vasculitis, including giant cell arteritis, uh, orbital cellulitis, such as mucor, um, myelofibrosis, and then also with cases of loss of vascular perf perfusion like ours, uh, common carotid occlusion or post-surgical, especially with neurosurgery procedures uh, performed in prone positioning with venous outflow obstruction. And patients will typically present with orbital pain, ophthalmoplegia, and then of course the anterior posterior segment ischemia. I just wanted to briefly mention the mimicker that was considered in this case on the differential diagnosis. So in Saturday night retinopathy, um, it's a little bit of a different mechanism. So patients will have prolonged external orbit compression due to the uptended state, usually from alcohol or drug use. And this causes orbital vessel compression. And uh, this leads to ophthalmic artery occlusion and then the retinal ischemia and vision loss. But it also leads to extraocular muscle ischemia because the branches from the ophthalmic, the, lateral, the lacrimal artery and the superior and inferior uh, muscular arteries will supply the extraocular muscles. So you get the ophthalmoplegia and proptosis from that. And then obviously the anterior ciliary arteries also derive from uh, the ophthalmic. So you can get anterior segment ischemia with the corneal edema, uveitis, hypotony, and chemosis. And the chemosis really comes in because when the orbital compressions relieve, the ischemic vessels reperfuse, and you can actually get retinal edema um, as well as orbital edema and inflammatory response, um, proptosis, chemosis. But the vision won't recover because the duration of the ischemia is usually longer than the 90 minutes or so that have been reported to cause permanent uh, retinal ischemia. So I entitled this case positive DWI mostly for myself because the ultimate diagnosis was actually not uh, on my differential. So common carotid artery occlusion is very rare, but it should be considered in the differential of a clinical presentation that's consistent with internal carotid artery and external carotid artery ischemia. And orbital ischemia can be present in the absence of cerebral ischemia due to the, the rich collateral blood supply through the circle of Willis as we saw in our case. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zoe. Over to Dr. Jenil. Thank you, uh, Professor Williams. Uh, excellent case, really interesting at the end. Uh, I would like to ask, in spite of the negative temporal artery biopsy, and uh, we do know that the positive yield of temporal artery biopsy is quite less. It can be as less as 20% also. Would you still consider the diagnosis of an giant cell arteritis or kind of a medium to large vessel vasculitis looking at the MRA of the patient and very strong history of scalp tenderness, claudication, 60-year-old? That be still in your mind? And so I think that the MRA um, really does show that this is more occlusive. It is a shame he didn't have the angiography, but um, the jaw claudication, I mean, I think it truly was jaw claudication because the mechanism for that is going to be poor blood supply ischemia to the masseter muscles. And that's going to be affected by the fact that you have external carotid artery ischemia because your branches to the maxillary artery will come from, and then ultimately to the masseter will come from that external carotid artery occlusion. So that's why it's scalp tenderness as well. That's going to be, you know, ischemia through your superficial temporal artery. But um, I don't think that the ultimate me mechanism was giant cell arteritis. There are some very rare reports of giant cell where you have uh, the anterior segment ischemia. Um, I'm not aware of an as diffuse ophthalmoplegia being reported, but um, in the review of the orbital ischemic syndrome, there, there are case reports of uh, GCA doing that. I think it's quite rare. Um, so it's a difficult one. I agree with you. I mean, you could do a biopsy for the other side if you really suspected it, but I think that uh, there was a lower suspicion, especially based on the MRA findings. Zoe, I think this is a really important case because there are a number of articles recently that have suggested that if you see a positive DWI of the optic nerve in an optic nerve ischemia, it's vasculitis and specifically GCA in most cases. So the fact that yours lit up like a Christmas tree and was not 
vasculitis, I think is really important. And you really ought to report that case because this is, people are now talking about, oh, we do DWI of the optic nerve and if it lights up, then it's GCA and that's the end of it. That's interesting because that in the cases I've seen of patients who've come in after trauma with profound blood loss and they have like a PION type, type of presentation, I will see that really bright DWI as well of the nerve in those cases. So I think it's definitely not a definitive sign in, in for what I've seen, but. Yeah, I mean, in those cases, of course, you've got evidence of a, of a traumatic process, but here's a guy who is in the age range that, that could be GCA, has symptoms that could be GCA, and yet, uh, at least from my standpoint, clear and yours clearly doesn't. So I, I think that's a great case. Thank you. Uh, the other way I was thinking, uh, patient already has a history of multiple myeloma and he's alcoholic. And we presume he already has an episodes of pulmonary embolism as well as DVT. So uh, hyperviscosity syndrome is again a common thing to uh, I still feel vasculitis as one of the first differentials, but having two rare conditions in the patient rather than uh, thinking about a common condition, which could be associated with multiple myeloma, which is hyperviscosity, possibly precipitated by alcoholism. Uh, is this uh, can be the first differential in the thought process? Yes, I, I think it's, I mean, definitely this was a tricky case. I um, was not even thinking about, you know, his ultimate diagnosis when I saw him, but I think that all of these things could contribute and could actually end up with the same pathophysiology. If the multiple myeloma played a role with the hyperviscosity, then certainly that would predispose to uh, his carotid occlusion. But he did also have one of the big risk factors. He was a significant smoker. He had hyperlipidemia. He was not really great about his follow-up with uh, physician care. So we don't really know um, if he was actually compliant with apixaban, the laboratory result does suggest that he wasn't, or maybe um, that was confounded by the fact that he had a lot of difficulty with alcoholism and may not have actually been able to keep the medication down. But um, it's it's interesting. I you know I went back and forth a lot with what was my most likely diagnosis, and I thought, oh well, the MRI will answer it, and then it wasn't absolutely clear until uh, the MRA really. So. There's a question in the chat box that uh, does GCA always light up on DWI? An MRI for uh, GCA. So I'm not sure I can answer that. I think most of the time if we're making that clinical diagnosis, we don't get an MRI, but in patients who've had MRI for other reasons, um, I don't know what percentage it is. I'm not sure. Any other questions, Jenna? Can I just make one comment? I've had um, one patient with multiple myeloma presented with a temporal arteritis-like syndrome, and the temporal artery biopsy looked superficially normal, and then we requested amyloid stains, and they were frankly positive. Uh, so myeloma, of course, associated with amyloidosis, and it can uh, build up in arteries. And so um, that would be a suggestion to maybe go back to the pathologist to make sure that it has been excluded. We had a similar case, Bart. I, I agree with you completely. It's pretty rare, but it definitely occurs. That's a great point. Was it in that, that case, I assume that the biopsy did not really look completely normal? So this was read as completely normal, no inflammation. Yeah, there was no yeah, inflammation. Our, it just looks, it looked like a um, slightly thicker um, and on the H and E, it just looks there's like there's a little more pink. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're if you're if you're not specifically, you know, uh, staining it for, you know, with with the congruette and the, the apple green biofringence, you know, the <laughs> classic amyloid things, uh, it is very easily missed because there are no inflammatory cells. Yeah, exactly. There, there you get a widening of the thing and it sort of has this amorphous material that just looks a little funny, like everything's thickened. And unless you do, as you, you said, the Congo red or, or uh, the, you're not going to diagnose it. All right, I'll have to see if we can look at that. Uh, Dr. Satya, should we move on to the next speaker? Sure. Okay. So um, 
I'll share my screen again. And our last speaker of this session is uh, Dr. Edsel Ng. He chairs the, the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Alberta. And uh, he has about 155 works on orchids and has three fellowships to his credit, one from Mayo Clinic, the other in Masters of Public Health from Howard and Masters of International Affair and Diplomacy from the University of Catalonia. He's also a PhD in giant cell arthritis prediction models and is a Master of Education at John Hopkins and an MBA from Louisiana State University. So over to you, Dr. Edsel. Um, uh, sorry, I'm having troubles uh, with the share screen. I don't see the green button. Uh, hello, can you hear me? If you move your cursor, you uh, either to the bottom or to or to the top of the screen, it'll show up. Okay. Um, yeah, I still don't see the green screen. So I'm at the bottom of the screen. I'm sorry to hold up the meeting. I know it's running late. The support team, can you help him, please? If you're not in full screen show, you will be able to do it. Come out of full screen show and try that. I'm out of full screen show. Um, come out of full screen. Yeah, the, the other times I was seeing that little green button on the bottom, but I don't see anything green here. Edsel, would you like me to share your PowerPoint and if the slides are complete there? It's a green uh, button yeah, the, the these ones are a little bit better yeah. if there's any possibility um you see a, a three dots and a more it was under there for me the green square was gone also so it's the green button on the bottom on the zoom screen when you click on oh, the yeah zoom. yeah i'm used to the green button which i i thought i saw a little while ago um i, I guess we could just go with the uh, other slides which aren't as good but uh, just so we don't hold up the presentation i have to ask you to advance i think so shall I share? Uh, yes, please. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so uh, today I have a very, very simple case and I'm presenting it more because it's unsettling that I didn't know about um, uh, it, it was not something I commonly encountered after working about 30 years. I, I do a fair amount of ptosis, and I still remember some neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? So the case is of a 40-year-old hypertensive woman who had abrupt onset of a painless left ptosis during her first trimester. She was a very good historian. Uh, I, I saw the patient first in 2023. She had her pregnancy in 2020. I uh, reviewed her old photos. There's certainly no ptosis on her uh, photos prior to her pregnancy. There's no history of diurnal variation or diplopia or dyspnea. Uh, there was no anisocoria on exam or on the old photos. Um, she, uh, on uh, specifically asking her, she had no history of preeclampsia or hypertension to cause edema. Uh, she had an uneventful C-section. By the time she saw me, she had no change in the ptosis, which has not resolved over uh, three years. Uh, on review of her chart, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies were negative. Uh, the MRI was reported uh, of her head was reported as a negative, although it did not look at it. Uh, There's no dysthyroidism. Um, she had a history of wearing contact lenses in the past and did have uh, remote MVA, but did not have any ptosis after this, nor any neck trauma. Of note, she was on nifedipine and levetalol. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, her examination, uh, she had no anisometropia. Um, her motility and alignment uh, was normal. Uh, she was ortho uh, in all positions of gaze. Uh, she had two millimeters of ptosis uh, with a slightly elevated lid crease uh, of note. Um, her, um, there's no variability in the lid height. Um, she, her orbicularis uh, function was strong. There was no Kogan's lid twitch. Uh, I did a sleep test on her and it was unrevealing. Um, she also had no fornix mass, no enophthalmos and no decreased retropulsion. 
Um, so for the sake of time, uh, we'll just go through the differential diagnosis, which includes pseudotosis, say from uh, thyroid uh, lid retraction on the contralateral side. Um, I, I was just uh, hesitant to say, oh, this is just fluid retention, uh, and, and that's why you, your levator dehisced a bit. Okay. Uh, next slide. I talked to my colleagues in Toronto and asked if they had ever uh, seen an abrupt onset ptosis. Apparently her family told her that when she woke up one morning, they all noticed her ptosis. She didn't feel any different. Um, uh, with her nifedipine use, that may have exacerbated any edema she had at the time. There were no old photos uh, to show when ptosis happened. Um, uh, of the dipyridine, hydropyridine calcium channel blockage. Apparently, nifedipine causes the most peripheral edema. Next slide, please. Um, they talk a lot about estrogen hormones uh, causing fluid retention and also stressing the levator. Um, and I don't know if this is uh, just me pontificating, but the relaxin hormone, which uh, allows uh, the uh, reproductive system and skin to uh, stretch, uh, peaks at 12 to 14 weeks, which would be close to trimester, first trimester. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, she denied a sleeping prone position. Next slide, please. Um, my colleagues had have found some cases of uh, ptosis during pregnancy, but they were related to things like chalasia and lymphoma, uh, which this patient didn't have on Liddy version. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, differential diagnosis for ptosis in pregnancy includes hyperemesis gravidarum uh, when you develop a subperiosteal hematoma. I presume you could also get a carotid dissection uh, when you're vomiting uh, at a, a severe rate. Next slide, please. Uh, pituitary apoplexy is probably underreported. There's at least uh, 33 cases in the literature. Uh, about um, almost half the patients have uh, a known pituitary lesion, which can either be a macro or micro adenoma. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of worsening of myasthenia gravis, apparently one third of patients. Uh, may have an exacerbation of their disease during pregnancy. Um, from these uh, uh, literature reviews, uh, it suggests that uh, just because a woman does well with one pregnancy in their myasthenia doesn't mean they'll, they'll do well with their subsequent ones. Next slide. Um, something that I wasn't aware of, uh, which would actually make a lot of sense, is that with epidural anesthesia, you may get uh, quite a few Horner syndrome. Um, the epidural space is uh, more compressed uh, with the baby there. And when you're straining, uh, the uh, anesthetic may spread superiorly. So the Horners may uh, uh, be present for about four to six hours before it dissipates if it's related uh, to uh, the, uh, anest the epidural anesthetic. In terms of um, carotid dissections uh, during uh, pregnancy. Um, Abdel Noor et al. Uh, published a, a, a review in 2022 uh, of about uh, 28 patients with carotid dissection, 28 women who were pregnant, and 11 had identified Horner syndrome. And uh, they, they believe there is an association with hypertension and connective tissue disorders. Uh, once again, my patient did not have any nice sequoria. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in, uh, yeah, we could advance again. Uh, thank you. Um, so, so my biggest um, uh, reason for presenting this was many cases of ptosis will, will come from uh, the neurologist, and, and they've uh, gone to the point of having single fiber EMGs, uh, even though I don't notice any variability in the lid height, the patient has no double vision. Um, whenever a patient's pregnant and they develop a, an abrupt onset ptosis, I still get worried even though there's no anisocoria or dysmotility. So what would happen if you have to image 
uh, somebody during pregnancy. So um, uh, most of the guidelines uh, that I've read uh, have said it's no problem uh, getting an MRI in and of itself in, in um, a pregnant woman. The older literature uh, was uh, not suggesting in trimester one, but uh, the, the modern literature, including the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says that is in a problem. And, and if you wanna be conservative, maybe stick to a 1.5 uh, Tesla uh, study. Um, in terms of gadolinium contrast, though, they are quite reserved on it and, and would emphasize uh, that, that you have to have a really good reason uh, for ordering it uh, and the patient has to sign informed consent. Um, say if this patient, uh, I had met them uh, at the time they had their carotid dissection or, or at the time they had their ptosis and I was worried about a carotid dissection, what would I have done? Um, I guess I would have ordered an ultrasound knowing that about a third of patients, uh, the ultrasound may not pick it up. Uh, apparently there's a, a newer technology I wasn't aware of uh, called a QIS, Q-I-S-S MRA. Um, you can do an MRA of the head and, and you don't require gadolinium, but when you're trying to image the neck, apparently it's difficult with conventional uh, MRAs. However, this quis, uh, quiescent interval slice selective MRA would, would allow you to um, uh, uh, image a patient with suspected carotid dissection um, uh, without significantly different image quality uh, than having gadolinium. So according to this study um, from Peters et al. from 2019, um, their sensitivity and specificity uh, for carotid dissection was 85.7% and 90%. Uh, and um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in summary, um, uh, I, I, I am a little bit embarrassed that with such high powered uh, neuro ophthalmologists, I'm pre presenting a case of involutional ptosis. But it was just, um, it would have been unsettling for me uh, if, if the uh, ob gyn ward had phoned and say, what do you think's going on? Because it should be a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, perhaps in this patient, uh, I, I attributed uh, this involutional ptosis to uh, the relaxant hormone, fluid shifts, or use of nifedipine and contact lens wear. And I'm sorry I couldn't show you this last slide. Um, I, I went to chat GPT and asked it, uh, the differential diagnosis uh, for ptosis in pregnancy. And uh, uh, ChatGPT actually did pretty well. It said, you know, these patients should be referred to a neuro-ophthalmologist and take into account the unique considerations of pregnancy and the potential risks and benefits of any diagnostic test. The only mistake it made was, uh, uh, which I thought was sort of interesting, it says, uh, ptosis can be due to local causes such as mechanical pressure from increased blood volume, edema, and enlarged breasts that can impede the function of the levator. So that was the only main mistake that it made. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll try to answer any questions. Dr. Preeti, are you here? Yeah. Over to you, Dr. Preeti. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for that um, presentation, Dr. Ng. It's certainly an um, sort of an uncommon presentation of a relatively common um, condition. Um, like you said, I know you you ended up seeing this patient about three years after uh, her onset of symptoms, but I just wanted to ask you and also open to everybody else, if this was an acute uh, presentation, if you were seeing her say the day after she woke up with the doses, what would your first be? How many of us would image an isolated ptosis without pupillary involvement, without um, extraocular muscle involvement? Or would we go down the route of blood work with myasthenia sort of work up first or both? Uh, with this patient, if, if she had had uh, pain or some, some unexplained uh, 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 other symptom, I, I probably would have imaged uh, just because she's a... Uh, um, you know, pregnant and its new onset. Um, and given the new guidelines, they've relaxed them a bit for imaging for MRI 
uh, of the head. I remember about a decade ago, um, you talk to the radiologist, someone's pregnant, and, and they wouldn't be willing to do it. Uh, but there, there's at least three or four guidelines in Canada and the uh, obstetric guidelines that, that say there should be no problem. And if you're worried, stick to a 1.5 Tesla uh, MRI, certainly no gadolinium. Um, so I, I was glad I wasn't there when it happened. And I saw her three years later and it, it, you know, there's no variation in the lid height. Someone did order a set of colon receptor antibody. Um, I, I rely heavily on the clinical tests. Um, you know, if I don't see variability in lid height, the orbicularis is strong. Um, uh, I find Hogan's lid twitch not so helpful. I still do it. I really like doing the sleep test. Um, so, so if I don't see that, um, I probably would have still ordered the myasthenia, like cytokine receptor antibodies, knowing that it might be a bit waste of money though. Um, and just as an aside, the most accurate test I find for ocular uh, myasthenia gravis in terms of the ptosis, um, with the sustained up case, I can't get them always to fatigue, but usually I'll be looking at these patients on the slit lamp and it's not nystagmus, but it almost looks like the eyelid height is wafting in the breeze. And, and then I get really suspicious about myasthenia. Um, my error rate, probably about maybe once every two years, I'm still, I'm still doing a ptosis procedure and a patient in retrospect has myasthenia. Um, so uh, even after 30 years, I'm, I'm still making mistakes identifying things. But at the same time, if a patient has a good uh, Bell's phenomenon and good orbicular strength, I don't think there's a lot of harm in, in doing, um, uh, in Canada here, the amount they pay to do a ptosis repair is almost close to the amount that they charge for an acetylcholine receptor antibody test. And uh, sometimes you might help the lid height a bit in someone even if they have a bit of myasthenia. Um, so I don't think it's an egregious thing. I'd be interested to see what the other people think. Thank you. Um, there are some comments in the chat. Um, and the opinion seems to be that if there is isolated ptosis with no diplopia, uh, we could possibly observe, um, and especially if there is that high superior sulcus, Dr. Miller uh, states, and a complete exam which does not reveal any sign of honors uh, or a third nerve palsy. Um, another sort of uh, question I just wanted to pose was, I know some of us would consider the diagnosis of myasthenia. We know even in the absence of, of anything on the blood work, it could still be myasthenia. Um, and I'm sure if, if the pregnancy weren't a consideration, some of us would try a therapeutic trial, maybe mestinon or steroids, given the fact that she was pregnant when this happened. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't see enough patients uh, that are pregnant with myasthenia to know. Uh, so I'll have to ask the audience, please. Uh, I don't know the teratogenicity of mestinon. I have to look it up. I'm not sure if we have comments from anybody else on that. Yeah, I don't know if mestinon, you know, causes premature deliveries, but yeah, an important question steroids I should have known the answer to. Been, I'd look it up. Yeah, um, steroids have been tried during pregnancy. Um, um, and with combination with the OBGYN um, are thought to be fairly safe. Um, I don't have enough experience with Nestanon either. Uh, Dr. Schwalis does say that pyridostigmine is not a major teratogen. Are there any more questions? Preeti, are there any more questions? Uh, no, not from my end, not in the chat. I was just going through to make sure that I can see there now. Thank you, Dr. Edsel. Um, then we'll just uh, wind up this session and we'll go on to the next session. So I'll pass on the thing to Dr. Virender, who will introduce the speakers and the panelists. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Satya, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Hema. And thank you, Edsel and Preeti. Uh, so let's go on to the next session now, and uh, let me introduce the next moderator. And that is Dr. Virendra Sashdeva, who is a consultant and head of neuro-ophthalmology services at LVPI Network. And he is in Vishakha Patnam. 
He's a strabismologist, pediatric ophthalmologist, and neuro-ophthalmologist. He has 90 publications in peer-reviewed national and international journals and 16 book chapters, including textbook chapters in neuro-ophthalmology. He is a reviewer for AJO, BJO, Ophthalmology, BMC Ophthalmology, IJO, JCRS, and MEAJO. His areas of interest include optic neuritis, including atypical optic neuritis, MS, NMO, IIH, neuroimaging, myasthenia, and complex strabismus. Over to you, Virinda. Thanks, Dr. Satya. Uh, wonderful, yes. yeah, wonderful last five sessions. And uh, I think the last session would also be equally interesting. So uh, I take pleasure in introducing all the moderators and the guest faculty for this uh, session. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Okay, great. So our uh, with me, we have uh, five other moderators. And first is Dr. Veena Narona, who is a consultant radiologist and director of VRR Scan Center in Chennai. She also is a consultant radiologist at Shankar Netralia, Chennai. Uh, having completed her education long back in Mumbai, she took a lot of efforts doing pioneering work in neuroimaging. And she has been a uh, constantly involved in adapting, learning, and innovating techniques related to neuroimaging. She has done pioneering work in India, and she is co-author of the book Atlas of Imaging in uh, Neuroophthalmology. So, I welcome Dr. Veena. Next, uh, we have Dr. Varshini Shankar, who is a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuroophthalmology at Shroff Eye Center, New Delhi. And she also works at Viva Vision Center, Eye Center in uh, New Delhi. She completed her education in and uh, did fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus from Shankar Netralia. Her special focus is on disorders of convergence and accommodation, complex strabismus, and unexplained loss of vision. Welcome, Dr. Varshini. We also have with us Dr. Digvijay Singh, who is Director of Novel Eye Care in Gurugram, New Delhi, NCR area, as well as he's head of ophthalmology at Narayana Super Specialty Hospital in Delhi, NCR. He has a wide profile. He holds to his credit 20 awards, 75 publications, and 20 book chapters. He has participated in over 100 lectures in various national and international fora and delivered 30 lectures in webinars. He has great interest in technology in eye care and is uh, the co-founder of a technology company called Kalpaha Innovations. And he has developed a artificial intelligence tool for glaucoma diagnosis called RIAG. He is also a treasurer of Indian Neuroophthalmology Society and past president of UC India. Welcome, Dr. Digvijay. Next, we have Dr. Pradeep Sharma uh, to all of us, possibly, he doesn't need any introduction, but for completing uh, the formality of introducing him, uh, he is currently consultant pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Center for Sight, New Delhi. He was formerly head of the strabismus unit and professor of ophthalmology at RP Center, Ames, India. He has a huge number of index publications, more than 250. He's been thesis guide for so many pages. And he has authored many books, uh, especially Strabismus Simplified and Essentials of Ophthalmology. He, he was the first Asian to deliver the NAP lecture by the APOS in Vancouver 2016. And he also was awarded the Achievement Award by American Academy of Ophthalmology in 2017. He has been an invited faculty for various national and international conferences. And he, he has been conducting instruction courses for strabismus and neuroophthalmology. Welcome, sir. Next, uh, we have Vivek Varkard, who is currently consultant and head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuroophthalmology at LVPI Bhuvaneshwar campus. He completed his fellowship first at LVPI and then went on to do fellowship in complex strabismus at Boston Children's Hospi Hospital, Harvard Medical School. His special areas of focus include complex strabismus, pediatric neuroophthalmology, and pediatric cataract. He holds to his credit over 30 publications, and he is on editorial board of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. 
Uh, welcome, Vivek. Among the guest speakers, we have with us Dr. Neil Miller. He himself, again, doesn't need any introduction. He's an encyclopedia in himself. And uh, he's currently Frank B. Walsh, Professor of Neuroophthalmology and Professor of Ophthalmology. Uh, neurology and neurosurgery at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore. He has authored over 580 articles, 97 chapters, and 15 books. He he is the he has been the editor of Walsh and Hyde's Clinical Neuroophthalmology, which is like the Bible of neuroophthalmology. And for the current editions, he has been serving as the co-editor. He has also written the books for uh, the uh, the neuroophthalmology, the miniature versions, Walsh and Hoyt's clinical neuroophthalmology, the essentials, and the neuroophthalmology survival survival guide. He has been invited speaker for national, international meetings, and many of his previous fellows are currently faculty at various organizations in U.S. and abroad. Welcome, Dr. Miller. Next, we have Dr. Padmaja Sudhakar. She is currently associate professor. Of in neuroophthalmology and general neurology at University of Kentucky, USA. Having done illustrious training in India, both doing ophthalmology residency and fellowship in neuroophthalmology at Shankar Netralia. Sorry, she went on to do a neuroophthalmology fellowship at Kelogai Center and neurology residency at University of Kentucky. I think since then she has been working with University of Kentucky and she is uh, uh, actually are being involved in many residency programs in the University of Kentucky. She is a co-author for Shankar Netralia Atlas of Neuroophthalmology and Shankar Netralia's Atlas of Imaging in Ophthalmology. Welcome, Dr. Padmaja. Uh, next, we have Dr. Bart Shawlis. He is faculty in neurology and ophthalmology at Massa Eye and Ear Infirmary, Boston, USA. He again uh, has uh, done illustrious training first in the University of Illinois, Chicago, and then he went on to do residency in neurology at Harvard Medical School. He has done clinical fellowship in advanced general and autoimmune neurology at Massa General Hospital. He also did fellowship in neuroophthalmology, uh, again from Massa Eye and Ear Infirmary. His focus area is inflammatory, infectious, and autoimmune disorders affecting the eye, base of skull, and the nervous system. And he is the founding director of Inflammatory Neuroophthalmology and Skull-Based Disorders Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Shualis. Next, we have Dr. Valerie Parvin. She is consultant neurologist and neuroophthalmologist at Indiana University Medical School, Indianapolis, USA. She did her uh, uh, master's and residency in neurology at uh, Tulane Medical School in New Orleans. She did neuroophthalmology fellowship at LSUI Center. Her interest areas include inflammatory optic neuropathies such as optic perineuritis and neuroretinitis, ischemic optic neuropathies, pseudotumor cerebral syndrome, and iatrogenic neuroophthalmic complications. She has many peer-reviewed publications. She has served as editor for Journal of Neuroophthalm. She has served on the editorial board of Journal of Neuroophthalmology and has been on several NANOS committees. She also had a term on the NANOS board of directors. Welcome, Dr. Parvin. Next, we have uh, Dr. Wayne Conblath, and uh, he is professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences and neuro uh, ophthalmology at University of Michigan. He did uh, his uh, medical schooling from University of Missouri, then residency in neurology from University of Pennsylvania, and did fellowship in neuroophthalmology at Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins University, way back in 1989. Since then, for the last 34 years, he has been working as faculty at University of Michigan. His key interest areas are ocular myosinia gravis, giant cell arthritis, optic neuritis, and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Welcome, Dr. Conblath. And next, we have Dr. Prem Subramaniam, who is currently professor of ophthalmology, neurology, and neurosurgery. And he is also vice chair for academic affairs at University of Colorado School of Medicine, Colorado. Uh, formerly, he was a faculty at Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins. 
He serves on the board of directors of Nanos and he's currently the president elect of Nanos. He also serves on the Council of American Academy of Ophthalmology, Board of Trustees of AO. He has over 230 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and web-based educational materials. He, he has special interest in traumatic brain injury, and he is the founding member of medical staff of Marcus Institute of Brain Health that uh, looks after the traumatic brain injury. He has wide areas of interest in neuroophthalmology, uh, and uh, they include progressive thyroid ophthalmopathy, increased intracranial pressure, visual and balanced dysfunction after traumatic brain injury. Welcome, Dr. Prem. And uh, uh, with this, we open for the scientific session. I, I welcome Dr. Prem to take the first talk and Vivek will be moderated. I will stop share and uh, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm going to follow Dr. Ng in the idea of this is not complicated. This is more something that I would like to discuss in terms of the diagnostic and management process of a patient with a difficult problem. So this fortunately is not my surgical misadventure. This is someone else's, but I got to participate in this. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Here we see that I was presented with an 80-year-old man who had noted double vision since he underwent endoscopic sinus surgery seven months prior. He noticed that immediately postoperatively, his ENT surgeon didn't seem too concerned by it. Uh, he, however, noted that his right eye was deviating outward. He had constant diplopia. He had no ptosis. He had orbital pain that was present at that time. And he had some periocular swelling, as I'll show you in just a little bit. But before we go there, let's put him in a little bit of context. He's 80 years old. He survived a lot of things. And in fact, in 2016, he had ventricular fibrillation and had cardiac arrest times two was brought back from both of those with defibrillation. And over the subsequent years, he has been found to have a left ventricular ejection function anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. He had a cardiac defibrillator implanted in August of 2016 and has had no further episodes of cardiac arrest or defib but he does have severe congestive heart failure, chronic renal failure, chronic shortness of breath when he came to see me and could ambulate less than about 10 meters at that point. So a very healthy man, jokingly. So his past ocular history was otherwise pretty uncomplicated with cataract surgery having been done some years prior in both eyes. He has uncorrected distance visual acuity of 20-25 in both eyes and was quite happy with his vision prior to this event. And in fact, he was a retired truck driver, told me he's driven over 6 million miles in his lifetime. He is also a former U.S. Army Special Forces soldier, a Green Beret. And I think this explains how he survived all of these medical insults, because he's pretty much indestructible. He has no history of smoking, he does not drink alcohol, and he lives with his wife of 50 years. So in taking, again, a little look back as to what may have happened with this gentleman prior to his presentation to me, an MRI was done for other reasons in 2018, and it didn't show anything significant here on this single T1 non-contrast axial cut in terms of sinusitis. The ethmoid sinuses, the mucosa is perhaps a little bit thickened, but not particularly impressively. If we go then to a CT that was done sometime later, we can now see that he has this sinusitis in his left ethmoid sinus. And you can maybe appreciate that the medial wall on the left side doesn't appear to be particularly evident on this cut. But of course, you can't see it on the right side either. So it's unclear. You have to be careful. And indeed, when you look, though, at a coronal image, and again, this is 2019, a few years before he underwent his sinus surgery. I didn't flip this. This is the left side. He has maybe a little thinning even of his orbital floor and some thinning of the medial wall here. No comment was made about this, just that he had extensive 
extents of maxillary and ethmoid sinusitis at the time that this scan was done. So his sinusitis became progressively more bothersome. He went to see an ENT surgeon. This was summer of 2022, and he, on, he was evaluated. He had a repeat scan that I never got access to that I presume showed bilateral sinusitis because he underwent bilateral endosco functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Now, he shared the next photos with me, and I'm showing them with his permission. His uh, wife snapped these photos with his phone immediately post-op. And he said he didn't have any ptosis. He had swelling, but he was able to open that eye, actually, but it was more comfortable for him to keep it closed. It's not a high-resolution image, but you can appreciate that there is a fair amount of periorbital swelling. There is redness, and he has a little uh, drain packing put next to the eye there for uh, unclear reasons. And subsequently, a few days later, his wife took this photograph here, which shows that his eye is red, especially inferiorly, and he has a outward deviated eye, and he, you know, he's unable to add up that eye. So again, not a huge mystery, I think, here, but I think I'd like to run through just a little bit of the process of how this happens. I, I don't know if any of the panelists, if Dr. Vivek or anyone else has any comments to add at this point. Yes, so probably, you know, I would think, uh, you know, it's very interesting case as I could see that it's kind of something had uh, undergone itrogenic, you know, probably he had undergone sinus surgery and there might be, you know, the injury to the uh, inadvertent injury to the uh, medial rectus. That's what I could think about looking at, you know, the very large uh, uh, exotropia. Sure. And, you know, now that I think about it, the, the bandage on at his lateral canthus there, he did not tell me that someone had uh, maybe decided to do a canthotomy. But again, his ENT surgeon didn't see him afterwards. He's a little fuzzy about what happened afterwards. So perhaps they thought that there was an orbital hemorrhage as well that maybe produced this motility deficit and the periocular swelling. So, it's, I think, useful for us as ophthalmologists, those who maybe don't participate in ENT surgeries or do skull-based surgery as I do, uh, what sorts of tools our colleagues in ENT use when they uh, do these cases and what we might expect? Because this is not just an inadvertent injury to the orbital tissues, as you might expect, say, with an orbital fracture, or even if a, a sharp or curved instrument were to enter the orbit. In the mid-90s, these devices for powered endoscopic sinus surgery were introduced. And so on the left there, you see what it looks like in the surgeon's hand. It may be curved certain uh, ways in order to get better access to the sinus tissues. And on the right, you can see that there is an opening in this instrument, and there is a a rotating blade. So you can think of this as actually almost like a vitrectomy machine that is spinning and cutting anything that comes into its path. And so it's a really nice tool that the sinus surgeons use when they are trying to clear through debris. Again, if you have participated in these sinus procedures, they can be a little bloody, a little murky. And so by having this suction along with this powered cutter, it gives you an ability to go into the surgery with a little more visibility, ideally, uh, with your, it keeps your camera, you know, focused nicely to allow you what you're seeing, but these tools can cut very quickly. And just like a vitrector can suck in retina and do other things that we don't want it to do, these devices can act in a similar way. And uh, Tariq Bhatti and colleagues uh, back at University of Florida at that time were uh, reported one of the first two cases of powered endoscopic sinus surgery leading to postoperative diplopia. And as Dr. Vivek already suggested, if the sinus surgeon, or if there is pre- surgery injury. So remember I showed you his CT suggesting that 
the medial wall may not have been intact. And if the medial wall is not intact preoperatively, there may already be some fibrous scar, some adhesion to the various orbital tissues, making it a higher risk that if someone comes in from the medial side and inadvertently enters the orbit, that this whole tissue complex will just be sucked into this cutting device here. And this is a very gentle portrayal of what actually happens because this cuts really quickly, really rapidly, and can cause a significant amount of damage to the orbital tissues very quickly. And so this patient actually came to me already with a post-operative MRI. He had seen another ophthalmologist, actually an oculoplastic surgeon who had been one of my fellows in the past, and she had ordered uh, this MRI scan. And so this coronal MRI, again, without contrast, but contrast really isn't needed to visualize this, we can see all the extraocular muscles on the left side and on the right. We're having a difficult time seeing the medial rectus here uh, in this section a little farther back. It's still difficult to see the medial rectus, and you can appreciate the optic nerve deviated very far medially because the eye is rotated so far laterally because of his inability to adduct the eye. And again, the left eye is completely normal. And we see that there's not a lot, there's no sinus or orbital tissue herniating into the sinus at this point. This has healed pretty well at, um, at this stage. And so uh, that just points out that a little bit more. And as we go more posteriorly into the orbit, now we can pick up the medial rectus farther back, uh, pretty far back into the orbit. Now we're getting into the posterior third of the orbit. So as he came to see me again, this wasn't a diagnostic challenge. I knew this uh, MRI had been done. Uh, the referring doctor had called and spoken to me and said, can you do anything for this man? So move on. There we are. His initial exam showed good uncorrected visual acuity, about 20, 30 in each eye. He had a little dry eye like everyone in Colorado. He had no RAPD. He had no ptosis or lid retraction. He has bilateral lower lid laxity, but he's 80 years old. And he did have numbness in his right V2 distribution, indicating that there was probably some injury to the orbital floor in addition to the medial wall and again to the inferior as well as the medial orbit. And you can appreciate the motility diagram at the top here that he has excellent abduction, but otherwise a limitation of elevation as well as depression and no adduction at all. And he had an exotropia of 75 prism diopters, a small right hypertropia. It increased, uh, it was unmeasurable essentially in uh, left gaze and in right gaze, he still had a small, a much smaller angle exotropia, but he was diplopic in all positions of gaze and really couldn't do anything as far as uh, using that right eye. And he came in with his right eye covered. So at this point, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, well, what can I do to fix this problem? Now, ideally, you have some preservation of elevation and depression, and you might be able to use that superior and or inferior rectus, transpose them to provide some adducting force. But he's 80, he has this bad vascular disease, and he has a pretty significant orbital injury. I wanted to get an iris fluorescein angiogram to see what was happening. And in this iris fluorescein angiogram, because of course I'm concerned that he might develop ocular ischemia after this surgery. And in fact, the iris fluorescein angiogram confirms what I'd suspected, which is that there is a significant lack of early to mid-phase filling of the anterior segment from this medial side uh, goes along with vascular as well as muscular injury on this side. So at this point, patient says, well, can you do something for me? And of course, I'd like to be able to do something for him. So I went ahead. I, I've encountered one patient like this before, but it was actually a case I was asked to review as an expert witness that had occurred elsewhere. And so this was the first time one of these patients had walked into my office. So I decided to go to PubMed and look and see what my colleagues have done. And so if you look at medial, if you search medial rectus transection repair, you get six results, not uh, promising. One of them shows a silicone spacer potentially could be used in the medial rectus. This, this here was an iatrogenic orbital fracture, not uh, uh, a powered 
injury to the medial rectus, but still the medial rectus was cut in this process. And the uh, surgeon went in and found the residual medial rectus posteriorly, put a silicone spacer, attached it to the anterior portion. A primary repair, of course, could be considered if there's not a significant gap in the muscle. And this was a uh, one possibility, but again, this was done very soon after surgery. And you recall this patient presents to me seven months after this injury had occurred. So in this case, because of the iris ischemia, I was considering, could we do something just with the lateral rectus? Uh, split transposition of the lateral rectus has been described, used for third nerve palsy, and I've done it before for third nerve palsy, where it can be effective because it can tether the eye, rotate it medially, but the risk of this procedure itself is ocular ischemia because if you, uh, if you have a tight lateral rectus and you transpose it behind the eye and bring it up, you can compress the uh, circulation to the posterior globe with the lateral rectus muscles. You have to be very careful and contraindications certainly are having a tight or foreshortened lateral rectus, which I was very worried about, and scarring from prior surgery. So he has both of these potential risk factors that might contraindicate this. Nonetheless, he said, doc, do something for me. Again, he's a former Green Beret. He's the guy who likes to go and do things. And so, um, Dr. Vivek, any comments at this point or any of the other panelists about what you might have done? He wants me to do something. And so I'm scheduling for the OR and getting ready to take him there. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the way uh, you have chosen probably, you know, like uh, doing the lateral rectus split and transposition at this time point, probably I would also uh, have a similar thought process because you know, if you look at the, you know, the comorbidity that he had had and you have already done, you know, the angiography and then there are risk of, you know, the anti-segment ischemia. So having yeah. said that, you know, looking at a very large exudivation and, you know, the minus five adduction limitation and then delayed presentation, which would, you know, it's like kind of the medial rectus palsy. And we do have nowadays, uh, you know, the transfusion of split MR, LR to MR as a standard of care with a very good outcome. So I think... I, I would do uh, uh, the same procedure what you are planning for this patient. Did you consider the possibility of doing a superior oblique transposition? Some people have done that, again, for third nerve palsies. Yes, I, I considered that as well, Neil, and I was concerned that that wouldn't give me enough adduction in him, so I had kept that in my back pocket as a second procedure if I needed to do it, but absolutely, I, I did consider that. May I request Dr. Pradeep Sharma to comment? So I would agree with that, that uh, although the age is little on the higher side and the risk of ocular ischemia is there, so you have to be very, very careful. But that would be the procedure to do. The nasal transposition of split lateral rectus, taking care that you split the lateral rectus far, at least 25 millimeters uh, separation between the two ends. Yeah, as far as, you know, the complication, uh, uh, you know, I had uh, during my, you know, first couple of cases when I started doing LR, y split to MR, there is a risk of, you know, the transient choroidal effusion. So that also we need to keep in mind. Keep in mind. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. So I scheduled him for the OR and I got a page from the anesthesiologist saying, um, can I talk to you? I can keep this guy alive if you need me to, but I don't know if he'll wake up. And unfortunately, he had come in. He was gasping for air. He had significant lower extremity edema. He had had multiple family tragedies. His brother had just died. A sister was in the hospital. His granddaughter had been in a major motor vehicle collision and was on life support. So we postponed his surgery, but then I, I was able to, he, he's a motivated guy. He got out of the hospital. He took Lasix. He started walking uh, down the hallway in his house. And he came back two weeks later, much better medical shape. We did his surgery and we did, I did do a split transposition of his lateral rectus. Amazingly enough, it was not particularly tight. As Dr. Pradeep Sharma noted, I, I split it back a good 25 millimeters and brought it around and uh, he came to see me about a week later, and he, you know, he said, "I still see double, but now he looks like this." And he had a small right hypertrophy. He had a residual right hyper hypotropia of four prism diopters, 
And I said, well, let's just wait. I was cautiously optimistic, but you know, these things, sometimes they slip and they loosen and these things happen. But then he came to see me three months post-op just recently, and he still has no horizontal deviation in primary gaze. Of course, now he has a fixed globe. As you can see, he has very little adduction as well as abduction of that eye, but he is able to fuse with four prism diopters base up placed over his right eye. He has returned to driving and he is a much, much happier man. And so orbital injury in sinus surgery can be quite severe, especially with the use of powered instruments. And ideally, we want to recognize this immediately because you can go in and try to retrieve the injured lateral rectus, reconnect things, use a spacer if you need to, but otherwise do something early because late repair can be very challenging. It can be achieved as shown here. And with a little bit of luck and a good patient, you can help them out even if these cases come to you late. So don't give up. There, there are opportunities to help these people. And I want to thank you all for your attention to the panelists for their comments. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it was an amazing outcome. You know, so I think the crux of this particular case is, you know, choosing the right procedure probably you know at right presentation and then the tight uh, lateral rectus that you need to check on table and then decide so even on table you can split lateral rectus pretty behind in the orbit like up to 23 or 25 millimeter probably you would end up with you know getting good results dr sharma had a uh, lot of experience and i think uh, you know there was a lot of fear when this procedure came into the picture but now it's it's kind of you know the stabismologies they are doing on day to day basis and giving great results thank you dr prem for bringing uh, interesting case in this forum thank you all wonderful case uh, and wonderful outcome dr prem why was there a limitation of elevation and depression in the first evaluation you know, and he still had that, Verena, and I think that he had some scarring in the orbit from this extensive injury. I think his inferior rectus was intact, but that, that's what I attributed to, was scarring. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, Graham, I think I noticed that there was some flipping of an image. I don't know which one, the, the CT was flipped or the clinical picture or the MRI. It looks no, CT no, I, I, I've, the, the CT was not flipped. I, th that's just that that was done a few years before he actually underwent surgery. So I presume that he had bilateral sinusitis. But no, it was correct that in that 2019 CT that his sinusitis seemed to be on the left side, that the right side seemed to be okay. But I think it must have progressed. You know, his, his ENT surgeon has not been very interested in sharing any information with me. But there also seemed to be a little bit of bony erosion in the left maxillary sinus on the first I, Absolutely. I think he just got lucky that the left side was not injured as well. In the, uh, one more quick question, uh, Dr. Prem. Uh, in the early phases, in the acute phase, uh, provided the comorbidities don't preclude, would you recommend giving steroids for some time to wean off the effect of the injury? I think that's not unreasonable to try to reduce inflammation in the orbit. It's a lot of surgical trauma from that uh, device. And so sure, that's that's a reasonable thing to try. Thank you. Okay. And I see one more question. Can surface call MRI help in locating the muscle? Uh, would you try that? Uh, again, if it were earlier in the... In, uh, since the injury, I think that's a reasonable thing to try to see just how much muscle is missing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, wonderful case and a great outcome. And uh, wish you a safe journey. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we move on to the next case. Uh, I invite Dr. Padmaja and to take the next case. And uh, Dr. Varshini, you will be moderating the case. Uh, good morning. Are you able to see my slides? Yeah. All right. I think they are not still on the slideshow mode. Yeah, yeah. I just no. made it. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Padmaja Sudhakar from University of Kentucky. I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I also want to thank the co-authors of this presentation. I have nothing to disclose, and I'm also going to make an open statement here that 
I don't have too much experience in the case that I'm going to present. It was a first time learning for me as well. So this is a 22 year old woman who was referred to neuro ophthalmology for evaluation of abnormal eye movements. The referral came from a neurologist who thought she had obsoclonus, but obviously she did not. So she is adopted from Bulgaria. So we don't have much details about her birth. Her mother who accompanied her to the visit said she had these abnormal eye movements since she was a child and always had decreased visual equity, but there was not a concern about amblyopia. And she had these frequent syncopal episodes of fainting spells because of a condition called, which was subsequently diagnosed, it's called POTS, which is the postural orthostatic hypotension syndrome. This was confirmed on a tilt table test. So she had had extensive uh, cardiac evaluation with telemetry and echo and did not uh, show much abnormal findings there. Her social history was pretty clean and she was actually working in our hospital as an ER technician. So on the neuro-ophthalmology exam, the best correct visual acuity was about 20, 70 in each eye for distance and J7 for near with rigid gas permeable lenses, which she had been prescribed, the visual acuity was slightly better. It was about 20, 50 in each eye. There were no pupil abnormalities. Color vision was normal. She had poor stereopsis and a very small exophoria for distance. On slit pump exam, the anterior segment exam was normal. Fundus exam showed healthy looking optic disc and no significant findings on the retinal exam. Her genital external exam was interesting. She had a long face with down slanted palpebral fissure with a smoother philtrum, thin lips, scoliosis, single absent distal metacarpal noted in the left hand, multiple curved fingers and toes, what we call clinodectyly, and two palma greases bilaterally with elastic skin. And this is her video. I'm, hope, I'm ho hoping you guys can see it. So in primary gaze, you see these cyclical eye movements, which look like a seesaw nystagmus, but this is different in the end gaze. To me, it looked more like a horizontal pendulum. And then again, you can appreciate in the primary gaze that this is a like a seesaw nystagmus, one eye elevating and intorting, other eye depressing and extorting. It was very difficult to do an OCT, but we still attempted and there weren't uh, much significant findings noted on the retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. The macular OCT was also okay and not much changes on the visual field. So she has had some extensive testing. So she has had a multifocal ERG elsewhere, which was reported as normal. She completed a paraneoplastic antibody panel and an autoimmune workup, which was negative. Her chromosomal microarray determined her to be 46XX. And then she's had all these panels because of the elastic skin and her external exam, neuromuscular panel, skeletal dysplasia panel, hereditary disorders of connective tissue panel, all had just very inconclusive results. This is the MRI of her brain dedicated to the pituitary. And you can clearly see as we mark with the arrow, there is absence of the optic chiasm. And this is a sagittal view besides the absent Chiasm, it also shows a small growth in the infundibular recess, which is also slightly enhancing with contrast. And these are further MRI sections, the coronal, uh, axial, and sagittal view again demonstrating the same finding, absence of the chiasm and the small lesion in the infundibular recess. So she also has had some surgery. So they attempted a tenotomy procedure in the left eye. I'm not sure on which muscle. And that really did not change anything with the nystagmus. She did not have significant oscillopsia. So we did not recommend any medication. And I, as I already mentioned, with 
rigid gas permeable lenses, the visual acuity was slightly better. She would use it intermittently. It was a very negligible refractive error. And regarding that lesion, it was known to them from before and it was thought to be a very low grade neoplasm and it's being continuously monitored. We've had several other MRIs after the initial one. It's remained stable and did not need any surgical removal. And genetic testing has been inconclusive and she's already been through low vision therapy. So the interesting uh, things about this case are one is the seesaw nystagmus, which is a rare pendular nystagmus characterized by cyclical movements of the eye with intorsion and elevation of one eye and extorsion and depression of the other eye. It's postulated that this can develop in the setting of damage to the interstitious nucleus of Cajal, which is located in the mesodiencephalic region. And then fibers project to the oculomotor, trochlear, and vestibular nuclei, as well as to the spinal cord, can result in what we call visual vestibular instability and lead to the nystagmus. Now, there are several causes for seesaw nystagmus. When you say seesaw, immediately one would think about supracellar and paracellar tumors like your craniopharyngioma, pituitary adenoma, which could compress the mesodiencephalic region. It's been rarely described in brainstem lesions like a stroke, cerebellar lesions, whole brain radiation, head trauma, anal carry malformation, rarely in dystrophies like your cone rod dystrophy and your retinitis pigmentosa, rarely in septoptic dysplasia. And then after this case, I learned that it has been reported in canine and human achiasma and hemichiasma. So that is the second interesting thing about this case. What is a chiasma? It's congenital absence of the optic chiasm, totally precluding the decusition of retinal fibers from each eye and producing binocular vision loss. It's interesting that these cases do not have bitemporal hemianopia. They do not have midline defects. And it's usually an isolated finding in the absence of other developmental anomalies. It's a very rare condition with very few cases reported in the literature. And hemichiasma is uniocular failure of retinal fibril decusition despite the presence of the optic chiasm. And interestingly, it does not preclude the development of binocular vision. So our patient in, uh, demonstrated findings of achiasma with uh, decreased visual acuity, lack of stereopsis, and demonstrated the seesaw nystagmus, but the mechanism remains unknown. It could be the maladaptation of the vestibular ocular reflex, which I described, or a dysfunctional ocular counter-rolling response and the impaired adaptive vestibular control of eye movements, which is thus exhibited as a dissociated vertical deviation where one eye the elevates and intorts and the other eye, the depressed eye, extorts. I'm sorry. So overall, what I learned is there are no primary clinical features to identify this achiasma. So it's probably important to include this in the differential diagnosis of patients who come with these visual pathway disorders, demonstrating reduced vision and have these ocular motor abilities, probably you know, in some kind of infantile nystagmus. And so besides a complete ophthalmic exam, we could include electrophysiologic investigation, but the true value of that, I'm not really sure but definitely imaging is helpful. An MRI of brain, and then when you identify these features, probably a dedicated MRI with a dedicated pituitary protocol. And that's all I have, the references, and I'm happy to take questions. Roshini? Yeah, that's a wonderful case, Dr. Padmaja. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, one was, in which cases of infantile nystagmus, 
uh, would there be any clinical features which would suggest um, that the chiasm is not very well developed? Um, we should we consider imaging all cases of infantile nystagmus? Because right now the protocol is that if it's a typical horizontal nystagmus, child develops an abnormal head posture, usually we tend to watch them without imaging. Yeah, that's very interesting because again, in this case, I was at an advantage because she was a little bit older and uh, they kind of talked to me uh, and, the, and the neurologist had gone forward and done the MRI. Uh, and so, you know, she came to me with this uh, MRI and then we did the dedicated MRI. So it's, I think, very hard, but I think, you know, considering if they have, so the other thing is in this case, she also had some, you know, external uh, features which looked abnormal. So there was the, the seesaw nystagmus probably tipped us into getting the imaging because it you don't see infantile nystagmus, which is in a seesaw pattern that often. So it's a hard question, but I'm thinking one time imaging in these patients is probably not unreasonable. Uh, and Jen then with the achaism, it's the reduced vision, which you know many people would think it's the nystagmus, which is causing the reduced vision. But there was something very different about the scales, which made us you know, go forward. Uh, see, I think any asymmetric or a vertical nystagmus should uh, make you do an imaging in an in infantile nystagmus. So in this case, because of the seesaw nystagmus, it was well indicated to do the imaging. Yes, I so fully agree with you. Uh, but uh, do you have any experience of seeing any such case? Uh, and are there any other ocular clues that we would consider for thinking like achaismia might be there? So that's what is right. The visual fields were normal in this patient. Yeah. And that's what has been reported that, you know, if you have achaisma, you don't have to have a bitemporal hemianopia or any other pattern, which is what is another confusing thing about, uh, you know, it's just the lack of decusition, but doesn't really lead to this visual field loss. Yes. Like, yeah, I, had, I, I think other than the asymmetric, uh, or disconjugate nystagmus, there's no other pointers to why one would be aggressive about neuroimaging. The VER will uh, have to be done separately. I mean, if you do uh, with the separate leads on the two occipital cortex, then you can pick up this achiasmatic uh, problem on the VER. So I read in some of the literature that there's a separate um, optic pathway misrouting protocol for checking the VER. Correct. So does anybody have any experience with that, uh, especially in albinism as well, Correct. which which we see more commonly where you have misrooting of um, the visual pathway? So when you are testing with two separate occipital uh, electrodes and then checking for each eye separately, you can see that there is a total crossover rather than the hemi retinal thing. That, then you can differentiate between the two conditions. Multi-channel VEP will be needed for that. So uh, my I case that... had only a multifocal ERG. They, nobody did a VER or a VEP. Yeah. An interesting case, Dr. Padmaja. Any other panelists have similar experience? Dr. Miller, Dr. Valery, anything um, to add? Yeah, I wanted to comment that uh, uh, pituitary um, imaging abnormality is interesting. So what this could represent is an ectopic posterior pituitary, which is a um, a second um, neuronal mis misrouting uh, disorder. And so when you have this combination, you know, um, of two uh, neuronal misrouting disorders, I think the patient needs some genetic workup, just like if you, you do for a septo-optic dysplasia like patient. Um, so I've had a patient like this that had a FOX A2 gene mutation. So I think I, I would send this patient to a geneticist. Yeah, she's had she's had extensive genetic workup, and again, all inconclusive uh, findings. Okay. Dr. Miller, any comments? Any experience with this achiasma? I haven't seen achiasma. I have seen a number of patients, as was noted, with aniridia. Uh, uh, albinism who had 
no crossing. And as, as uh, Dr. Sharma said, you can definitely pick that up with either a multivocal VEP or, or some similar process. Thank you. Okay. So I think great case. And uh, I think as uh, pointed out, uh, we all discussed that in patients with CSO, nystagmus, spasmus nutans, not, a risk, not going down, and uh, patients with disconjugate nystagmus imaging would be indicated. And these might be, though we might be thinking initially that these patients, less vision is due to nystagmus, but imaging could help help pick up the underlying cause. If we have any further comments, uh, welcome to take. Otherwise, you know, it would be interesting to do, I, and I think it was mentioned, a multifocal ERG because yeah. you could probably, or, or a pattern ERG, because a pattern ERG would show a difference, presumably, in the nasal versus temporal ganglion cells. Okay. Did the OCT <laughs> show any, any ganglion cell loss or difference in thickness? Very hard. It was very hard to do uh, like a ganglion, like a, a what we would think of a full thickness raster because it's just, you know, hard to even capture the images. So barely could get the retinal nerve fiber layer. And no, we haven't been successful, made several attempts to get the ganglion cell layer. But clinically, the disc looks okay, which is again confusing because you would think that there would be some kind of optic nerve pallor or something in achaism, but nothing. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. So it's something like dextrocardia where the heart is on the other side, but everything works normally. Right? Sir? Maybe. Fibers are there. They're just not crossing. So why should there be any problem? Yes. <laughs> crossover. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Padmaja. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next case. And uh, if something comes up in the chat, maybe you can answer. Uh, next presentation is about, by Dr. Bart Shawless and uh, Dr. Digvijay will be uh, leading the discussion. Over to All right. you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this and congratulations to the committee for organizing such a wonderful conference. It's really become uh, a highlight of the academic year. Uh, it's 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 a it's a beautiful thing. Um, can you see my? Yes, uh, it's there. Uh, yeah. Okay. And this was supposed to be the um, Ethern session, but uh, just as I was being invited to join, uh, I came across this case recently and I thought it was uh, instructive and I asked Dr. Satya's permission to use more of an Ethern case here, uh, entitled Robbed of Her Vision. Um, so this is the case of a 19 year old woman who reports, I have episodes of losing vision in both eyes at the same time. And so here's the uh, timeline of the history. Um, so in March 2022, she initially presented with several weeks of dyspnea of exertion and cough, and she presented to another hospital first, where she was found to be hypoxic with a reduced cardiac ejection fraction and imaging that suggested an aortic root abscess. And then she was transferred here, um, where imaging showed that she had, she had aortitis, um, and she uh, was diagnosed with Takayasu arteritis based on the imaging. She actually also has had an um, aortic valve surgery, so that was examined under a microscope. And she was treated with a um, steroid pulse. And then by April, uh, she was seen followed by cardiology. The ejection fraction had normalized. Prednisone was being tapered off. She was started on methotrexate. Um, imaging, uh, additional imaging was performed, which showed uh, right renal stenosis and actually kidney atrophy secondary to the renal stenosis and right greater than left bilateral, uh, common, actually common and internal carotid artery stenosis. And then in some of 2022, I'm getting some, somebody with echoey. In summer 2022, uh, she started developing um, this episodic vision loss. This is complete bilateral vision loss lasting about 10 seconds, occurring about twice a week. With this, she would also feel warm, slightly dizzy. She would stop what she was doing, maybe hold on to something because she was worried she might fall. Um, at that point, prednisone and methotrexate were increased and she was started on adalimumab, also known as Humira. 
Um, then by February, these vision loss episodes had stopped. Um, carotid imaging showed that there was an improvement in the left side. The right side was still severe. The aortic wall was improved. Um, so there was imaging improvement. The, the vision loss episodes had stopped. Prednisone was tapered off. And then after the prednisone was tapered off, the vision loss episode recurred. And actually, they were longer, more severe, lasting up to 30 seconds. And imaging showed increased bilateral carotid stenosis. Uh, so the immunosuppression was uh, strengthened. Um, her prior history was a nun other than the Takayasu. She was previously healthy and she had no other surgeries. Uh, she was treated with uh, the immunosuppressive medicine that I mentioned, as well as some cardiac medicines such as um, aspirin and metoprolol and statin because of a prednisone exposure. And there was no relevant um, family history. She was a preschool teacher and was studying early childhood education. She had no substance use history. Um, her ophthalmic examination was uh, entirely um, reassuring and unrevealing. She's 2020 in both eyes with normal color vision, visual fields, pupillary function, extraocular movements, uh, eye pressures, and an anterior and posterior segment were normal. Um, so, now she, the question here is, what is the mechanism here in this patient of bilateral simultaneous vision loss? We think it's somehow related to the Takayasus because it seems to follow the uh, worsening of disease activity and she otherwise has no other you know, suspicious medical history. Um, but how is she getting these bilateral simultaneous vision loss episodes? Um, and I welcome any thoughts, but you know that what we were considering at the time would be, A, was this from, the carotid stenosis, B, did she also have vertebral basilar stenosis? C, uh, it was suggested that maybe, you know, the Takayasus is inflaming the whole carotid sheath and irritating the vagal nerve and she has hypotensive episodes, or D, uh, is there something else that's going on? And, and there were also, you know, uh, other symptoms, you know, neurological beyond just the vision loss, as you had mentioned. So, uh, obviously, it was affecting more than just the, you know, the vision. Yes, although they're very slight. She just got very slightly dizzy and felt warm. Um, but it, it was primarily the, the, the one that stood out was the bilateral simultaneous vision loss. And how was the, the blood pressure in the arms? Or how was the other, uh, you know, uh, systemic examination apart from the ocular? Yeah, so the systemic um, examination generally was normal. She was... Uh, you know, um, uh, reported to have a normal blood pressure um, when she presented to us. But that's a very good question. So it could be actually any of these thoughts that you've already put up here. Yeah, so I think we do need to, you know, th this is a symptom of, uh, you know, vertebral basilar insufficiency uh, because both uh, uh, eyes are affected uh, simultaneously. Um, so that's one possibility. So we need to exclude that there's vertebral basal stenosis. She is known to have carotid stenosis, but it is highly asymmetric. And I'll show you some images. Um, and so that would, you know, it would stand to reason that she probably would have some asymmetry um, in uh, the vision loss between one eye and the other one, if it was solely the carotid that's, the carotid that's were to blame. Um, so I'll show you the imaging and you know let's work through this. So uh, this is the MRA of a neck and I'll let you look at this, but I will actually break it up into little segments as we go, um, you know, the right side, left side and so on. But this is sort of the overview image, which of course, you know, there's a lot going on here. Uh, so let's go through this. So this is the right side, the right carotid and the um, vertebral artery. And so uh, there is the, the right common carotid uh, severe stenosis. You can see there's a little bit of uh, flow still through that. Uh, the vertebral basilar system here on the right side looks uh, completely normal. Really, there is no um, vertebral or basilar stenosis. Um, I hope you'll agree. So let's look at the left side. Uh, there is some um, common and um, internal carotid artery stenosis, but it is uh, much less severe than on the right side. And again, the vertebral basilar system is intact. Um, so it's not vertebral basilar stenosis that is causing the problem. And uh, like I mentioned, the carotid disease is present, but asymmetric. So maybe that's not the reason for these bilateral episodes of vision loss. So maybe there is something else that's going on. 
So we obtained an additional study at that point. And that was the um, they called it ultrasound. And so these are some of the transcranial Doppler studies. And so, um, you know, uh, looking first at the carotids, you see on the left side is the right, on the right side is the left the carotid artery. Um, and the big difference between one and the other is in the velocity. So uh, the waveforms, uh, you can't just look at the waves, so you have to look at the scale really is different that, you know, the velocity in the right carotid, a common carotid is about three times as what it is on the left side. Um, so that corresponds with the uh, stenosis that we saw on the MRA. Um, on the vertebrals, uh, you see much more normal velocities, but you'll, you saw this sort of funny looking um, waveform where uh, you get one wave and you get a dichrotic notch and a sort of a second waveform in the left vertebral artery. Um, I don't know how well this comes across here, this is, but I had a discussion with the, um, ultras the, the ultrasound uh, radiologist about uh, that being present yeah. on the images. Um, so, what this would be, this is from a, as a teaching image, um, what the sonographers are looking for here to really, this is much more prominent, better seen sort of um, dichrotic notch. Um, so that's a, what people also have affectionately called the crouching bunny sign. So you get two systolic P's and the flow velocity at the nadir of notch is less than the flow velocity and at the end of diastole. And what this indicates is uh, that there's some presence of retrograde flow. So where is that coming from? So that's, that, that is only present in the left vertebral artery, not in the right vertebral artery. Well, the answer is um, you have to consider the subclavian arteries as well. Um, the subclavian arteries are affected by her uh, Takayasu arteritis. Um, and especially the one on the left shows an extremely elevated um, you know, proximal systolic velocity in a, a left subclavian artery. So when you look at the images, um, this was probably, you know, uh, hidden in the overall sort of MRA, but um, there was a significant uh, subclavian stenosis on the left side. Um, so the answer to why is she getting these episodes here, the final diagnosis is this is a case of subclavian steel syndrome. Um, so in this case here, uh, what, what is happening is that obviously normally we have anterograde flow in all these arteries and the vertebrals are coming off the subclavians here. In the case of typically left-sided uh, proximal subclavian stenosis, if it's very severe, um, that you can get a flow that is um, retrograde in the um, ipsilateral vertebral artery and is diverted to the arm. Um, especially if somebody's engaging in any um, you know, upper extremity exercise. And um, then uh, that can actually take enough blood, steal enough blood from the vertebral basilar um, circulation that people can have symptoms of vertebral basilar insufficiency. Um, so when she was treated with um, increase in prednisone and she was switched, switched from um, adalimumab, which was a TNF inhibitor, to tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, that has um, a lot of use in um, also in giant cell arteritis, other kinds of um, you know, arteritis. Takayasu pathologically looks similar to giant cell arteritis, as you know. And with that, she has actually had a resolution of her um, vision loss episodes. So the summary here of this uh, quick little case here is um, it's subclavian steel syndrome. You know, you've learned about it, you know, uh, but it's easy to forget about it. It may manifest with symptoms of vertebral basal ischemia in the absence of actual vertebral basal stenosis, uh, especially it could be left upper exercise, uh, left upper extremity exercise induced. And uh, the, the comment that was made earlier is very apt. Uh, you do want to check if there's any difference in um, the blood pressure between the right and the left arm, which was not reported and um, not performed in our clinic, <laughs> I have to say. Um, but the causes can include atherosclerosis and arteritis, and the diagnosis requires a high index of suspicion. So uh, when you're obtaining the neck imaging, you have to make sure it goes down low enough to, to cover the aortic arch, whether you're doing a CTA or an MRA, um, and a Doppler ultrasound is the study to really conclusively uh, prove this phenomenon. Thank you. This is uh, indeed a, a very good 
case. And I think, as you suggested, it's sometimes uh, possible for us to forget this syndrome because we're not seeing it on a you know on a day to day basis. But also a reminder for us to do a systemic examination. You know, this was something that we always did as residents, where we would we were asked to look at the blood pressure in both the arms and you know the pulse in both the arms. So was was that uh, I mean uh, how was the the pulse and all was that looked at later on when you realized this uh, uh, this thing and uh, came up with the diagnosis? Yeah, so um, I have seen the patient through telemedicine, <laughs> uh-huh. and I'm relying on the the residents, you know, ophthalmic exam, which is normal and everything. So it wasn't it wasn't done prior to me to seeing her. I'm about to see her next week in clinic, and um, and I will find out what it actually is. Wonderful case, but uh, I, I was wondering, so how was the upgrading of the immunosuppression to docilizumab going to help this patient? And uh, how, how is the arteritis related to the supplement steering? Maybe I missed uh, you explaining that. Yeah, I mean, so she has Takayasu arteritis, um, and it's uh, so she has extensive uh, large vessel involvement. Um, that is uh, pretty much uh, it involving the aortic arch as well as um, all the proximal branches coming off that. And then it has, you know, there's further um, uh, involvement of the aorta, including the renal arteries. Uh, she had mi- minor involvement um, of the mesenteric arteries, but she has an extensive arteritis. And it, it just so happens that the um, subclavian artery and the right um, uh, common carotid artery of the two arteries that are most severely affected um, that is, I think, just, uh, you know, the, the random distribution of this, this arteritis in her case, um, but it's causing the phenomenology, I believe. Um, the um, IL-6 has a, uh, has a number of different actions in um, the innate immune system, as well as the adaptive immune system on a B cell and a T cell. So, probably, so in, you know, um, it, it is involved in multiple steps in the immune system. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, famous now, but it's become the first real um, disease-modifying therapy in giant cell arteritis, other than, than steroids, and allows us to decrease, um, you know, the steroid burden in our giant cell patients. And um, there's a lot of, you know, there's, you can, some people think of takayasus as giant cell of young people. You know, it's, it basically has a very, very similar uh, pathology um, and, uh, and manifestations as as the large vessel variant of giant cell, you know, arteritis, which is not the temple arteritis variant that, that we tend to see in neuroophthalmology, but uh, you know, there's another variant of giant cell that tends to involve larger blood vessels that the rheumatologists see, and that's very very similar to uh, Takayasu, except the age group is completely different. Thank you. So. Uh... Are there any other questions? I think you already answered uh, Dr. Krishna's question. Why was IL-6 inhibitor selected while already being on a DNF inhibitor? As you explained, uh, that this has better mechanism. And how long do you plan to keep the patient on tocilizumab? Uh, um, this is in discussion with the rheumatology colleagues. Um, you know, I do I do treat some of my patients myself, but this one is managed by rheumatology. And um, what I would normally do uh, what I would do in a giant cell patient uh, would be to um, wean off the steroids and then continue to up for usually for another two years or so. And then, uh, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't have a lot of great information because that wasn't addressed in the trials about what to do with tocilizumab in giant cell arteritis. Um, when, you know, once the, the, the disease is quiet and presumably they haven't relapsed, when can you, um, can you wean it? That is a question that is uh, currently being investigated. There's, there's some, I've seen some abstracts on this. Um, hopefully we'll have better guidance in the future. And takayasus is even less common than giant cells. So uh, we're, we're going to have, uh, you know, have to extrapolate until we get good trials in that disease too. Thank you. There's one more question from Dr. Ing. Uh, can we monitor serum IL-6? Uh, yes, you can. In our institution, it is a send out test that takes a couple of weeks to come back. It is also a, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those um, cytokines that fluctuate quite a bit. So it can be disturbed by just somebody having a cold or something like that, I guess. So I don't know what the utility is of doing that. You, you're not going to get real time information most of the time. 
Um, so I don't, I don't actually, I don't monitor for it. Uh, the other thing that comes up in monitoring vasculitis patients on IL-6 inhibitors, and it's a good teaching point, is uh, the inflammatory markers are unreliable because they suppress the, the pathway. So your ESR, CRP is not something you can rely on to monitor a giant cell or vasculitis patient on a IL-6 inhibitor. Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful discussion. Um, any other questions from any other panelist? Anybody has a comment to make? Okay, if not, uh, thanks, Matt, again. A uh, wonderful case. I think you highlighted us the role of doing a de detailed examination and keeping in mind the rare possibilities. Thank you. Yes, we're doctors first. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And with this, we move on to the next case. And I invite Dr. Conblath to share his screen and uh, present the next case. Over to you, Dr. Conblath. Hello. Um, I want to get to. Yeah, your screen is there. Yes. There we go. And so I'm going to start with a twisty case. Uh, this also is an afferent case. Uh, and so we saw a 38-year-old woman who had bilateral visual loss, left eye, and then a month later, right eye. And she had a past history of diabetes and hypertension. Her vision was 2050, 2300. There was no APD. Colors were nine in the right eye, one in the left eye. Motility was full. And here's her fundus uh, with uh, optos. Um, and you can see there, we'll zoom in in a second, but you can see there's a fair amount of uh, background diabetic retinopathy and hemorrhage. And her nerves, again, this isn't the best picture, but there is swelling of the nerves, uh, left a little more than right. And we did her visual fields and she has uh, generalized depression or nerve fiber bundle defect perhaps uh, inferior altitudinal on the right. Um, and so now the, the question is, what's the differential for optic neuropathy? And what I like to do is round up the eyes. And so ICP, inflammatory immunologic, ischemic, infiltrative, impression or compression, infectious, inherited labors, for instance, injury, inadequate nutrition, that's vitamin deficiency, but that lets me keep it as an eye, environmental, which is a toxic uh, optic neuropathy, and inclusion, which is drusen. And so as we think about these optic, this list, and as we think about her, there's some things we know she doesn't have um, because of the timing, because of the disc swelling, et cetera. So we can kind of cross out uh, in the pattern of revision loss, cross out some things like this, 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 and probably in this. And so we're really left with four possibilities in this woman. And so inflammatory, ischemic, infiltrative, or an infectious optic neuropathy. And don't forget, she's in clinic with us, and so we've got to decide what are we going to do next. And there's lots, obviously, things. Do we send her for an urgent MRI? Do we admit her for a big workup? Do we do a lumbar puncture? Do we do blood work? Um, and we chose something that we could do in the clinic, and what we did is we did an OCT. And when we do OCT, now, you could argue you already knew here's her uh, swollen optic nerves. You could argue you already knew that her optic nerves were swollen just by examination. But the value of this, one of the values of the OCT here is it'll let us follow her and say, which direction are you going? And we have an interesting protocol. Whenever we do OCT of the optic nerve, we do retinal nerve fiber layer, we do ganglion cell layer analysis, and we also do a macular cube. So a lot of patients we see have unexplained vision loss, 
and a lot of unexplained vision loss is retinal in origin. In addition, a lot of patients with optic nerve vision loss, looking at the retina can provide you a lot of interesting information. And so let's look at her retina. And here is her OCT. And when, whenever I take this OCT and I talk to my retina colleagues, they look at this and they say, we know what she has. So there's some changes here. If you can, uh, here, here, a little more um, in the uh, left eye than the right eye. Uh, and the left eye has more vision loss and has, was involved sooner. And so what are these retinal findings in the setting of optic nerve findings? So it's, you might say it's almost a neuroretinitis type picture. And so what did this make us go to next? This was syphilis. And these are the classic retinal findings of syphilis. There's the spirochete, and that's why I called this a twisty case uh, with the twisty spirochete. And there's a lovely, from last year, survey of ophthalmology review article on ocular syphilis. And here's the retinal findings from that article. And you can see it matches exactly our patient. And then um, blood work confirmed syphilis, so did lumbar puncture. She was treated and had excellent recovery. And so what are my thoughts in this case? Well, my take home points kind of run the list. So if you see somebody and you say, well, I'm not exactly, they have an optic neuropathy. I'm not exactly sure which. You've got a list of causes of optic neuropathy. Some of those have disc swelling, some do not. Some are frequently unilateral. Some are always bilateral. Uh, timing, what was the course of the vision loss? And this woman where it was one eye and then a month later, the second eye, that uh, would take out a toxic or a nutritional thing where both eyes would be involved simultaneously. Uh, that could be labors, but obviously her discs were not labors discs. Um, and the age, you know, are they in the ischemic or inflammatory age? And then the visual function and pattern of vision loss. So I took out uh, elevated intracranial pressure in this woman because um, that pattern of vision loss presenting with severe acuity just doesn't fit well uh, with uh, elevated intracranial pressure. So I'm gonna take my list take all the exam and history findings and narrow things down and then decide what, you know, do I have a single diagnosis or am I left with a few diagnoses where I can then uh, do focus testing? And then my other comment, as I'd mentioned earlier, is OCT of the nerve and macula add significant information um, in these type of cases. And as I said, we've made that our, our OCT protocol. Uh, just we do both with everybody. Any questions or comments from our uh, uh, faculty? A wonderful case, uh, Dr. Conblet. Uh, I think a uh, very interesting uh, case and the uh, interesting workup pattern that you opened. And you very well highlighted as the role of doing the entire examination and correlating the things. So uh, there are multiple questions here. And uh, before just we go there, I think uh, we, we did discuss a little bit of these questions before. Uh, similar things. Uh, we also obtain a very similar protocol here. We add macular OCT. And uh, though we are having much less experience in patients with syphilis in in the experience that I have, but uh, we we have seen patients with inflammatory causes causing inflammatory, uh, so like infective neuroretinitis cases, they presenting with disc edema with a very similar picture, but majority were unilateral. And we did see that there was presence of vitreous cells just ahead of the disc extending into the peripapillary retina. There might be a focus of retinitis just next to it. And sometimes epipapillary infiltrates might be there, which is like small cells and membrane-like things combined. That was our experience. But uh, I went through the article that you have highlighted here, and it says that these outer reflective 
these uh, hyper reflective changes in the outer retinal layers and in the even in the middle uh, retinal layers can be highly pathognomic for syphilis even autofluorescence might show similar changes so maybe uh, these are important clues that help in the diagnosis uh, my question and i think already other people also have asked uh, like dr ing has asked is it pathognomic for tryponema or do processes like other inflammatory causes tb sarcoidosis can mimic similar ocd patterns what's your experience and yeah i so i have seen um uh bartonella neuroretinitis have a somewhat similar presentation uh and and having the similar retinal findings um they're usually not quite as outer retina um and so you know what i do is a very simple thing is i just say do you have a cat and you know it's very easy to test for syphilis bartonella lyme even you know it's it's uh to me once you say i'm in the neuroretinitis uh file drawer now um i've narrowed things down and i can check for for a few things but i when i see this pattern i think of syphilis first but i would check the other things and the um there was a two questions i think about uh can you rule out ischemic optic neuropathy well ischemic optic neuropathy won't have these retinal findings um so certainly when we at first glance could this have been a you know diabetic with a diabetic papillopathy variation or ischemic, but then there shouldn't have been the retinal changes. Uh, and same with a uh, question about labors, one eye then the other eye certainly is a labors pattern, but I felt that there was too much disc swelling for labors. It wasn't that hyperemic disc surface. It, it, um, and again, labors would not have the uh, retinal findings. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Conblet. I think uh, everybody agrees in the panel, uh, all the faculty are responding that uh, the pattern is increasing. We have to be aware of the disease and yes. these findings would be quite helpful to all of us. So it's very illuminative case to all of us. Uh, uh, one more thing which comes to my mind is that like we did not see any frank retinal lesion kind of thing. So it's possibly even more important in these cases that obtaining the recognizing these changes on the OCT is important. Um, and uh, she did the fields did, did improve with fields and acuity both improved with treatment. Thank you. That was another question. Uh, any follow up of these patients? Uh, what's your experience? Do these lesions disappear with treatment? Yeah, the lesions disappear with treatment and the patients generally improve. And I would say, you know, we've had four to six of these in the last year. Um, it's, you know, the in the U.S., the incidence of syphilis is, is rising. Um, it can be uh, coexistent with HIV, so we always check that in these patients. Um, with HIV, they can get a slightly more inflammatory response and can be even more involved. Uh, Thank you. Uh, any, other, any other questions uh, from any other uh, faculty? Regarding treatment, Dr. Luciano says, uh, uh, regarding the treatment, what do we do prefer, penicillin versus ceftriaxone? You know, we talk with our infectious disease people, and generally they kind of consider this a neurosyphilis and go with, uh, gosh, I can't remember, it's like 14 days of IV penicillin. Um, so they generally have gone with that. But as I said, I, I, you know, I would, to be honest, I would either look it up or I would just call up infectious disease and say, what's the latest? Yes, thank you. I think involving infectious diseases would be quite helpful for all of us. Yeah. They have wide experience with dealing these cases and they might have coexisting HIV. So yeah. long-term management would be important. Yes, that's what Dr. Satya is also highlighting is syphilis increasing due to HIV. And uh, I think that's what the literature tells. Yes. That, uh, 
possibly um, yeah go ahead doctor. the u.s experience is that we see and we're seeing a big rise in syphilis primarily in men who have sex with men and one of the theories is that is because actually uh it's sort of it's sort of related to hiv but not directly so these are hiv negative patients for the most part but they're taking pre-exposure prophylaxis so yes. in other words they, they think people think that they're protected against hiv now uh which means that uh condoms are no longer necessary um and uh well uh syphilis will come back if you don't use ad adequate protection um, oh, and uh, for, in terms of the, you know, uh, I would just also make the point here that any ocular syphilis, just like any otic syphilis is considered neurosyphilis. So you have to use a neurosyphilis protocol. And it's helpful to have the RPR titer beforehand, as well as a VDRL titer beforehand in a CSF, because you can then check the lumbar puncture at six months um, and check the serum six months, make sure that the, the titer of RPR, VDRL, if one of them is positive, has adequately decreased. Thank you. I think that's very really helpful information. So uh, if uh, any other comment or question is there, we can take. Otherwise, uh, I think it's very illuminative case, Dr. Conblet. Thanks for uh, sharing this. And uh, I think we all have to recognize these findings in the OCT, even in the occult cases where we don't see the placoid like lesions. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. With this, we move on to the next case uh, that will be by Dr. Valery Parvin. Uh, over to you, Dr. Valery. Thank you. Can you, hear, you can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you well. At least one person can. Good. No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine with with one person. Um, got it. So I'd just like to start by thanking thanking people for uh, inviting me to take part in this wonderful meeting. Congratulations. So it's so interesting. So well done. Okay, my case today is that of a 76-year-old woman who was referred for a neuroophthalmic consultation <clears throat> because of headache and third nerve palsy. She had developed severe persistent headache in early to mid-November, followed one week later by drooping of the left upper lid and outward deviation of the left eye. She was seen by her local eye doctor who found a partial left third nerve palsy. A CT scan in the local emergency room was negative, as was an ENT examination. Over the next two weeks, without any particular treatment or more testing, her symptoms resolved completely. We saw her one month after onset. Her past medical history is positive for hypertension, hypothyroidism, medications as listed, ocular history positive just for glasses. Her family history was positive for longevity. She was a retired widow, non-smoker, and consumed occasional alcohol. On review of systems, she described neck and left shoulder pain, for the past six months attributed to an injury. She described some increased emotional stress recently, but she was otherwise well with no systemic or neurologic symptoms. On examination, visual acuity and color vision were normal in both eyes, visual fields full by confrontation. Pupils were four millimeters, bilaterally briskly reactive to three millimeters with no relative afferent defect. Motility testing showed full versions with the brisk accurate saccades, there was a six diopter exophoria in all fields of gaze, plus a flick right hyperphoria on right gaze. There was no ptosis, levator function was 13 millimeters in each eye, slit lamp examination showed only mild cataract changes, the optic discs were healthy and there were mild macular pigmentary changes. So summarizing the case, this was a 76 year old woman with a three-week episode of headache and third nerve palsy that resolved spontaneously. So one way to, to uh, formulate the question here is what would cause this? And so I'm, we'll start with that. And I would propose, a, this is not a complete list of every possible cause, but common and important causes would include a vasculopathic cranial neuropathy, a compressive lesion, a PCOM aneurysm, inflammatory diseases, 
meningitis, and ophthalmoplegic migraine. Then to try to narrow this down some, and we do better than just that long list, the other way to look at this is whether the fact that her symptoms resolve spontaneously helps narrow down the differential. And if so, how does it do that? What might we exclude based on the time course that her condition pursued? And each person on the panel and the audience, everybody may have their own uh, responses to these, their own thoughts about this, but I considered that uh, this was too fast a recovery for a vasculopathic cranial nerve palsy. Yeah, they get better, but not this quickly. So a usual time course for a vasculopathic cranial motor neuropathy, ocular motor neuropathy is uh, that they stay about the same. They may get worse for a few days, but they stay the same for about four weeks. They just do nothing, nothing good. And then they start to perk up and over the next several weeks and months, they resolve usually completely. So we could, I thought we could eliminate that as the diagnosis because it, the recovery was too quick. We'll skip down over these, over the next three, down, down to meningitis. I thought the recovery here was also too fast considering what kind of meningitis would cause a third nerve palsy. So we're thinking of bacterial or tubercular or fungal. And this three weeks and you're, you're done is too quick for that. And then for ophthalmoplegic migraine, not so much the time course, but just no history of migraine in this particular patient. That seemed highly unlikely. So now we're left still with these. Can we get rid of some of these based on the time course? And I think intuitively, mm -hmm. intuitively you would think that tumor aneurysm could be eliminated because they just don't get better unless you do something. What kind of tumor just goes away if you kind of pretend it's not there or just ignore it or just decide to wait? And so you would think that and it's tempting to follow that logic. But in fact, this has been looked at in the past uh, for different, um, different neurologic syndrome. But simmons Lassell with Nick Volpe published seven cases in which six nerve palsy due to a skull-based tumor resolved spontaneously. No treatment, it just recovered anywhere from one week to 18 months after onset. Some of these patients had recurrent episodes. Simmons also published a paper with Misha Pless describing spontaneous visual improvement in three patients with orbital apex tumors. Same, same idea, no treatment, it just spontaneously improved. So these were tumors that did get better without any treatment. And Simmons and these authors uh, pr proposed possible hypotheses, discussed why that might happen, including perhaps hormonal changes affecting tumor size. Perhaps there were local hemodynamic changes, specifically infarction in a tumor that might reduce the size perhaps just decreased edema, maybe just from the tissue learning to snuggle up together and, and live more happily together, make more room, or perhaps for, for metabolic reasons, less edema. And then finally, perhaps an immune response to the tumor might have decreased the size and thus decreased the manifestations. Well, how about the same logic, same story really for, um, for aneurysm? Do you think aneurysms just get better on their own? Well, I remembered this case that uh, Nancy Newman and Valerie Buse presented at a course at the AAN that we all did together. They presented the case of a, a typical PCOM aneurysm presenting as a painful third nerve palsy. They got better over a short time before they actually got to see the patient. I forget the exact duration. This case wasn't published, but they say they've seen other cases like this. I don't think there's a lot of these around, but the point is really not how common this is, it's really the principle of it. Can this get better on its own? And the fact is, yes, it can. So both tumor and aneurysm are still on the list. And then inflammatory diseases, which are more, uh, it's easier to see why that might wax and wane or just, just never mind waxing, just waning, that it might just go away. So the workup that we uh, pursued addressed these, these possibilities um, rather than just uh, I hate to say blowing this off, but just um, you know, saying patient's fine, has no symptoms, we're not finding much of anything on exam. Why don't we just wait and see what happens next and see if it comes back? If it's something serious, it'll come back. 
So the, so the workup addressed these. We pers- so the patient had an MRI scan of the head with gadolinium to rule out a compressive lesion, had a CT angiogram for aneurysm, and the results of these were negative. So the question for you, if you're seeing this patient who is now fine, she says she, she doesn't have any symptoms. She was being a good sport to come in and get seen, but she's really okay now. Are you okay with that? Is anything else needed? Well, we thought that third thing on the list, that inflammatory disease, still needed to be looked at. So we got a few blood tests. Her SED rate was 87 millimeters per hour, C-reactive protein 10 on a, with a normal of less than 1.0, and she was mildly anemic. She had positive bilateral temporal artery biopsies and was diagnosed with giant cell arteritis. The patient was started on prednisone, 80 milligrams per day. One month later, we saw her back in clinic. She was orthophoric in all fields of gaze, and her SED rate was just six millimeters per hour. Her prednisone was tapered over many months, and she did well. We reported this patient, this case, along with three other cases, as examples of giant cell arteritis with spontaneous remission. All four cases, we meaning Aki Kawasaki and myself, sorry. We, uh, in all four patients, the uh, biopsy was positive for temporal arteritis. These were biopsy proven. The duration of symptoms in these cases were from one week to one month. Uh, Sorry, moving. Uh, One week to one month. And the duration of the remission was from two weeks to three months. Of these four cases, two of them had ocular motor manifestations, the present case with the third nerve palsy and an additional case with uh, six nerve palsy. The other two cases had symptoms of cranial arteritis or systemic constitutional symptoms. And that duration of remission was up until either recurrence or diagnosis and treatment as in the present case. And you might be wondering, well, how, okay, well, this happened. You had this one case and then you had a few others. How how common is this? Is this amazingly rare or it happens all the time or we're missing it? So a recent paper from France maybe sheds some light perhaps on, on that question of how common is it? This group looked retrospectively at 111 patients with giant cell arteritis and specifically were interested in binocular diplopia in this patient group. Of 111 patients, 30 of them, 27%, had diplopia of some sort. In that group of 30, three of them were transient, which is well described in giant cell, just coming and going usually just a few minutes in duration. But then another three had a spontaneous remission after it was present for a while and then it spontaneously remitted, just like the case that I just presented. So, so that's the how, how common is this? The question, the answer is not very. This is three cases out of 111 patients. So uncommon, but seems important. We thought this our cases highlight this underappreciated aspect of giant cell arteritis and remind clinicians not to dismiss this important diagnosis in such patients. Furthermore, when considering giant cell arteritis, history taking should extend backwards in time to include previous symptoms, not just those evident at the time of presentation. Thank you. Welcome. I would welcome comments from Dr. Sharma, panel, anybody else. I think it's a really a very interesting case that you have presented. And in a really like a whodunit mystery, you have uh, brought out this case. I mean, generally, we would think of GCA as a problem which affects the optic nerve. Uh, as arthritic events, we usually attribute the uh, remissions of these uh, diplopias to more of vesculopathic conditions, maybe because of hypertension, diabetes, or uh, homocysteine, or anything else. But uh, I mean, rarely do we think that it could be GCA. So it's that uh, I mean thing. But how common in the literature is it? Like this case, which is presented from France, you are saying 111 cases it was showing almost like 33 cases having involvement of diplopia. Uh, right. 33%. Sorry. Right. Yeah, I think um, the numbers, so the question is how often is diplopia present in giant cell arteritis? And I think um, that varies in different series, probably 10 to 15% have diplopia. It's, it's often 
um, fleeting. So it could be missed. They don't present with a third nerve palsy, but in the re sort of review of systems, the questions we're supposed to know to ask them, they in fact had some fleeting diplopia. So I think that's more common. So, so, and that's different from, so, so I think that those numbers exist more so than in this particular case, this present for a while and then spontaneously remitting. Yeah. And the other question would be like, uh, could we suspect in which kind of case that they would be affecting the optic nerve rather than uh, the uh, motor nerves? Or is it that it is not the neuropathy, but a muscular involvement, just like the skeletal muscles are involved in a polymyalgia of these GC? Right. I, I think that's still up for grabs. I, I have for many years believed that, so, so the question, the issue is, is this ischemia of the extraocular muscles or of the cranial nerves? And based on but reading and under, you know, my understanding of the topic, I really thought these were mostly not cranial neuropathies, but mostly extraocular muscle ischemia. Oh. Um, but, but I think the evidence is, I'm impressed that there's more evidence or more evidence of cranial nerve involvement term in terms of the pattern, maybe imaging. I'm, so I'm open to um, other thoughts of the panel, panel thoughts, my colleagues on, do you have, pet peeves, private private beliefs, or data, even data about where where is the, the the etiology, the mechanism of the diplopia in giant cell? You know, it's interesting, Val, because um, we always thought that it was cranial neuropathies until Joel Glazer reported the cases of muscle ischemia, and then everything went the other way. I think it's, uh, I, I personally have seen more ocular motor nerve palsies with giant cell than I have ischemia. Your case reminds me though of a case we had many years ago in which the patient had, it was an elderly woman with diabetes and she came in with a third nerve palsy and we attribute, pupil was spared, partial, and we imaged her, it was negative. And we said, well, this is probably due to your diabetes. And just let's wait. And she came back about six weeks later and she said, you're absolutely right. Everything's back to normal. Everything's perfect. And so I patted her on the back and was about to have her leave the room when she said, I just have a couple of questions. And I said, well, what are they? And she said, well, I've noticed that when I'm combing my hair, it's really uncomfortable. And she said, I also feel this knot on one side. And I sort of sighed and said, sit back down. And indeed, she had a positive biopsy. So it, it absolutely can be spontaneous. But your point about tumors and aneurysms is also uh, relevant. I mean, you definitely can see, and we've seen a number of cases of both tumors and aneurysms that cause these transient palsies, and everybody thinks they're ischemic or inflammatory, and it turns out that there's a mass effect. Mm -hmm. it certainly does that in the brain. A lot of uh, large masses, glioblastomas, uh, that's, that's first sort of diagnosed as a TI, thought to be a TIA, because it's a transient neurologic deficit. And, and again, for whatever mechanism is happening in the head uh, to cause that, it's actually a very large mass. Um, I would concur with, with what Dr. Miller and uh, you, Dr. Perman, have just said that, um, uh, and, and I think that this really highlights it as a teaching point um, that we're a little sometimes too biased to think of giant arthritis as an acute problem but it is in fact the most common chronic vasculitis of the elderly. And uh, I've also had a patient who was an elderly man who presented with what looked to me like a microvascular third nerve palsy. Then he, I saw him again, he recovered almost completely. Then he had a few weeks of jaw claudication went away and then he presented to the hospital with fever of unknown origin, uh, about three months after the original um, ocular motor palsy. Uh, which, you know, was microvascular. And I mean, these are tissues, uh, these are peripheral tissues that have a capacity to regrow sort of their blood supply. And so um, if it, it, they, they have a capacity, that microvascular third nerve palsy can recover like any other third nerve palsy that's microvascular. Um, the sh more short lasting ones, I also attribute to extraocular muscle ischemia, just like jaw claudication uh, on the same principles. I think it's a mix of both mechanisms. Right. Um, one of our patients also had a big workup for, for fever of unknown 
origin and then and they didn't find anything and then three and it got better and then three months later we saw him for his ischemic optic neuropathy but interestingly the very the much much older literature has this the, the this fact of of uh, spontaneous remission in there in fact and i i didn't put a slide in for details but it was referred to sometimes as as um something you could just leave it alone it's a spontaneously remitting disease it's there for a while and then it gets better and life goes on and without all of the, the i think that what we, in modern era we're trained to be so alarmed by it at least that's what we tell our residents, you know, certainly don't wait, don't wait to see what's going to happen. You know, we're in a case like this, if it got better, yeah, it's not okay to just wait. But originally that was the, the, the thought about this disease was that it waxed and waned. And then if you just, if you didn't treat it because the was, it just got better. But they were I thought, fine. I thought if you didn't treat it, if their brain exploded, you know, just something terrible happened. That's, that's kind of how we teach it. And granted it often does something, something terrible often happens. But another option is it'll just get better and go away. It's, we yeah, can, we yeah. I have also reviewed the, the, the pre-steroid literature and they would uh, they would generally spontaneously remit, but they would right. often be blind at that point. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the only real bad one for the most, for usually. We should be doing an ESR and CRP in all the cases in elderly who are coming with diplopia. Absolutely. Just yeah. like for the AION, we should be having like an emergency uh, ESR and CRP. I mean, that's what I would like to understand from your case. Right. Yeah, Dr. Bart, I am Vivek here. So as you mentioned, you know, like it could be, you know, one of the common uh, kind of, you know, the chronic uh, uh, arthritic presentation. So would you recommend that, you know, irrespective of uh, like early uh, clinical presentation, if patient comes and you still have, you know, the clinical suspicion, we should be going ahead with uh, temporal artery biopsy. Like let's say after two months or three months, if you have a strong clinical suspicion, I, I there's a, there's a vigorous discussion in the chat about this. Yeah, right now. Yeah, I think very interesting case and a lot of good discussion. And I fully agree with you, Dr. Sharma, what you said that we should always keep higher suspicion and include ESR, CRP in that. Thing. Just uh, very, very shortly, I will just add here that I saw only one case like that when I was in Emory doing the training there with Dr. Newman and Dr. Buse. And uh, that patient had a partially recovered six no palsy along with a headache. And the six no palsy had not recovered completely. There was minus one abduction limitation, but the headache was coming and going. The patient had been treated on steroids uh, without making a final diagnosis. But the ESR trail showed that the patient's uh, inflammatory markers were increasing. So that's another thing, possibly like a partially resolved one or in a evolving one, serial ESR, serial blood counts, ESR, CRP, and even platelet counts might show increasing trend. That could also be helpful. Right. Somebody it? in the chat, somebody asked about uh, cold, normal labs. So I think, yeah, we this patient, we lucked out, or she lucked out, we all did, because her labs were clearly abnormal. But but if it's a subset, maybe 10%, 20 depending which lab test you use, that actually have normal labs, usually what we go on is, oh, the clinical features are so compelling that never mind the labs, I'm still going to get a biopsy. Well, in this case, the clinical features were not all that compelling. It was kind of a long shot, but we checked it. And luckily, yeah, we it, we, we hit it. You know, we got it. But it's a, it's a sort of the perfect storm. Sa same thing for a patient. So what I think of as a cult giant cell is people without systemic symptoms. Um, and so what are the chances that some, and that's maybe 20% by Harry's, Harry's uh, data, and if somebody has no symptoms and they're in this small group that has normal labs, how are you supposed to know? I mean, if, if they have jaw claudication and a pale disc, there, there could be things that are so compelling. But if it's a case like this, yeah, you, you wouldn't know. You'd miss it. I, I would miss it. Thank you. There's Thank one you. more question there in the chat that if uh, we do an imaging, does the uh, involved nerve show us uh, inflammation? Like if there is any enhancement of the involved nerve, like third now, six now, would you be able to pick up? So the, yeah, the question is if it's order, if this is orderitic diplopia? Is it in, yeah, it's in the diplopia patient. Like in this case, was the third nerve inflamed on MRI? Uh, it it was not. It, it was It was not, but I'm not, again, it partly comes down to, um, 
where you think it's happening. You know, where, where is this? Is this in the orbit or in the nerve? In that series in France, I, I believe they found very few cases, if none, of, of orbital myositis. The, the imaging was supportive of, of cranial neuropathy, not myositis. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. With this, uh, we move on to the next case, and that will be by Dr. Miller. Uh, over to you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. I presented this case, I wanted to present this case for a number of reasons, uh, even more recently, because those of you who are part of the NanosNet uh, probably have followed the story of uh, Michel Van Lint and the issues that he's been having. Uh, and so that adds a little part to it as well. The other thing I was going to say was that uh, Uma yesterday, I think, talked about this. Uh, the Adventure of Silver Blaze, I wasn't able to hear it, so I don't know how much he talked about, but if you heard the things yesterday, you may have heard some of this already. But we'll talk a little bit about a 12-year-old right-handed boy who had some headaches with photophobia for about six months, some nausea but no emesis, and a little bit of weight loss. His neurological exam was normal, but his neuroimaging was obtained anyway, because in the United States, at least, anybody with a headache gets imaged. And we can see this here. And I don't know if uh, Vina wants to comment on the CT. Um, Dr. Miller, unfortunately, she had to leave due to an- Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, well, um, you can see, I think everybody can see this low density mass in the region of the uh, supracellar area going up into the third ventricle. Uh, there's a, a, a normal cella. And on MR, we can see this a little better. It's very heterogeneous. And a fairly large mass, so no big deal. On uh, ADC, it uh, does not appear to have uh, restriction, which I think is an interesting issue in itself. In any event, this lesion was diagnosed as a craniopharyngioma and plans were made for craniotomy. And the patient was referred to us for a preoperative assessment as most of these patients are. And when we saw the patient, the visual acuity was normal, color vision was normal, pupils were isochoric, perfectly normal reactions, extraocular movements were full, the patient was orthophoric, tensions were normal, the discs were normal, no swelling or pallor, and here are the visual fields. And really quite normal, the little bit of abnormality in this left central area, but it didn't correspond to uh, any visual loss, and indeed she had some fixation losses, so I'm, I'm not impressed with it. But basically, this was a completely normal neuroophthalmic exam. Here's the OCT, and not a whole lot to show for it. So the question I have for the panelists is, what do you do next? Any thoughts? Well, based on the normal exam, I called the neurosurgeons and I said, I don't think this is a craniopharyngioma. I don't understand why there isn't some sort of field defect or acuity loss or an RAPD. And I said, I don't think you should plan. They were going to do a, a large open craniotomy. And I said, I don't think you should do this because I don't think it's a craniopharyngioma. And so they decided to do uh, what's called a tube approach through the uh, frontal area, and I'll show you that in just a moment, but you come down between the, the hemispheres. And so let's, our neurosurgeons love to play the music too. So enjoy, I knew Val would appreciate this.
And here's our little friend uh, shortly thereafter. That's what's meant by the dragon head that we do for the children. And you can see the partial debulking above the positive arrow sign. And the tissue that they removed was fairly straightforward. You can see the, the uh, cells, typical cells with positive oleg uh, staining, very low Ki67. And these were felt to be consistent with a pilocytic astrocytoma with some pilomyxoid features. Uh, it was positive for G GFAP as well as oleg 2 and SOX10. So this was a low grade glioma and the child's doing extremely well. But the reason I think this case is important is related to the story, The Adventure of Silver Blaze by Alfred Conan Doyle, one of my favorite authors. So one of these, the, one of his most popular short stories was the disappearance of Silver Blaze, a famous racehorse, and the apparent murder of its trainer on the night before the important race. And the solution hinged on the curious incident of the dog at nighttime. The Scotland Lard Yard detective who was examining the case said, is there any other point you would wish to draw my attention? And uh, Sherlock Holmes says, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And the Scotland Lard Yard um, detective says, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes says, that was the curious incident. Our role as neuro-ophthalmologists is to do more than just examine the patient and report the findings to the neurosurgeons or whoever refers the patient. We need to think about what the findings or the lack of findings mean. And in this case, it was highly unlikely that a solid cranio would spare visual sensory function it was more likely, in my opinion, that it was going to be soft or infiltrative or both. And we communicated this. One of the things that I have noted in the last 10, 15 years is that everybody is so busy that they see the patient and they report it, the findings back without really saying what it is they think the findings really mean. And I think it's important, especially when everybody is busy and they're, they're, they have no time to really think, that you have to stop and think about this and communicate it to change the management of the patient, in this case, uh, resulting hopefully in optimum care. And this is not the only thing. Here's another example. This was a woman referred to me for transphenoidal after, uh, in preparation for transphenoidal surgery for a pituitary adenoma. And her exam was fairly normal, except that she had bitemporal inferior uh, scotomas. And I, again, I called and said, this just doesn't look, I realize that pituitary adenomas can certainly cause an inferior defect by pushing the the chiasm up and, and the nerves against the falsiform folds of the canal. But I said, this is also more likely to be something not only supercellar, but super chiasmatic in its nature. And so in this case, they went from a transphenoidal to a craniotomy approach, and it turned out to be a meningioma. So it's just a plea for stopping to think about what you see and what it means in terms of diagnostic and therapeutic management. So with that, I will stop the share. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Miller. I think a very important point you brought out that we should correlate each and every finding and even what is normal or lack of what we expect also carries a lot of meaning. Uh, so I think that that made a difference to the management and provided optimum care to the patient. I have a couple of observations. I, I'm not sure whether I'm correct, but uh, just asking over here. When you showed the images, there was a little bit dilatation of the ventricles also maybe. So was this, do you observe that very commonly with a craniopharyngioma? The, well, it depends. The, the cranios certainly can cause hydrocephalus and um, and disc swelling, papilledema, if they block the third ventricle. In this case, it 
compressed the third ventricle and as you saw was in the foramen of Monroe. So uh, I think you're absolutely correct. Thank you. And uh, clinically, if we try to correlate, was this age, uh, do you see cranios in this age? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because when I was training, it used to be said that cranios have a double peak, uh, one in childhood and one in later adulthood. But there have been other articles that have suggested that you can see a cranio at any age. So I don't think it really, uh, Dr. Ambika pointed this bimodal, but there have been actually a number of series that have shown that the bimodal is really not correct, that it actually, uh, there are cranios seen at every age. Thank you. And uh, I had one more other other way of thinking around, like, you know, if I have, what I have read, I have read is that, and I have seen personally also one case, which was actually a craniopharyngeal, but was misdiagnosed as malingering. So, mm -hmm. because they do have different kind of field effects, uh, sieve like field effects are also described, they keep on seeing. So, maybe uh, opposite is also true. We should be aware that, okay, we don't label them as just malingerers, but obtaining a good neuroimaging also would be helpful. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because now that we have OCT, it's not as much of an issue. But again, I was taught that cranios were, were very commonly felt to cause a, a process that looked like malingering because somehow they didn't damage the optic nerves as much. So the disc pallor wasn't as great. And uh, I can remember a number of children. In fact, I had one case where uh, the child came in and didn't appear to have anything else, but there was some funny field defects. And I remember saying to the parents, I think your child needs neuroimaging. And they got all upset and they said, you know, why would you do that? I said, because he might have a brain tumor. And of course they went berserk and were very angry, but we got the scan and it turned out to be a cranio. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Miller. There are certain questions which Dr. Veena had uh, uh, raised uh, in discussion with you. Uh, maybe in interest of benefit of everyone, I would like to share for benefit of all the audience. So she wanted to ask that clinical history of weight loss uh, was how much significant weight loss was it was there for this patient? Could it be like yeah, any? we didn't think it was. It was very minor weight loss, but it, it certainly could have been the effect on the hypothalamus. So it's a great question. Thank you. And uh, she also asked that uh, like the axial CT suggested possibly a third ventricular lesion. There was no calcification, and MRI showed a enhancing solid third ventricular lesion. So what what were the points in favor of craniopharyngioma? Of yeah. I think it was the heterogeneity as well as the age of the patient. Um, we've seen a number of cases over the years, and I'm sure the other panelists have as well, where the, the uh, low-grade gliomas were mostly exophytic. They must come from somewhere in that area, but they were primarily exophytic. I think that calcification helps you if it's present, but if it's absent, it really doesn't help much. I'm sure that everybody knows about Cushing syndrome. I'm not sure how many people know about Cushing syndrome of the chiasm. And that would basically what Cushing said was, this is obviously in the days before we even had uh, uh, angiography, but you, if you saw a patient with a bitemporal field defect and a normal cella, then it had to be either a cranio, a meningioma, or a supracellar aneurysm. And that became known as Cushing syndrome of the chiasm. So uh, I think that, again, it's re in, in the early, early days, we'd do a skull x-ray, a, a lateral and an AP. If we saw calcification, we'd say, okay, this is a cranio. But if you don't see it, it really doesn't help you. Yes. She also wanted to uh, ask, uh, do, did we have any coronal images uh, to see the relation of the tumor with the chiasm? Because at this you know, point we of time, never saw. There was a question in the in the chat as well. We really couldn't make out the chiasm uh, on anything we did, and I don't know whether it was just 
uh, I suspect this is was so slow in in presenting that the chiasm just either that molded and we, and as you know we've seen patients with large pituitary adenomas that had very little in the way of abnormality if they grow slow enough and they but we also know that that uh, obviously even cranios can infiltrate the chiasm but I think in this case, it was a combination of a very slow growth along with the fact that it was, as you saw, it was very soft and suckable. Thank you. So possibly with that much uh, mass lesion and uh, we can't identify chiasm, the point that made you think is even more relevant that such a big solid lesion should have caused at least some field effect. Yep. Thank you. There are a couple of more questions in the chat where uh, I think uh, Dr. Ambika wants to ask, should we always do an OCT for cellular masses for prognosis and follow-up? Uh, yeah, I mean, our... yeah I, I'm a big fan of OCT as long as you take it with a bit of a grain of salt, especially the RGC IPL. I think there's been too much made of the prognostic value of the RGC IPL. I've seen too many patients who recover very nicely, even though their RGC IPL is, is low. RNFL, same way, although I think it's, uh, and I'm sure there would be pe people who argue, I think RNFL thickness is a little bit better um, than RGC IPL. But, you know, we always tell our patients if their uh, RNFL is 70 or better, we sort of say we're cautiously optimistic about the effects of decompression. If they're less, we say we're somewhat pessimistic, but it's by no means zero. And, and Prem and I reported a series of cases of meningiomas, one of whom or two of whom had very low RNFL values, well below 70, and, and the patient still recovered significantly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. A wonderful, Thank you. wonderful uh, listening to you always. Thank you. I think we had a great session uh, and uh, I thank all the speakers for being there and uh, sharing your wide experience and knowledge. I hand over to Dr. Satya for, for their comments and closing the session. Thank you. May I request everyone to put on their videos so that we can take a group photograph? And in the meanwhile, uh, the last session ends on a very interesting situation. We had two cases of the missing chiasm. So the Sherlock Holmes stuff comes into this session, two cases of missing chiasm in this session. And uh, mysteries that need to be resolved. And one comment I had on that, we should devise a certain method of you know, detecting the chiasm on the MRI, if it is not seen in such cases, how do we find the chiasmal tracts? There should be some kind of a method to diagnose that. Um, and um, thank you. We've got all the faculty on the screen right now. I will just take a quick photograph. Sunil, will you do that? Yes, and uh, to end the session, I would just like to thank all the faculty for taking out time from their busy schedules and sharing their precious cases with us. We appreciate the encouraging response from all the viewers worldwide. The NOSIG members would like to express our gratitude to all the speakers, panelists, and moderators for infusing enthusiasm into the scientific deliberations. We gratefully- We need to thank you, thank you, Satya. We know how difficult it is to set up these meetings. You and Verender have done a marvelous job, not just this year, but in the previous years. So thank you for all the work you've done to make it a great set couple day session. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We also gratefully acknowledge the efforts of Sunilji, the webmaster who managed the technical aspects very intuitively and professionally and entered pharmaceuticals for facilitating the entire event. Thank you all and have a good day and good night. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.
Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.